I'd like to bring this meeting to order with a brief prayer of thanks to our Savior. Our Batman, who art in Gotham, cowled be thy mane. Now, y'all know Kevin Smith's a big old fat man, but did you know his favorite hero is Batman, the Dark Knight who punches dirty turkeys in the face? That's right, Cape Crusader. Punch all those turkeys. Punch them in their turkey necks. So once a week, now this no fly list fatty's gonna put the food down and get chatty about Batty, and this turkey gets wordy about Gotham like it's a real place. He ain't got time for his wife or daughter. This cat woman's losing Batman and Carter. Go get a Cape Crusader, you want a pussy on now. Ha <laughs> ha! Get ready, turkeys. We gon' bat shit. Babbling bat the bat with old Kevin Smith. Now here's the fat man who loves Batman himself, Fat Kev Smith. Get on out here, Turkey. Welcome to Fat Man on Batman. I'm Kevin Smith. Okay, kids, this is why I'm 42 years old, and I'm living proof that dreams can come true. When I was but a boy, a young fat boy, uh, back in 1989, I uh, met a, a boy, another guy, a boy, he was a little older than me, Walter Flanagan, still one of my f- dearest friends in the world uh, on that TV show, Comic Book Man, where that's uh, back on AMC this week. Anyway, I had lost a bunch of friends that I used to hang out with in high school, all my high school friends. I'd started dating a girl and we got, started getting serious and I kind of let the friendships lapse. Then our relationship ended. My friends had gone on to date girls as well. And so the circle was kind of broken. So by the end of high school, I was kind of flying solo. So I met a cat named Walter Flanagan. Uh, he worked at the Highlands Recreation Center, uh, which was, uh, where, you know, kids go to play after school and stuff. And I was there as part of a year long latchkey kid program. K- uh, parents that had work after school, who couldn't pick their kids up after school, kids would come down to the rec center and they'd hang out there till six and the parents come pick them up. I'm working there about eight months with this cat, Walter Flanagan, and we never exchange conversation beyond like, uh, do the kids get pudding? Yeah. That's it. Uh, good morning. Hi. That's it. No conversation. No relation whatsoever. Uh, it, you know, it was weird. It was, it, I, I, I'd, I'd always, I'm, I'm not like the most social cat in the world, but in a work setting, man, I'm always chit chatting up, like to have a good time. And when I was working with this guy, there was no good time. It was just quiet and he was to himself and I was to myself. So after eight months, I find a way into this cat. Uh, the guy who runs the place, Timmy Hill, our boss, he goes, uh, Walter's a big comic book fan. And I was like, comic book fan, we were playing uh, foosball at the time. I said, hey, man, I wrote a report about Batman last year when I was in uh, high school, senior year in high school. Uh, I got a pretty good grade on it, man. He goes, yeah, you know, classic Walter. It would have ended there, so you have to keep going. So I was like, yeah, yeah, you know, I'll bring it in. You can read it. He was like, all right. Uninterested, but still, uh, this might have been my way in. So I bring in this report uh, for him to read. I give it to him before I leave the next day. Next day, I come in. I say to him, hey, man, did you read the report? And he goes, yeah, I read that. He's going, you don't know shit about Batman. That ain't Batman. He's going, you're talking about the Adam West Batman, and that ain't Batman. I want you to read this, this Batman. And he handed me a copy of The Dark Knight Returns, Frank Miller's Dark Knight Returns. Went home, read it in the night, came back full of questions. Uh, kind of like <laughs> a young prophet or a, a young acolyte of a prophet who's like, tell me, master, what does this mean? Immediately, I was ready to sit at this guy's feet and be like, who is this one-armed archer? You know, And then Walter would fill in, that's the Green Arrow and stuff like that. So at that point, it, we we begin a friendship. We actually have a conversation because we're talking about something that bonds us. In this case, it's Batman's The Dark Knight Returns. Our friendship grows over the course of the next few months because I'm getting it very into these comic books. Give me more. Give me more. And finally, Walter's like, why don't you come out with me? I used to read, buy and read comic books when I was a kid. Got to high school, stopped because I thought I'll never get fucking pussy if I'm reading comic books and abandoned them. Here was a guy who was older than me by about two years in high school, a dude who was kind of metal. I looked up to him. He's just what I consider a hard case. He thinks that's kind of funny now later in life. But here was a guy who was not afraid to be like, I read comic books. Comic books are cool. So he was my way back into comic books. And when I got back into comic books, you're talking about just as the, the big old wave of the Brit invasion was cresting, uh, particularly all throughout DC. And we were seeing some writing coming in. Uh, from people who cut their teeth over on British titles and doing amazing things, coming here with our stories, with lots of reverence for the stories that came from uh, the, the stories of the past, the, the continuity tales of old uh, within a DC universe. 
uh, and we're suddenly breathing new life into them. And it, it was exciting. It was just a great fucking time to be reading anything, man, because suddenly there was a renaissance of sorts going on. So this is when I start reading comics again, which is about the best time in the world you could have picked up comics uh, after a lapse because so much quality writing was going on. The writer was king. We were coming up to the tail end of a period where, you know, artists were everything and, and you could sell a book on the title of the artist on the cover alone. Suddenly writing, writers meant something. Suddenly the writers were becoming rock stars and that meant the world to me. I like to write. I could never draw, but I like to write. So I could imagine myself as like, Ooh, I could write one of these books, man, because this was the type of superhero story I could get into a little more thoughtful, a little more uh, grown up and stuff. Didn't seem as silly. So, um, in this era, one of the first books Walter Flanagan puts into my hand, he goes, you got to read this. This is one of the best books that's on the market right now. It's so fucked up. The highest compliment or rating a Walter Flanagan could give anything is, it's so fucked up. So that book was Animal Man. I fell in love with this book, Animal Man. It was brilliant. They took a dopey character, man, and turned him into something with a, with a psychology and a real world philosophy doing, tackling stories that I'd never seen done before. And mind you, I was just getting back into comics, but I was filling up like a sponge. I was reading everything. Walter would be like, here, here, here. I'm, I'm talking about I'm reading Animal Man at the same time I'm reading Watchmen and they're on the same fucking shelf to me because I'm like, this is brilliant. All this shit's brilliant. Um, not long after that, man, uh, the next transformative Batman book is placed into my hands. Uh, we go into this uh, hobby shop in Red Bank, me and Walter at this point, probably three months into collecting comics together. I start going on the weekly trip with him, worked out well for Walter. He didn't have a license for some reason. He didn't wind up getting it until he was like 21. So I was a guy who would drive not just to the Red Bank Comic Store, the Hobby Masters, uh, but or Toy Masters, but also out to uh, Matawan Comic Book Store, all over the place. We'd drive looking for stuff, looking for books. One of the books that we got to the Red Bank Hobby Masters early to get, the day it came out, because there was so much fucking excitement for it, was this hardcover take on Batman and Arkham Asylum, um, uh, Serious House on Serious Earth. And we'd seen images from it, and they looked bizarre the presentation looked different than we'd ever seen before even the word balloons were different color-coded everything about it screamed art and you suddenly you know as a guy who was coming back into comics you were able to hold your head even hard, higher because you're like look at this shit man you think comics are for kids i would never hand this book to a kid man it's so beautiful it looks like it belongs in a museum Arkham Asylum was a book that absolutely changed my life, changed me as a writer. That's the book that made me want to write Batman. Batman, the take on Batman was so thrilling. Uh, the going into Arkham, sitting down, doing the, the card, uh, the, the, uh, the uh, Rorschach test back and forth with the doctor, the notion that Harvey Dent had been moved off of a, a two sided coin to an eight sided die to 42 cards. Like, Brilliant notions like this. The, the cold phone call from the Joker as he sent, uh, uh, as he's sharpening a pencil and talking about, uh, the, the young lady who he's got his hands on. And you believe that he's, po you know, poking her eyes out with his fucking sharpened pencil. Everything about it immediately brought you into this, uh, goth. It was scary. It was like for a comic book, one of the scariest comic books you'll probably ever read first time. First time. After that, you read it like the Bible, like some cats read the Bible, you go to church every week and they read certain passages of the Bible that are their favorites. Arkham Asylum became absolutely one of my favorites. Anything this writer would touch from there on in, I would be looking at. I'd be given a shot. He became instantly one of my favorite writers on the planet, not just a comic book writer, but a person whose ideas were so fucking outside the box, so forward thinking. He brought joy back to reading for me. You know what I'm saying? When I was a kid, of course, they, they force you to read a lot of books at school and they become medicine to you because you're like, I don't necessarily want to read this. Later on in life, you could come to appreciate them and stuff. When, Schol when the scholastic agenda beats out the color of imagination where you can't really enjoy reading new material because it's a fucking assignment, there's a chance you don't go back. You don't pick up again. Reading the writings of Grant Morrison absolutely brought me back to the love of reading. And a lot of people will say, well, it's got fucking pictures. I, you know, we don't, if you're on a fat man and Batman podcast, we're never going to have that argument. Graphic novels are novels, people. Um, they're just fun to fucking look at at the same time, but the writing holds up to anything that doesn't have fucking pictures in it. So whether it was, uh, Arkham Asylum, whether it was Animal Man, whether it was Doom Patrol, which was a book that came along at a time in my life when I was particularly emo. 
Uh, I, I was, uh, painted, t- well, my mother wouldn't let me paint my room walls white, but I was allowed to take comic book divider boards, you know, the backing boards, staple them to the wall and then write crazy shit on the wall. And all the crazy shit on the walls that I wrote came from Animal Man, came from the pages of Doom Patrol. I would sit there and buy three copies of a comic book, one to read, one to bag and board and never be touched, or medically sealed to be put away in a time capsule for all, for all uh, eternity. And then one more that I would take a scissor to cut out and fucking make collages and stuff. I made a, I found it very ironic that I made a scissor man collage when I was reading the Doom Patrol. My mother would be like, should I be worried? Cause there's lots of weird imagery on your wall. I said, it's not weird. It's da da as a mother. I got educated reading the works of Grant Morrison. I walked away a smarter individual, an animal man, Arkham Asylum, um, Batman RIP, of course, Batman. Batman and Robin, Batman Incorporated, DC 1 million, Doom Patrol. Hands down, the best JLA movie you will never see in your lifetime is Rock of Ages. Go get your, pause this podcast right now. Go grab a copy of Rock of Ages. Have your mind blown back. Come back and hear uh, what we're going to talk about or the man we're going to talk to who fucking wrote that shit. Um, over at Marvel, man, he came over and did the X-Men. New, remember the Zorn saga? Uh, remember all, remember all that stuff? Remember he took the white queen and uh, turned her into something cool and she wound up in the fucking movies and shit? Uh, the work goes on and on, ladies and gentlemen, but the show is called Fat Man on Batman. So naturally we're going to concentrate on, uh, eventually on everything, uh, good and holy and fantastic that Grant Morrison has brought to the character of Batman. You'll live your whole life, ladies and gentlemen, and you won't get to sit down with someone who not only influenced you, but change the way you looked at art and made you a better artist. If I break down weeping throughout this podcast, it's because I am humbled to be sitting in the presence of the one of the only true geniuses that I think I've ever had the pleasure to be in a room with, man. There's George Carlin, and then there's Grant Morrison. Welcome, sir. Hey, Kevin. How you doing? <laughs> Why do you have you? to be so negative about me? <laughs> I'm sorry. I started off on the wrong foot. Let me go back. Um, this is, uh, you do more, uh, honor to my house than I'm afraid my house can bear. You and your good lady wife are here this evening. We're sitting around and chit chatting, uh, about the bat. But before yeah. we jump there, man, let's, let's take it all the way back. I mean, I don't even have idle chit chat for you. I just want to dig right into the meal that yeah, is your life. You grew, you grew up in, in, well, that accent clearly Japanese. Uh, definitely. Yeah. I grew up in the <laughs> suburbs of Kyoto. <laughs> My father was a salary man, a humble salary man. <laughs> um, no, I, grew, I grew up in Glasgow, Scotland, where uh, I think Scotty comes from there, doesn't he? Does he really? Yeah, apparently. Or he's not been born yet, but you know. <laughs> in the future, he will. Yeah, You're yeah. older than fucking Scotty, man. I'm you got it over older that. Than Scott. And Scott, I'm history to Scotty. Think about that. <laughs> Scotty's like, I used to read yeah. this guy's work when I was a kid. You know what? I don't mean Simon Pegg, Scotty. I mean James Montgomery. <laughs> <laughs> Um, all right, so you're a Glaswegian in these yeah, days? Yeah. What is it like gr- growing up in, and what year is it? You're born 1960? 1960, yeah. So if, for, you're there till what, the late 70s, early 80s, or do you stay there even longer? I, I was always in Glasgow. I mean, I was in Glasgow. In fact, I'm still in Glasgow. I'm You've just, never left? No, I'm just outside Glasgow now. We, we still got homes in Glasgow, you know, Kristen and I. So we? it's been home forever. Yeah, I mean, this is my place, and it's, it's awful, right? I mean, I, I would say... <laughs> Don't say that, dude. Kevin, no, seriously. <laughs> We're allowed to say it. We come from there. <laughs> but basically, when I was doing research for Batman Incorporated 7, right, and it's set in the South Dakota Reservation, and as we know, the conditions in these places are appalling. You know, these brilliant people shouldn't have to live in these conditions. But economically, you know, sociologically, hideous things have happened. And right. people are living in states which no one outside the third world should live. So mm. I'm researching all these conditions. The only place in the Western world that's as bad is the west of Scotland where I live. <laughs> we have <laughs> people die at the age of 52. That's the upper limit in some parts of where I come What from. is it? What are they it's dying the from? The diet is terrible. Where everyone's got heart disease, cancer, like the food is shocking. You know, they fry anything, right? They, they fry cornflakes, they fry course. Mars bars, they fry, that's the least of it. They fry <laughs> you if you, they saw you in the right <laughs> store. You know, they just fucking fry everything. <laughs> So it's it's the, the diet is bad, the climate is hideous, there's terrible poverty. So it's kind of a, it's a bad place. But when you're a kid, you don't know this stuff, right? It's my mythology, you know. It's what I grew up with. So for me, it's like it's Asgard. It's, these are the streets that I grew up in that formed my imagination. So although it's, I, I mean, for American readers, it's probably pretty hardcore place. It's very violent. It's very poor. 
But at the same time, it's very creative. And that's not to say there isn't a middle class or a creative class or an art class. It's very artistic. So Glasgow, where I came from, had really amazing artists and uh, bands and theatre and all kinds of stuff. It was just an amazing... People just wanted to get out, right? They used to say either you'd be a footballer or a boxer or a crook, and that's how you get out of Glasgow. <laughs> but now you can add comic book writers. <laughs> <laughs> As Mark Miller will attest. Uh, you know, the so, list has gone uh, yeah, so, by one. So that's what it was. Though. Everything was about escaping from this place and the people there really drag you down and they don't like success. It's not like America. If you're successful, you are a target, you know, and they try to drag you down. And it's just the way it is. It's a really strange thing to come out of. But I think it totally informs what I've done. And there's a kind of attitude. Keeps you probably, humble, I'm sure, too. Whatever, yeah, I mean, but it probably seems quite alien to, to Americans, but at the same time, I've got this relationship because, and, and as we'll talk about, and I don't want to keep hogging the mic, but. No, oh my God, yeah, we're here to fucking like, hear you. Like, I want yeah, you to do nothing. Stop, you I'm just, I've, no. I've rolled fucking two joints because I'm just like, I'm going to sit here at the feet of fucking a Buddha <laughs> and listen. Two joints, Smith, they call it. <laughs> yeah. That's your, that's your Indian name, isn't it? Two joints. <laughs> two joints. He fucking uh, lays down with a gut. That's what yeah, they call me. <laughs> So no, I mean, the, the weird relationship we had in the west of Scotland with America is basically this. And the, to me, this was now my ultimate fascination. I grew up in a place where there was a major American naval presence, military presence. So at the end of the Clyde, which is the river that flows through Glasgow, and you know, we were once a big major industrial power. I've but, been there. I, yeah, I, I, sure. Yeah, yeah. It's a cool place. But the industrial side of it declined. People lost jobs, poverty, etc. But meanwhile, up the river, the Americans move in and they move all the nuclear submarines in. So we've got these these Polaris subs right up the, 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 the loch. So when I'm a kid, my father was a soldier in World War II and he came back and he was kind of disgusted by what he'd seen. So he became a pacifist and he joined the anti-nuclear movement. So he became what was known as a spy for peace and he could look these people up and they used to break into like, military installations, take photographs and disseminate them through the underground, right? Oh my God, so, your dad was Batman. No, no, my dad was more like, I don't know, like one of the Invisibles or something. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't have Batman's wealth. He was doing it on like, you know, two pence a week. But so that was his, his thing. So the weirdness for me and how it all relates to comics is that when I was a kid, this was the enemy. There was right up there was the scariest thing in the world, the bomb. And my parents were terrified of the bomb. And even though my dad was a big, tough soldier and my mom was a feminist, they were scared of the bomb. So when you're a little kid, that's the scariest thing in the world. Right. And then I discover Superman comics. And Superman can walk out of a nuclear explosion laughing and his suit isn't even scorched. So suddenly for me, imaginatively, there was a thing that could defeat the bomb. And it was called Superman. And the weird thing now when you're I look gonna back... You're going to make me cry. Yeah. Think about it. And you look, oh, my God. But this then, is beautiful. The same people who brought the bomb, the American sailors, brought Superman. Because they were the guys, the boat, that's why we had a huge comic culture in the west of Scotland, because these sailors were bringing in American culture. Is that right? Yeah, including comic books. The first comic book store in, in Britain opened in Paisley outside Glasgow, which is halfway between our town and the American base. And they used to, now it starts to make yeah, sense. So they would trade the comic books. So for me now, and we now actually live on the site of this, like four miles across the water from where we live in the country, is the the, the United Kingdom's Trident nuclear deterrent. Okay. So we're right there. We've got fifty times the firepower to destroy the planet just across the water, four miles away. When it all goes to hell, we're gone in a <laughs> best place to be. Yeah, best place to be. So for me, though, like I say, I mean, you can see it. It suddenly became. You can't escape these fucking bombs, dude. They're all over you. But it was like this pattern. They're like, okay, these guys brought in the bomb, and my dad fought the bomb, and he was arrested, and that formed the way I thought about authority. But at the same time, those guys brought me Superman and Spider Man and all the things that gave me. (laughs) So conflicted. Yeah, the things that could fight the bomb as a concept. They they fought the apocalypse because my dreams were haunted by apocalypse, but the Flash could outrun a bomb, you know, and that. It was a life, that, yeah, a life preserver. Completely, you know. So that's where it begins. How yeah. old are you when you see your first comic book? Do you remember? Three years old, and it was a Marvel Man comic, black I'm, and white. Yeah. I'm gonna fucking pass out. How quickly? I'm sure you've been asked the question a zillion times. So it was a Marvel Man. It was mm. a black and white. Yeah, it was black and white. Those old Mick Anglo comics that Alan Moore eventually based his shit on. Uh-huh. 
but it was uh, well, not entirely <laughs> did a better <laughs> job than those. But yeah, they were they were obviously they were versions of Captain Marvel because Captain Marvel the trademark had ceased because DC had had a legal battle with Fawcett. So Mick Anglo was left with, the tr- you know, he was supposed to do comics featuring Captain Marvel and he suddenly couldn't get access to this trademark. So they just made their own guy, Marvel Man. And it was a kind of weird British hybrid <laughs> version of Captain Marvel. So yeah, the first comic I ever read was Marvel Man meets Baron Munchausen. And I can still remember, I was three years old. And I remember being on the bed reading this thing. Whoa. And like, you know, then Baron Munchausen, so it's Marvel Man hanging around with him and the snow melts and his donkeys hanging to the steeple and all this. <laughs> it's just amazing. And it was for me, it was the idea of Munchausen was a liar. So he was kind of like a writer and Marvel Man's a superhero, but it was kind of weird folktale superhero. So I think it all goes back to that, you know, it's really, that's my primal memory of comics. Do you, uh, do, when do you, do you become a collector? Are you what most, what most people would call today the collector, somebody that buys books, reads book on, books on a weekly basis or, or is that something that developed later on? No, I, I, I was 12 when I became a comic collector. I was in hospital and they gave me a bunch of comics. My aunt brought What were you in hospital for? An appendix operation. Right on. So I was kind of in there for a bit and they, they brought me in a bunch of comics and I'd always been into comics, but, that did it for me, you know, just sitting on my own with this bunch of... And you're with the 70s too, so you're... Yeah, 12 years old. 12 years old. Yeah. So what books, what are the magic books it's that kind of draw comics, you? Action Comics, Justice League, Len Weeden stuff at the time, uh, Murphy Anderson, Kurt Swan. Now, when you're reading comics. all this stuff, do you notice the creatives? Yeah, oh, totally. But this, I start to notice it at that point. So that's when I became a fan and I started to collect the books. And I've still got those same books. Do you really? But, but they're all fucked up because I read them in the bath. I mean, I don't... You don't fetishize them. No, they're they're a a real state now. They actually show their their, their lifetime (laughs) (laughs) of use, which I would imagine like that. I remember David Lapham um, came to the set of Chasing Amy and he gave me stray bullets. And I was like, oh, he gave me like a bunch of uh, the single comics. And I said, I'm going to get these in some bags and boards. He's like, please don't do that. Mm -hmm. Just give them to people. Just, you know, make people read them if you're going to do anything, but don't put them in a museum. Same thing. You've got well worn dog eared copies of the yeah. of the comics that have been sent me home. Completely whole life. ruined, you know. <laughs> Do you still go back and read old books? Like in a world where you're working on the the um the black hand storyline mm-hmm. where eventually it gets into like Batmite and the Batman of, of Zor with Zor and yeah, all yeah, yeah. Um is that is that a, a tell? Is that you going back and going like, Oh, these are the stories I absolutely read as a kid? Not even, I didn't read those as a kid. I mean, with, with that stuff in Batman, it was more like going back to what's all the stuff about Batman that's been swept under the carpet? What's everyone ashamed of? Because <laughs> <laughs> I thought there's got to be material in there. You know, it's the return of the repressed. Right, right. And there's right. some, why are they ashamed of this shit? <laughs> so I dug all that out and it was more to do with that because, you know, I wasn't really around for those. My, my Batman was Denny O'Neill and Neil Adams and that kind of international sexy James Bond Batman. Right. Which is why I always found the... The hardcore psycho Batman, a bit hard to buy into. Because your Batman was more James yeah. Bond with a cape and stuff. Yeah, he, was, he had it all figured out. <laughs> <laughs> but all right, so at age 12, you're in the hospital, you get hardcore comics. From there on in, you're buying them, you're mm-hmm. saving them and stuff. Are you ever going, hey, I would like to do this? What is your What are your dreams at Immediately this point? from when I was five years old, I wanted to be a writer. It was the first thing I ever wanted to be. And then it was kind How? of- How? How did you know that? Because I picked up a book. And, well, no, I'd seen comics, I'd obviously I'd seen books, I'd, I'd, mm-hmm. I just remember this Enid Blyton book, who's the writer for kids, you know, this, she, she goes back like to the 1910 or something, you know, and it's all kind of weird English imperial <laughs> racist attitudes, <laughs> but when you're a kid you get these books and it's all about a bunch of kids solving mysteries, you know, the famous five or the secret seven and they, they all hang out and they've it's got It's like the Bobsy twins yeah, it's here. Yeah, like that kind of thing, but set in a really twee English country landscape. So I remember reading this thing, and just the minute I finished, I thought, like, oh, this is what I want to do. This is it. And it was called The Ring of Bells Mystery. <laughs> that was the one, you know. So I'd seen stuff before that, but this just kind of hit me. I thought, that's that's my job. I'm going to be a writer. And did somebody parse it to you? Or were you able to ha- – like, I don't know if I, I saw a book at age five. I would be like, I could do this. Like, I remember my sister introduced the concept of writing to me when I was maybe about six. She was, she had a notebook and I remember she was drawing on the inside page yeah. and I was like, what are you drawing? She's like, me and my friends. I was like, why? And she's like, it's uh, for my book. And I was like, what book? And it was like the mystery of the secret door, mm-hmm. very much like a Nancy Drew kind of thing. Her and her friends kneeling at this like door, the big, that big brass ring in the center of it and stuff. And inside nothing but writing. She had handwritten it. 
Mm. And I was like, what do you mean you, you wrote a book? And she was like, well, I just wrote a book. I was like, you can't write a, a book. You know, it was like, a, I couldn't, <laughs> it was so big. I was like, yeah, you yeah. can't do this. It was almost as if she was like, mm-hmm. I stepped into a portal through uh, and found the other mm-hmm. dimension. And I'm like, what? Like I couldn't process. But then from there forward, I was like, oh, I guess somebody must do this. But it wouldn't be for years before I was like, oh, I can be one of those people. Yeah. You hit it very young. Just, uh, I guess I was about five, definitely. But I could read before. My mother taught me to read when I was young because I think her father taught to read. She was a big science fiction fan and comic fan. So Your mom was a yeah, comic yeah. fan? How many kids are there in your family? Just me and my sister. That's, so there's just two yeah. of these. Um, and so you had pretty uh, liberal parents. Oh, like. totally. You know, they were anti-nuclear activists, you know, <laughs> yeah. working class people. My mother went to, to Holland, to The Hague, to speak on uh, about women's rights in, in the early 60s. So they were kind of cool, but they were just poor people. You know, They were uneducated people, but they were politically motivated in the way that working class people were in those days and aren't anymore. You know? What was it? What, I mean, that's it's... I guess it's kind of a weird mindset for, or a foreign mindset mm-hmm. for us to get our heads around. But with, growing up in that era, when people talk about like it was harsh, it was this, mm-hmm. it was this. Are we talking about under Thatcher? This was before Thatcher. I mean, I, I grew up when I was in my twenties. Thatcher was out, so that's when I started doing comics. Everything was anti-Thatcher. Right. But as I noticed in the later on, we kind of all did quite well <laughs> 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 under Thatcher, you know. And it was, it was really a kind of weird one. But no, but that, that, in the 60s, it was kind of, uh, what could I say? I mean, I, my dad was unemployed all the time and he would constantly get different kinds of work because he'd come home from the war. He was just one of those guys, and you only understand in hindsight, he was one of those men who'd come home from the war completely fucked. So he was experience. like shell shocked or what they call now post traumatic. It wasn't even post traumatic. It was more like a political horror. He'd realized that our guys were as bad as their guys. I mean, the stories he tells me of the war are not the war that we hear about. Or, you know, or the stories he did tell me, but he talks about it being more like it was chaos. They didn't know if Hitler would win or not. And everything was, in, he just said it was fucking nuts. They used to go up in the hills and shoot their own officers and then blame it on the Japanese. Holy crap. Yeah. And the first day he arrived in India, the officers just said, look, there's a bunch of women and kids over there, right? Here's the story. Do anything you want to them, and it doesn't matter. And my dad attacked this guy, was thrown in jail. So he was at this, he was shocked because he went to fight fascism, and suddenly he's dealing with this utter I've, breakdown. We've met the enemy, yeah, and just, he is us. All, he just said it was chaos because no one knew. And we look at it in hindsight, of course the good guys won. But he said at the time, nobody fucking knew. Everybody was fucking everything else. And it, it was just, we are on the verge of Ragnarok. <laughs> <laughs> it, sound, it just sounds, mm-hmm. it, it's weird. Like whenever uh, they start depicting the Vietnam War in the late 80s, early 90s mm-hmm. in films, it was like, look at this hell on earth. You think of Platoon. Yeah. And like that was a devastating portrayal of Vietnam War that we hadn't seen before from some guy who'd been there. And like he was like, this is what it was like. And you're like, oh my God, what happened to us? But it sounds an awful lot like, uh, as we go on in history and more and more facts like this get out, every war was like that. Well, just think about it, really. If you're suddenly you're running about, nobody's really in charge anymore. You've got guns. I, I just said, if people were shooting guys that they had an argument with that morning. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. And that's There's no place went. for writers. Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> Heavens no. But no, so he told a lot of great stories and he had uh, – so I, I think he came out of that and he was trying to make sense of the world. So he never had a job. He just, he wanted to, fight, he always wanted to fight injustice. So he was quite heroic in that sense, but he, he continually fought against, you know, corrupt bosses or the state or, and he was always in jail and we were always protesting with banners outside his, you know. Oh either. my God, you're a little activist kid. Yeah. I mean, I've got photographs of me with all these, you know, save Walter Morrison kind of thing. <laughs> ban the bomb, you know. And my mother always dressed us in the most beautiful clothes. So that was the thing. She loved us to look good. So we kind of inherited that. <laughs> <laughs> he's still, he's still dressed insanely well. So no, it was that. It was a very strange, I don't know if it, it, it suddenly it seems quite weird and archaic. Cake in a world that I don't know if MD would understand anymore. Uh, I mean, yeah, but it's you kind of walk us through it so poetically um, and also horrifically, as per <laughs> usual. Everything you do in equal parts is Poetry poetic and horror. And horror. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so you know you want to write, but I know you got into music at a certain point. When did when did the, the band thing come in? Was that I in always your 20s? wanted to write, but just then punk came along, and I thought it's the only way I'm going to meet girls. <laughs> <laughs> now wait, all right, yeah. let's, let's step back. Mm-hmm. What about girls in high school? I you- went to a boys' school. I made the biggest mistake any boy can make. 
right? Were you allowed to choose? No, I'm 12 years old, so I won the scholarship, and I thought, that makes me cool. I'm intelligent. I've just won a scholarship to a very prestigious boys' school. I've got that, or I can go with all my friends to a normal school with girls and all the girls I've grown up with and I'm hanging out with and we're all part of the sex pots club, even though we're only 12 years old. <laughs> and suddenly, boom, boom, It just went all I'm in away. this boys' school where all the teachers are like weird pederasts. No, seriously. The fuck out of here, really? Daddy Hart. Daddy Hart, the gym master. What was, his name was Daddy? We called him Daddy. His name was something Hart, Mr. Hart. But and the, and he was known like, as Daddy Hart because he would come in, he was this little regimental World War II. Now then, boys, line up! And he would walk along this line of boys and check down your shorts to see if you're wearing like underpants. And he'd just linger. Mm. The fuck out no, of seriously, here. Seriously, right? And then the boys, he would put us all in showers. And right, we're just boys, and we're going, get the fuck. And Daddy would come in and stand at the door just like checking out all these naked Oh people. my God, dude. No wonder you write about horror. Yeah, so he was only one of the, the, the teachers at this school. You know what it was? It was that's a good school and all the teachers weren't like that, but enough of them were for it to be fucking weird. <laughs> yeah. So, and all the boys were pretty straight boys, you know, just in this circumstance. And I think we all, suddenly 12 years old, you think, oh, this is cool, I can get on a train and go to school in town. And it's, it's amazing and it proves I'm really smart. And then 13, you're going, shit, I'm in a school with boys and boys alone. <laughs> <laughs> so all of us went mad. And the only good thing about that school was that it was like if, you know, the Lindsay Anderson movie where it's uh, Malcolm McDowell and they, they rebel in the school. Yeah, we, yeah. Were, we were out of control in the 70s and we wore school uniforms so we looked really hot with these like ties and blazers. and the whole So you were like the little ACDC kids, we don't. Yeah. Need, but or no, we, rather the yeah. Pink Floyd kids, we no, don't no, need no, no we education. Were, we were hardcore and we, we sent one old teacher to a mental hospital. We destroyed his mind. And I, th- I look back on the things we did to people. It was like the prisoner, you know, you kind of, there was one time we, we tore down a blackboard and the guy said, why did you do that? And everyone in the class said, nobody did anything, sir. You're hallucinating. <laughs> and we oh, just kept God. doing stuff like that and everybody would back it up, this consensus reality. The guy ended up in a hospital. And so we were destructive and, and finally punk came along and that's what gets me to music because punk came along and that was, oh, right, I get it. That's why I am, you know, I was 16 years old at the time and I was so fucking angry and I hadn't been laid. <laughs> 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 so music came along at that time. And, and what just, was the punk that hit first? For me, it was because I came in late and again, I was like really contrary kid. I get into folk music just to be a, you know, like fuck everybody. I'm just getting into, <laughs> I'm getting into folk music. So I was into like, <laughs> the rebellious yeah, folk. Yeah, totally, fuck yeah, everyone. Yeah, fuck you. Like, nobody's into this but me. And then a kind of punk came along and I thought it was this Nazi thing. And a lot of the boys in my school were getting into it. So I hated these guys. And it was just like anything you're into, I fucking hate. Right. So I hate punk. But then I remember I saw uh, X-Ray Specs, the band with Polystyrene, the singer, come on. They did this song called The Day the World Turned Dayglo. And oh, man, I just, by the end of the song, I'm, I'm a punk. That was it. I totally understand my place it in the world and who switch. I am and right. what I am. And everything makes sense and everything I'm into is punk. <laughs> and so it was kind of this amazing, like, Damascus conversion. <laughs> <laughs> Struck down yeah. by the voice of God. And it made sense of everything. So suddenly, okay, the comics I'm into, that's punk too. And the music I'm into is punk. Why? Why were the comics punk? Because they would seem to me as rebellious and on the fringes, you know, and the stuff I was into was, like, although it was really coming out of that hippie edge, it was like Jim Starlin and Inglehart and all that 70s stuff, the Doctor Strange, and just those amazing poetic comics that Don McGregor did with Black Panther and, and the uh, Kill Raven stuff. So oh I was, my god, it's so adorable! You're you're a fucking comic mm-hmm. book legend, dude. You've uh, one of the one of the, if not the highest selling graphic novel of all time, and you still remember everyone's names of the books that you read as, as yeah, because they're all great, you know. And you you're can still never, a fan, dude. You can, you're can never fan. forget the history and where we all came from, and it should never be forgotten. Because I think a lot of time it's like, oh, adult comics started in 1985. No, you didn't. Go read Don McGregor's. Kill Raven comics and it's poetic captions and you know it's all that formally constructed comic books and mirrored beginnings and endings and you go why is nobody talking about this guy? <laughs> <laughs> what is the explain the meta beginning and ending? Just the idea where he's got something's happening at the beginning, which nobody did in comics in those days. But you know, you see that there's one Kill Ra- or one Black Panther comic I remember, which is heartbreaking. Was a, a little bird, and at the start is drowning in mud. And all the action happens behind this. 
and at the end it just drowns and dies and you're like <laughs> shit you know but the Black Panther's just fought his ultimate nemesis on the banks of this river and the sun's gone down and men have lived and men have died but you just see this little thing sinking slowly be below the mud and finally its eye closes and that's the last panel fucking beautiful yeah but every issue is like that, you know, and again, I, I wonder why a lot of that stuff's just been forgotten, but that's where I was coming from, and that seemed, to me, it was, although that's pretty lyrical and hippie-ish, I was just, everything I liked was punk, so that, <laughs> that kind of allowed it into in. the canon, you know. Um, it's now, again, a moment like that, the, the bird in the foreground sinking into the mud, somebody point that out to you, or do you see that? No, it's there, it's there. And it's the most affecting part of the story, and you've got to get aware of it. You know? And you bury that in your head somewhere for later use because, like, you've just described so yeah. many uh, Morrison type moments, man. I like, I'd had no idea there's a name for it. What was it? Meta, meta story? No, I mean, I, I actually just said mirrored story, but uh, yeah, there's meta. There's all kinds of this. Do you know what it is? It's like, fucking I don't. I'm well, an idiot, idiot, sir. That's yeah, why I'm, I'm just, here to learn. I'm an idiot as well. I'm just making this up. <laughs> no, you're <laughs> fucking the smartest dude I've talked to. Uh, so it's meta mirroring. <laughs> um, all right, so uh, you're pursuing music at this point. You're punk, and you're like, fuck it, I'm going yeah, to play. Are you form, in a band? We form a band, and it's just me and my friends, and we said, let's have a band. So we did, and we actually turned out to be pretty good songwriters, I have to say. We were. I mean, this is bullshit. We were actually pretty good. How did you? Do you do, are you musical? What did you play? Just picked up a guitar, and the, every time you'd learn a new chord, you'd write a new song. So it was more for me about what can you make out of this. And I was, I never got really good at playing the guitar, but I'm a pretty good rhythm guitarist. But it was all about what's the next chord and how can I write a song around it. So we we quickly assembled like hundreds of songs and started playing live, but we still couldn't get girls because we were all just fuck ups. <laughs> And it was terrible. So How old are you at this point? Like 19. It was terrible. <laughs> yeah, well, late in life, man. 19 See, is... No, fucking don't even talk to me. 19 is only <laughs> the beginning of the nightmare. But I'm in a band and honestly, we look pretty super cool. No, we just didn't know how to deal with it. And we had girls come up, but we just freaked them out because we were these weird straight mods and we wore this kind of Austin, you know, like Austin Powers stuff. Yeah, yeah. That's what it finally, but it was more like Rolling Stones, 1967, right. but super tight mod, the velvet jackets. <laughs> And we just couldn't handle the girls. It was just kind of, we'd freak them out all the time. How long have you, or do you do this? How, How long, long are you in the band? That version of the band for like four years, maybe. And Shaggy Graham is fucking talking. Sorry. That's okay. He's, he's just translating for dogs. <laughs> <laughs> got a big heart, dude. <laughs> um, so. So, yeah. So, I mean, it was, uh. I played in the band for a while, but we stuck together and made music for a long time after that, right through the 90s, in fact. And so are you writing lyrics or others writing lyrics? Yeah, I was Everybody's? writing lyrics and tunes, but we were all together. We were like four songwriters in the band, so it was actually, it was pretty fertile. We weren't great musicians, but we were a pretty good, sexy little band. You know? And there sounds like there was like this period of prolificacy yeah. where like you guys put together like a whole thing. Did, did it seem like in the moment we were like, this is what we'll do for the rest of our lives? Kind of, yeah. It was what we hoped, you know, but really, <clears throat> I was kind of always looking at comics because I was doing comics at the time. I was doing that stuff for, <clears throat> for Near Myths. When did that start? Um, when I was 18. So I, I kind of... Is that your first work? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I sent samples to this new sci-fi comic setting up in Edinburgh called Near Myths, and it was run by a bunch of hippies, but they were pretty good, and they did this little book that Brian Talbot contributed to and, and some other people. But at the same time, I also got work with... DC Thompson, who are the big comic book publisher in Britain. And they, they do, they're, they're based in Scotland, but they, they do comics like the Beano and the Dandy, you know, these weekly humor comics that Britain have been doing since like 1910. <laughs> <laughs> like Jack the Ripper was reading this stuff, but you know, it's like really weird comics that go back hundreds of years. <clears throat> so DC Thompson, a major publisher in the case, but it's, it's humorous Thank stuff, you. but they've done superhero-ish kind of things. I mean, they've done everything. <coughs> so I started working for them doing these little digest super, uh, science fiction books that they did in the wake of Star I was because it had been so successful they thought let's do a bunch of these little so it was th these this size Tiny digest books. and they called them picture libraries and there was like 140 panels in them but you tell a complete story so I was already working when I was like 18 which that's why I was able to afford amplifiers and guitars <laughs> you were the professional yeah so I mean I was I was doing comics then but it just seemed it seemed like it was going and you nowhere. couldn't even parlay that into pussy like I'm a comic book fucking writer no, I just didn't know and I'm, like, I'm a comic book writer I'm dressed like fucking Austin Powers <laughs> <laughs> why yeah. can't I get laid <laughs> um <coughs> 
<clears throat> All right. So <clears throat> this is awesome. So you're knee deep in, in comics, a comics pro at this point. Yeah. Is there a book that you want to get to? Is that like 2000 AD? Is that the big No, book? I, I sent stuff to DC. I sent them this big New Gods comeback called Second Coming. I've always heard of this. Yeah, because they did, the, they had this thing. Before called, you tell the story. Sure. Why, now that you've got all the power in the world, why don't you do that old story? I kind of covered, no, I actually didn't cover any of it, but I kind of did. I got my Jones out on Final Crisis and right. Rock of Ages, you know, on that Kirby stuff. Oh my God, Rock but, of Ages. Okay, go back to it. What is, explain the story. It was basically they had this thing called the New Talent Program in 1982. So uh -huh. I'd sent in stuff before. All through the 70s, I was like banging stuff in, but I wanted to be an artist. Who are you and sending stuff to? To Marvel and DC. <laughs> so I, I sent this this stuff in to, to Marvel in 1976, and I'm a 16-year-old kid, and it was like pretty shocking drawing of Conan, you know, this whole Conan fight sequence. But Conan looked like he was like 96 pounds. It was this stringy, kind of muscular character with a sword right. that he, he could never have lifted. You know, he was seriously fucked up. <laughs> so I sent it to Marvel and I just said, as soon as Barry Smith is ready to give up on this full time, I'm here to take over. And it was a super confident. <laughs> it was, uh, no problem, just here's my number. Give me a call tomorrow, Marvel, and I'm ready to start on your biggest Conan title. And I just got this little letter back and it said, he looks a little malnourished. <laughs> <laughs> And that was it. And they just said, please send samples in future. We will keep your work in file. And I was devastated. So I thought, oh, man. <laughs> no, but I came back. You know, I did this. I, I, while I was doing the Thompson stuff and while I was doing the Amiss, I was drawing as well because I wanted to be an artist. That was my thing. More so, so than a writer. I just thought the two were the same. Go together. <clears throat> and that's what happened. So I was doing Captain Clyde, which was my first superhero strip. And that was a, a weekly newspaper strip in, in Glasgow. But it ran in three different newspapers every week. Mm. And it was kind of, it was weird because I was doing all this 80s comic stuff, like skull eating demons and <laughs> fucking magic rituals and horror in the pages of this newspaper that was mostly read by the elderly. <laughs> <laughs> And it was kind of... He's odd. very imaginative. Yeah, I just, God help them, because they replaced me with a, a Tom and Jerry syndicated <coughs> strip immediately after, and it was just this, what blasted skeletons, children on pitchforks. So, <laughs> <laughs> but Captain Clyde was my, my superhero thing, and they, they said to me, we want to do a superhero story, can we call it Captain Clyde? And they thought, you know, it was going to be some kind of, he's got a secret base under the city chambers and he's got a little sidekick. And by that time, I'm like, you know, 19. I'm like, yeah, fuck this. Comics have grown up, so I'm going to make this about a real man. And he was an unemployed superhero. So it was kind of, it was one of the earliest, you know, real life super guys, but it still, it was, it was full of bullshit. It was really inspired by Chris Claremont's X-Men and stuff like that. Right, right, right. <laughs> Is that what, do you recognize, like, it's weird. I look at, the earliest Grant Morrison work that I know, and I don't see an influence of anything. Like, it's, you're an influencer. You know what I'm saying? Like, other stuff, my Batman, whenever I write Batman in comics, I'm writing Grant Morrison Batman from JLA. From no, that, but from, he's like you, Batman. You do all the, there's a way you tell the stories, with the way you grid the pages and the way you do the narration. That's, no, that's you. Honestly. Oh, fuck no. No, I it's you. That, no, it's not. I learned that from reading your shit. Well, that's you, Alan, that. Neil, uh, you guys. But, but I would, I mean, honestly, but I would recognize the note as being specifically you and not any of those guys. So. You're, you're very kind to say. No, see, Tom Pyre once said to me, you have perfect pitch because I identified a line that he'd written in a Gail Simone thing. <laughs> <laughs> So trust me, you're totally Fair identifiable. I, I, I defer to you. Um, okay, so at this point, so you're sending in stuff uh, to the big two, mm -hmm. very confident, um, the thin, emaciated Conans and whatnot. Yeah, now, well, this is later, and I send in this second common thing. And uh -huh. Again, they just they, uh, they, they just got back and said, send us more stuff in the future. But it was okay. It was it was because you're still working over in in your country. Yeah, yeah I'm just doing my published. thing, and but I'm I'm kind of mostly into the band because I think comics are never going to take off, and there's never going to because Near Myths had failed by I think about 1981 uh -huh. maybe. So that was our big dream of uniting sci-fi and adult comics, and those guys had put a lot of money into it, and we were really kind of like their version it. of heavy metal. Or yeah, something it like was that. totally that. That was the thing, or, or like you know like the the there was uh, ground level comics that Mike Friedrich did in the 70s, like Star Reach. So it was that kind of thing he was trying to do, and it just it fell apart. So I, that's why I turned to music for those three years, and then Warrior came out, 
and those guys are oh this is even better Des Skins got it right and now what is Warrior Warrior was the comic where Alan Moore introduced Marvel Man and V for Vendetta so oh. when I read Miracle Man was that and it I was, read the Eclipse <laughs> issues was yeah, that the collective version it was, it was the reprint of and then by that time they couldn't call it Marvel Man because of Marvel because of Marvel, because Marvel in the trade so the, so the Warrior in Warrior the, this is where like uh, you know uh, he does the storyline with Kid Miracle Man, yeah, the whole deal. Saying yeah. I have to, you know, mm. they, uh, you know, you were the only one who was kind to me to the woman in the shower, and then he comes back yeah, and he's like, they, they say I got soft. So that you see that. So I saw that, and particularly V for Vendetta. I thought, oh, fuck, it's it's happening again. Oh my god, that's right. So you wait, know, so V the happened there book, before you know? DC. Yeah, yeah. These strips were running. Marvel Man and V for Vendetta were running in the same comic every month. And it was eight page installments, and suddenly you were seeing this guy, and okay, this guy's doing what we were trying to do with near myths. It's like a can of spinach for a writer. Yeah, and instantly I thought, okay, comics are back, and that was so the band kind of the band was kind of falling on its knees anyway. So I I got out of that. But yeah, but all this stuff had been so I had this whole little bit in between. But as you say, I mean, the stuff I was doing then is not recognisable because I wasn't I, I wasn't trying to make a career. I just was doing my shit. Right. You know, so things like the near myth stuff, it's, it's still my first ever published story is called Time is a Four Letter Word. And it's about time travel and sexy girls and fetish. And it's exactly the same shit I do now. <laughs> <laughs> but there it is in six pages and it's all formally laid out. <coughs> and the pages are done as a countdown. So there's like five panels, four panels, three panels. And everything's there. But you're, so see, that's like what I'm you talking say, about. But, you're, you know, you're, it was oh. all there back then you compose the page in your head more so than just uh hey there's about four panels on this page or whatever you it sounds like you lay it out like the way a musician lays out a piece of music but also i'm drawing it first as well because do you really yeah, all the pages are drawn i mean i've got like hundreds of years of notebooks of every one of those comics todd mcfarlane even said to me i want to publish these because there's lighting effects and everything and like no i don't because I, I don't like people to to do them to, what to see your drawings i don't send them to the artist and it's so I, you do it for yourself to lay it out yeah yeah but then and, but, and then to build on you know you start with a big image or you the big thought and you can put it on a page and work it well that. no that's the thing i don't like this is so how do you stealing do it? this well, how do you do it I mean, when you're doing a comic how do you approach it as a, i here's honestly here's I, I read something that i've always loved Something like your book, uh, a Frank Miller book, a, a Neil Gaiman book, a, a Matt Wagner book, and then I go and fucking go like, all right, this is as close as I could get to that. Like the same feeling that I have when I wrote the book, the same breakdown. Like I love when you describe a term, like when you say like the meta story. I'm like, I've never heard described like that, but I know exactly mm -hmm. what you're talking about, and blah blah blah. So I don't, I you, I mean, you have put your, hey, this is you are a master at what you do, and you've put in years of study and thought into it like so i'm i'm a carpet beggar at best where i'm just like oh i just want to tell a story and i know i want to get to an idea or an image mm -hmm. or something like that sooner or later but it really sounds like you it, if you're drawing it and then kind of redrafting based on your drawing i mean you're you're the real deal sir I, i'm not even in the same fucking league well, it's just, I, I, I spoke that's to That's a lot of work to put into something that you're writing. But I spoke that's... to an artist and they said, so wait a minute, you're drawing this, then you're describing it, and then another artist is drawing yeah. what you drew in the first place. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so wait, Rock of Ages, you drew somewhere. Yeah, I've, got, I've got all the things for it all laid out and Dark Side is and all that. And that. The Dark Side is? Yeah, but... and a lot of them. And oh some of the cases where I was doing like. You just made my heart leap out the Dark yeah, Side, Side is. That is. entire yeah. issue. When you're writing that <laughs> issue, we'll stop real quick just to jump into <laughs> the future. When you're writing the issue of Rock of Ages, the Dark Side is issue. Do you know you're like, Jesus, this is one of the coolest things that anyone is ever going to read leading up to – because you're like, what is that? Why are they seeding it? And then you realize when you get to the final page, dark side is, and there it is in this big splash. And like, it's so blank. It's like that's – it means fuck all, but you know the horror of, oh, no, there is no interpretation anymore. Dark side is, is. – everything that is what dark side is. <laughs> the uh, – when I, I say this a lot, but when I shuffle – uh, loose this mortal coil because for me a lot about life is just kind of figuring out a way which will be in about 200 with. years kevin fucking sure. i hope so <laughs> that'd be amazing but uh one of the things i will be looking for for sure one of, uh, is death the black eraser and and the line that i will probably be thinking about in my head when i'd go is 
like a good scientist, he asks mm. a question, uh, and you know, and I say yes. I, I want to cry when I talk about that line. That is such beautiful fucking writing, mm. and you did it with one of the most ridiculous know, fucking course. characters on the planet. But you that can was, that was the pull emotion of, out of yeah. somebody with like, I mean, you did it again. With Batmite, dude, when you were like, uh, the fifth dimension is imagination. Dude, mm-hmm. I cried when I read that. That quite, is beautiful. But it's also With literal, one of the dopiest yeah, characters yeah. on the planet. And it's literal because to me, I thought, well, inside your head, right, you can imagine fucking football stadia, right? Okay, you got one. Rose Bowl, there it is. Then you can imagine how the Earth looks from space. Then you can pull back and imagine how the universe might look from outside. All in this tiny thing that's a few inches across. Surely that the fifth dimension's there. Oh this God. truly is another higher dimension where all this stuff fits, it's like Tesseract space. It's yeah. like the dream theory of mm-hmm. uh, Joe Rogan. I was on his podcast once and he was talking about, you know, he's very into the mind, uh, the life of the mind. He gets into the meditation chambers and stuff and lays in the, you know, the salt water and stuff, dep- sensory deprivation rather chambers. But uh, he was talking about like the notion of, you know, look, your body goes to sleep here. You wake up someplace else and everything that happens there is crisp and real. And we spend like 10, Mm -hmm. 12 hours of our day living that life, like inert where our mind goes someplace crisp and real. And he talks Mm -hmm. about like, I've been inside sensory deprivation chambers where I've gone places, places where I feel the leaves under my feet and I talk to people and don't understand the language, but communicate. And he's like, it's as real as anything I've touched outside that box or anything like that. It's it's that kind of like deep scary thing in that that uh, you do and you bring to even uh, the, again the dopiest fucking characters man you took Batmite and made him into something legendary simply by giving him that thought and that's a brilliant fucking outside the box thought that only Grant Morrison could could but come also up with. it's like Batmite's inescapable if you look at the entire history of Batman so you're all you're doing is saying in the twenty first century honestly I'm not buying into your five dimensional imp shit but <laughs> how about this is an explanation for this enduring element of the Batman myth <laughs> and that's but that's that's what you're you're so gifted even taking something as fucking ridiculous as that something that even for me I'm like oh, fucking Batman what a ridiculous portion of the Bat mythos and then you make it relevant and real <clears throat> to the point where you're like Oh my God, I'll read a whole issue of Batmite telling Batman deep, wonderful, pithy things like in, in pithy statements of three yeah. words or less. Well, that's good because, you know, for me, it's just like, okay, you bastards, I've been given the entire history of Batman and you stuck this thing in it. <laughs> so I've got to make something out of it. That's all it is. You know? <laughs> and that was what I came up with for him. So. All right, let's jump yeah. back into the past. Um, the uh, Okay, so you're working, uh, you see Warrior, mm. yeah. and you're like, fuck it, man, fuck the band. Comics mm-hmm. is where it's at. This is what I want to be, what I want to do. What do you go work on at that point? Uh, Marvel UK stuff. Now, what is that? Marvel had a uh, UK division, so they were generating uh, material, and I did the Zoids toy comic. Remember the Zoids yeah. things? Yeah, Zoidzilla and whatever they were called. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <Get all> Zoid. <laughs> so... They asked me to do this thing, and so I'm reeling from all this excitement. Comics are coming. Comics are going to be adult. It's big time. It's all happening. Like you're the Zoids. So I thought, okay, blue and red Zoids. That's like Russia and America. <laughs> we're in fucking. So we're in Reagan's America, and we're in whoever was in. You know, it was before Gorbachev, but it was just whatever. Khrushchev. Nick is on enough, and. Uh, so I thought this is a major metaphor. This is amazing. I got one of those Zoid Zellers and I built this thing, like you know, contemplating the Zoids. So yeah, I did this ridiculously poetic take on Zoids, fucking <laughs> Zoids, and it was represented the idea of the Cold War and all of us little people just having to deal with these big bastards. And they're inexplicable. <laughs> Once again, bastards. written by the boy who lived in the shade of the the giant nuclear submarines yeah, down the block. Yeah, which which were Zoid Zellers in their own way. <laughs> <laughs> So no, I was I was kind of really into it, and that got me a job at 2000 AD, and then I did my little, I did a bunch of future shocks, which were their O Henry style science fiction stories. Now, for those that don't know yeah. the the book um, over here, 2000 AD, uh, the most times mm-hmm. American readers, I mean, in the age of the internet, now yeah, yeah. the world's gotten smaller, but there's still some people 
that maybe don't know the book. But 2000 AD, we know largely for, hey, that's where Judge Dredd came exactly, from. Yeah. But what it, – it's it's a – is it an anthology title? Is it kind of like a DC Comics Presents that had a bunch of stories within it? Yeah, it was an anthology. Like all British comics were anthologies. But this one was created by a bunch of basically young rebels at the time, you know, Alan Grant, John Wagner and Pat Mills. They that's created this book. They had to replace a book called Action, which was so shocking that parents had it taken off the shelves. And this comic called Action was amazing. Every strip in it was super violent, <laughs> like, you know, completely morally reprehensible. So it was taken off the shelf and the same cre- editorial team created 2000 AD, which was the science fiction version of it. Cause they thought if they couldn't get away with it, <laughs> probably in, in the contemporary stories, they just, they might just in say, space. Yeah, it in the future. <laughs> the blood's green. Who cares? But the Action Comics had, it wasn't Action Comics. It was just called Action, but it had Hook Jaw, which was their take on Jaws. And it was a shark. It was like, imagine you did Moby Dick, but the shark is Ahab, and he's after the humans who've embedded this hook in his jaw. So is it told from his perspective? From, yeah, and he just You've got an eternal monologue of like, I will just, eat these men. And he just hunts them down, he hunts down every living human thing <laughs> just for over endless episodes in bloody graphic detail. So that's where those guys came from. And they, they kind of tried to recreate that in 2000 AD, but as I say, with future or science fiction settings. And over the years, it began to become a proven ground for a lot of the best talent in, in Britain. So you had Dave Gibbons coming out there, Brian Boland, artists, and, uh, you know, all of them, Alan Davis, everyone had a stint there, even Neil Gaiman worked there for a little bit. So we kind of all of us have gone through that. It's station. almost like the Roger Corman, uh, you know, Absolutely, filmmaking yeah. school back and in the day. Every legend has yeah. passed through those. Yeah, doors. and they whip you into shape, and it's like they teach you how to do five page stories. Who whips you into shape? Do you have an editor? Had an editor there mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. was that shaped you? Who was it? My editor was uh, Steve McManus at the time, and there was a bunch of them. They changed. Then there was uh, Alan McKenzie. Did you actually learn from them, or were, I mean, you're talking about the guy who yeah. wrote in? I'm ready to take over for Barry Windsor Smith as soon as you're as soon as you see the light of day. Where, are, do no, you, are you I, I, too I brash think, or do you mold quickly? Yeah, I'm, I'll, I'll, I'll take a lesson. <coughs> I was always pretty good. <laughs> I, mean, I, would, I was just thinking I was made to do it. So, I, 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 But I would always take a lesson. You know, if people told me something good, I would do it. But sometimes they would just change a story for the hell of it and you had to accept it. But out of that, I did my little apprenticeship doing like 17 Future Shock stories and there's some nice little... What you know, are the Future Shocks? They're like, oh, Henry's basically, they're like twist ending, five page, three page, one page. So you really learn how to, you know, set up some characters and do a, a clever payoff. So it's like a Twilight Zone episode. Yeah, absolutely. Like every, every one of them. So there's was, there was a bunch of them and it was fun to do that discipline, like, you know, like writing haiku. And what do they pay? What do they pay for something like that? Like, hey, you do six pages. I can't remember anything. If they'd paid me in like shoes, it would have been enough. (laughs) But were you living off this at this point? Are you living with your parents or you've gone? I was living with my parents and uh, I was still on the dole, which is welfare, you know, so I was collecting my check every week. But and at the same the time comics. doing comics. Nice. <laughs> you were the richest man in town at this yeah, point. Yeah, I was doing well. You know? <laughs> I could buy guitars. So how long are you doing this before somebody overseas finally goes, uh, hey, come it over. Was, I, I was I, – 2000 AD asked me to do the first superhero series, which was the greatest break I could have had because I was waiting to do this all my life. Mm-hmm. And they said, we want to do superheroes because Watchmen had just started up and it was, you know, that whole thing was happening. Suddenly it was this big blaze, the mid 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 oh, mid-80s, I can't even say it. <laughs> but uh, they said to me, we want to do a superhero strip and I instantly had this fucking zenith thing that had been building up since 1981. And I just took it to them and suddenly that was my thing. And so that was a hugely successful series for them. And then what was it called? Zenith. 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 Zenith they call it. Over here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was about what I would be if it was a superhero. You know, it was like he's 19 years old. He's a pop star. He's no, in- he's got no interest in fighting. I mean, why would you fight? You know, I'm, <laughs> why would I fight? <laughs> so it was that. And but he gets caught up and stuff. And it ran for four seasons you know and it was big what is a season how long 
the first one was 14, the second one was like 26, the third one was bigger, it was a crisis in Infinite Earths kind of thing with all the old superheroes from, you know, DC Thompson comics and IPC comics in Britain. You got to do a big crossover back then? Yeah, yeah, and I just brought in all these characters. That they, Had DC already done their crisis? Yeah, yeah, I was, I, was, so, I was doing my version of the crisis where everyone falls out and they all hate each other. Could <laughs> you imagine meeting people from a parallel universe and they're like, who the fuck do you think you are? <laughs> And the hero just kind of sits out in his parallel world duplicate, dies heroically, and then he gets all the kudos. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so it was, it was my take on that. And, uh, but as I say, it was very successful. So when, when Karen Berger came over and Dick Giordano and Jeanette Kahn at the time in the 80s came over to find more Alan Moores, really, which is... Is that how it happened? Well, yeah, he, he, he was on Swamp Thing at the time, and I think Watchmen was just starting, and they came over to see if there was more of this stuff. You know what they do? They go to the Philippines or to like, <laughs> on the Chartered Island where right. this guy's sitting there drawing all their lives and waiting to do this and they can pay them in coconuts. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was a similar yeah. circumstance. So they found Britain and we were really, we'd been waiting to do this all our lives and, and clearly American comics seemed to need it at the time, you know, that infusion of the, yeah. the kind of punk thing, the... Because we were bringing stuff from the drama that we'd grown up with and from theatre and from music. So it was a little bit of a, a shot in the arm, I think. Creatively, yeah. yeah. I mean, it was a reinvention of comics. You guys might have saved comic books at that point. Because- well, some, honestly, someone else would have done it. But yeah, we were there and we'd been waiting for a long time. And so we got our, our chance. Think about it. All that creative energy built up, mm-hmm. reading all those stories for years, uh, no, and, and reading them going like, man, mm-hmm. if I could do it, I would yeah, dot, yeah. dot, dot, dot. And, and everyone had chance. one. You know, everyone already had a story they were just waiting to tell. Right? <laughs> <laughs> like a loaded gun yeah. you guys were. So Karen Berger comes over and says, what's the first piece of work that she says, hey, come work for us and do X, Y, or Z? I can't remember. I saw her a couple of times and I was just pitching her stuff and, and finally they asked me to come down and on, on the train down I was thinking, Animal Man, I'm going to do this idea for Animal Man. And Arkham Had you was, known the character? Yeah, yeah, I was totally. When I was a kid, because we used to play at superheroes, so I like to find a super obscure one so that you'd be really cool. So when I was a kid, I would be Animal Man, and he'd the animal powers, and he could trump anybody. <laughs> like, I what the fuck your power is? I've got an elephant. You know? <laughs> so yeah, I was I was into it, and I liked that kind of you know find something obscure and what's what what are the possibilities here? But Arkham Asylum had been developing for years. You know, this was the thing I had in my mind. If I could get to do Batman, to do this big weird European film Batman right so I went down with those two ideas Animal Man was like extemporized on the train <laughs> and Arkham was <laughs> Arkham had been worked on for years okay and they bought into them straight away you know they, they I don't know they couldn't understand what the fuck I was saying but they <laughs> they liked my smile <laughs> <laughs> he seems nice yeah he seems okay give him a, a 120 page graphic novel and that at that which at that point mm. like had there been anything like no that? but that was Dave McKean because he came in and suddenly I'd written a, a 48 page story and then it expanded to 64. Mm-hmm. And I imagined it as being super realistic and, you know, Batman's in like this terribly gritty every little bit. <laughs> Who would, I mean, uh, like, that, I was thinking, what kind like, of stuff? Like a Boland, but I was thinking Gary Ooh. Leach or somebody, you know, who okay. had done Marvel Man. <clears throat> but then Dave came on and he was a completely different kind of artist. So, it, Dave, so what I always imagine that said, it was you guys sitting in a bar going, if we were ever going to do a Batman no, story. No, he, it he like this. came on board and he hated this shit. He didn't want to draw Batman at all, which was brilliant for the book in the end. <laughs> <laughs> Why? Why? Explain. He just wasn't in it. He just thought it was trash, really, basically. <laughs> you know, I, I was with him on the Arkham Asylum too, and some fans saying to him, could you draw, the, draw me the human torch? And Dave saying, there's no way I'm drawing that. It's crap. <laughs> And the guy going, but he's just, he's just a guy on fire. <laughs> and Dave said, I don't care, it's crap. And he wouldn't draw Wolverine or anything because he's just, it's crap. But he would draw Sandman. Right. Even though he's got a weird haircut. So there was a kind of, but, but you know, I think Dave made it because otherwise it might have just been an ordinary comic or it might have been Killing Joke too. Or, but he came in and he didn't want to do it at all. But once I told him all the other stuff, the stuff he was into was the behind the scenes stuff, the tarot cards and the Jungian psychology and the Alistair Crowley stuff. He totally got that's on board you, with yeah, it. That's how you jacked him in. Yeah. And he was into that. He was into the underpinnings of it and the psychology of it. And he, he did. So he's like, look, I'll deal with the superhero aspect of it. Yeah. And I just it, hate but... it. But we'd Robin in the book originally and he just utterly point blank refused. So I put Robin in a trench coat and I thought, was this good enough? No. 
I will not have Robin the Boy Wonder. Really? Yeah. <laughs> How much was Robin in the original story? He was only in a little scene, and they're kind of him and Commissioner Gordon are working shit out back at the base. But again, I think he was right. He got once Batman's in the asylum, there should be no more connection. Outside. It should just be because ultimately, what we wanted to do with that book was it's, this is Bruce Wayne when he goes to bed at, at you know eight in the morning. This is what he dreams every night. <laughs> And that's it. And it wasn't meant to be this this actually happened. This is mean this is Bruce Wayne's dreams, this is what happens all the time in that man's head. Right? I mean, I guess it's true, like nobody's ever said this is canon, but yet mm. to me it's it is canon. But what but to hear the author say that no, nah, it's a dream. But it's a canon dream. It's the it's the ultimate dream of Batman, and so you need to know it because that's what Bruce dreams like. <laughs> and it's horrible, and he's ineffectual in a lot of cases, and everything's a reflection of himself. You have this mm. deep love for Bruce Wayne, this uh, mm. sympathy, this empathy um, that I, that I don't think I've even. Uh, and I'm not even saying I'm one of the people that approaches him with that kind of thing, but I've never thought about mm. him as empathetically and sympathetically. As you, you actually care for the human being. I, I mean, I guess when I, every once in a while, I'll see something like, you know, if I watch the, from, if I'm reading a comic that really moves me, I can get weepy. If I'm watching a, a Batman movie that, that has a particularly affecting moment, mm-hmm. I'll get weepy. Like even in the last one, which a lot of people got issues with, him flying that nuclear bomb, as dopey as it is and as reminiscent as it is of like the old Batman mm-hmm. Adam West movie. The notion of like this fucker won't stop, yeah. like that's what fucking gets me about it. And and like in the, it, it's in the Black Hand. It's when mm-hmm. he's broken and dead. And, yeah, yeah. and so the beginning of the next mm-hmm. issue is that very simple journal writing that's mm-hmm. just like uh, Batman thinks of everything. <laughs> like I when I read that, sh- I remember reading that and giggling out loud and getting. Little butterflies. I'm fucking, I'm on, I'm at midlife, dude. <laughs> you know, and I've been to the carnival. I've seen me on a curtain. I know how to work rides work. And still a moment like that will capture my imagination and, and open my heart up where I'm like, Oh my God. Like he found the, he, this is somebody who expresses something about Batman that I, I wish I was smart enough to express. And he fucking gets it like down to a science. And I know. Nobody will ever accuse us on this podcast, mm-hmm. on a Fat Man on Batman <laughs> podcast, of overthinking it. But it's the beautiful lyricism that you bring to not just Batman, but to Bruce Wayne, to the man. Uh, it's you got something special going with the character. Uh, I, I mean, is an understatement to say the least. The uh, Arkham Asylum. I remember as I had talked about going to pick up that hardcover. Man, bought three. Of course, one to fucking read, <laughs> two to fucking store because it was going to be, it was groundbreaking. There, there it was. We picked, I remember picking up off the rack at Hobby Masters and giving it the fucking knocking on it and going like, I can't believe something this beautiful and fucking real. And again, like now kids see hardcover edition, mm-hmm. see an absolute edition of a, a DC book or there, there are, they look like museum works nowadays, but this was back in fucking 1989. Mm-hmm. You didn't see many work, beautiful works of comic book art that you would bring to like a parent or a fucking adult and be like, this could be on our coffee table, mother, because mm-hmm. it was just such a classy fucking looking book. But it was the insides. It was the guts. Like as much as I, I like looking at that book, um, you know, I, I, I'm probably one of the people that would have like preferred the the straightforward yeah. uh, representation like when you reference those other artists i was like oh my god i'd never thought about <laughs> that it was conceived in that way and not for this piece of art that that it became um but as much as i love arkham asylum it was all the writing dude i mean even fucking in in dogma the first words that come out of the shit demon's mouth is no man of woman born <laughs> which was the thing that like was just written in the margins about the Clayface character, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but what? So wait, your go pitch Animal Man and Arkham, and yeah. they say both. Yeah, Dave jumps on to Arkham. Are you already working on Animal Man at this point? Probably, yeah. I mean, I remember doing Arkham in 1987, and I was like super straight edge, so I didn't drink, I didn't do drugs, anything. So I had to stay awake till four in the morning and write this book and try and approximate states of madness using the, <laughs> the old fashioned ways. What, your imagination? Absolutely. I mean, fuck, 
What was I thinking? Yeah. Oh my goodness. That's so weird. You would imagine you look at something like Arkham Asylum and you're like, eh, you know, I guess he's probably, he had a good time writing this. And he probably did have a good time writing it, but you did yeah, it straight. Yeah, but it was actually seriously, I would just stay up with, you know, my sticks in the eyelids and wait till stuff was coming through. It was really quite laborious. It took a long time. So wait, you would write it, you would get to like a uh, sleep deprivation point yeah, and yeah, then go yeah, to work. Yeah. God, you're like one of these actors, like when Matt Damon did Courage Under Fire. He lost a shit ton of weight to be like skinny between periods of the movie. You're like yeah. one, you, no, you take it even to, to the yeah. writing. You're like one of these actors that manipulate their bodies. You're a writer that manipulates your body to get to a but, state of mind. Yeah. Cause it's the only chance of manipulating your body in any way. If you're a writer, you know, you send, spend your entire day sitting in front of a computer. So you got to manipulate your body somehow. So yeah, I've always done it. When I was doing the Invisibles, I just became the King Mob character and shaved my head and travelled the world and went to the clubs he would go to and did that. So it you know, keeps things kind of lively. You know? Oh my God, that's genius. Um, okay, so you're you're writing this absolutely straight edge. Mm -hmm. You turn it, it, it happens. The book gets published. Mm -hmm. Fucking massive. <clears throat> Um, does that change anything for you? And as much as like, they're like, you can do anything you want at this point. Yeah. It changed everything, you know, but it almost didn't happen because they, they called me up and said, we can't do this because the Batman movie's coming out. It's going to be the biggest movie ever. And you've got the Joker dressed as Madonna, you know, and Dave hadn't drawn it at this point because that's what I wanted. I wanted him in the full open. In the full with the, the bullet tits and, the, and yeah, shit. Yeah, yeah. And I thought it's just him. Oh, how, how would you really freak out Batman? You know? <laughs> 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 but they wouldn't let us do it. And it really got quite heated. And I wrote this huge, like two page defense of the whole thing. And, and Jeanette can just said, okay, I, I agree with you. And she really fought for us, which was great. But <clears throat> they didn't want to do it for a while, which was really. You know, because we put a lot of work into it, and suddenly it was, if if you do this, people will think Jack Nicholson is a transvestite. That's what they said to me in 1989. Yeah, like like Jack would care. M yeah, you know, like, like, uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm sure he was just like, "How much did it make? What was my cut? Thank you." <laughs> Especially that, then, at that point, yeah. he had a rich piece of that. Fuck, any anything sure. Joker oriented at that point, he was going to get a piece of. Um, so it went weird for a while. He's also an art fan too. I'd imagine he would have been like, "This." Oh, is cool. he did just he laughed off, you know, the idea. Of, yeah, that's going to make people think Jack Nicholson. Is <laughs> <You're> right. <best. laughs> so, but it, it, it came out, and yeah, it changed everything. Karen phoned it, phoned me up, and she just said, "You guys are rich," because we were on like a dollar a book, and it sold one hundred twenty thousand copies in the first day. And she's like, hey, isn't this good? And for me... Is, that, know, is that the most amount of money you'd ever seen? It's the most amount of money I'd ever conceived. <laughs> 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 so no, it was it was really interesting, you know, and I, I just blew it all on, on traveling the world and drugs and champagne. <laughs> <laughs> so at that point, you stopped being straight edge. Yeah, yeah, I just thought, now I'm going to do all these things that I couldn't afford to do. <laughs> <laughs> um, you are an, you are an author that has, is, uh, a guy who's not afraid to imbibe and whatnot. You, you've been to some weird, wonderful places. Uh, you want to talk about that at, at all? Where, what is your, if somebody was like, Hey man, what, what is one? Hey, where do you stand on psychotropics? Are they good for an emerging writer? Blah, blah, blah. I think they're pretty good if you're, if you're an imaginative person, you know, and a lot of people assume that you can take a pill and suddenly do stuff, but you can't. Right. But if you do stuff and you take a pill and interesting stuff happens, you know, there's no denying it. Otherwise, it's like we live in a, a world where there are a lot of laws against this shit. So it's basically, it's down to you, dude, you know, it's like, do you want to choose to do this? Then you, deal with those consequences right. I, I would never drive people down any path or advocate that stuff and it's, it's been i think anyone who's done it would probably say it was useful any certainly any writer or any creative person who's done it would say it was useful but beyond that you know you make your own choices i'm a weed guy i've never gone harder in weed and um it, and that was even for me a late in life thing mm -hmm. i was like uh 38 when i started smoking weed um, and prior to that, I'd never been a booze guy. I'm more of a sugar guy, obviously. Yeah, yeah. So, the, but the, what I found about weed was it doesn't make you more creative, but it definitely made me less inhibited. Mm -hmm. Whereas I was like, you know, I'd have a good idea and be like, oh, I don't do that. Somebody else fucking did that or something like that. Suddenly with weed, I'd be like, all right, let's give it a shot. Fuck it. <laughs> like, what's the worst that can happen? It'd be fucking <laughs> terrible. You know, I've been told I'm terrible yeah, before. Who cares? That's, and that's my perspective on it. When I've had people talk about like Joe Rogan was like, man, you got to 
try some acid, try some shrooms. He's going, you would mm-hmm. fucking love it. But that's everything seems scarier to me than weed. I'm like, yeah. this is fine. I'm, well, I'm, I'm sure you would love it, but that's for you, you know, and it's kind of, it, I did it because I had mystical experiences and I thought, is, is this just to do with drugs? So I tried every psychedelic. And I was what like, do you mean you had mystical experiences? I, I had higher dimensional or mystical experiences made me feel I understood how everything worked type experiences. So I kept trying all these. I tried, you know, acid, DMT, mushrooms. None of them took me to this thing. So for me, it was all about that. It was like, is is this just some fucking thing? Bullshit. What was that thing, though, that you were trying to get back to? I, oh, that's a story, you know. <laughs> is it? I mean, is it a story you don't tell or is it a story? Yeah, it's a story I've told a few times. But it's, I, I went to Kathmandu in, in Nepal. How old are you? Like 34. Okay. And this is so. This is after you've done Arkham Asylum. You've yeah, done, I've done Arkham Asylum. I've been traveling the world. I've done a bunch of stuff, you know, and I've, I've smoked some weed and I've done a little bit of, you know, <laughs> going to fetish clubs doing the thing. Right. But my friend and I saw this documentary on TV, and there's this uh, broadcaster called Dan Cruikshank, and he's he's basically retracing the steps of the Buddha. So this is pretty cool. We're watching this, mm-hmm. and he reaches Kathmandu in Nepal, and he says, "Right here, there are." This temple, Shwayambanath Temple, is the temple of the self-created one, the most important part of the valley. They got 365 steps. And he said, if you can do these steps in one breath, you're guaranteed enlightenment in this life. So he's puffing up the steps. And me and my friend Ulrich are watching this show. And we just think, we could do that in life. <laughs> so I'm working out. And I've got all this money. You know, Arkham <laughs> Asylum, Doom Patrol, the Invisibles, GLA. I'm thinking, hey, we, we could do this for like however many hundred pounds. We could go to Kathmandu and do the whole enlightenment in this life. And we'd come back enlightened. Yeah, fuck, this is brilliant. This is the easy, <laughs> but the package to enlightenment, you know? Nobody ever put it this yeah. simply. A couple <laughs> steps, one breath, we're there. Yeah. So we buy a ticket. We're in Kathmandu within like three days and uh, we go and stay in this hotel, the Vajra Hotel. And I think it's, again, significant because the Vajra is the lightning bolt. And to me, that's the Flash sign and the Captain Marvel sign. And it's really significant in the development of comics. So we're in this lightning bolt hotel. We stay there for a week, having adventures. Eventually, on the last day, I'm kind of sitting up there and writing in my diary and doing some notes for stuff, and everything started to get really strange. So the the temple at the head of the valley started to look like a machine as if it had turbines and weird shit was going on. So I got up and I'm trying to get downstairs, lying down in my bed, and these silver blob things emerge from the walls and from the substance of the ceiling and the floors. And it's kind of, oh, fuck. And they said, right, you you asked for it. And they go, where do you want to go? Right, so this is, I'm real. And I know that it's ridiculous. You're, are right. you straight? No, right. This, but it's not even, I took this tiny little bit of hash. So okay. this is why I kept trying to get back to see, was this a drug state? But nothing could reproduce it because it was beyond any drug state. But I have to, I can't deny I was on this little tiny bit of lent, lentil size thing, right? So the glob, so what the globule said, come with me or? Yeah, they just said, where do you want to go? Okay, you've done it now. And I said, oh, fuck, Alpha Centauri. And suddenly I had no body. I like, couldn't, there's no reference point and I'm in space, like three dimensional, 360 degree view. And there's three suns, like astronomical. There's a planet. So I put this thing in All Star Superman years later. <laughs> But there's a planet and there's these th- things made out of glowing neon tubes. And right, this just sounds like some acid vision, I know. But so I'm like, what the fuck is this? And they just said, well, you've offended these people with your behavior. We're going to have to get out of here. And we're going, this is what you came for. This is what you wanted, isn't it? We're going to show you something. And how it felt and how I remember it has been taken off the surface of the third dimension. And they turned me. Into the, what do you mean? How they take they you? They turned up this- me into a higher dimension. I can't. It's just they pulled me off and everything went flat, and then they turned me around. Okay. And they said, "Okay, here's where you are now." So it was this gigantic vaulted space. It felt infinite, but it also felt enclosed. It was blue, azure blue. It was like white, silver trace lines going <laughs> zipping through everything. Gridding. Like grids, but they were only. They were never permanent. They were. They, they just came and went. Like the grids, but like Gotham yeah. grid and the one issue. Yeah, where- like that. Except that was more permanent. These were just like zipping in and out and all these silvery blob things. And they just, this, this is the shit. Right. So I'm there and it suddenly felt like, Oh, I just woke up. Oh, what? what the game's over. What would you just do to me? I was just, I was having fun. And it was more real than any of this. This is like low res 1950s TV 
this world we live in compared to this experience. So I'm like, what the, the, of course, I'm thinking, of course I'm here. This is where I've always been. So they kind of turn me around and they say, this is what we do. Try and remember as much of this as you possibly can because you might be useful to us. And they're showing me this stuff. They turn me around, there's these like stalls and they said, each one of those is a universe. And they said, right, what we do is we grow our children in universes because there's no time here. It's all, it's, it's, it's permanent. Nothing ever changes. They said, so the only way to create change is you create time because things change through time. So they said, so we make time in there and then we put our seed in and it grows and then it becomes us. Us meaning you and me? Us becoming what they were. Right. Them, their beings. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So they basically said, like, so look at your planet and look at what's going on. There's a singular life form. And it was kind of, they were showing me, they said like three and a half billion years ago, a single cell divided. The same cell is still in every one of our bodies. Oh my and God. And they said, right, if you add the time dimension to your experience, you see it's all one thing. Just run it back. Your mother, you run back into her. She runs back into her mother. They all run back. Everything runs, it all runs back. So they said it's one singular thing. It lives on the planet Earth. It's one of our children and it feeds on everything around it. It said, don't worry about how you seem to be consuming the environment. Look at a caterpillar on a leaf and what does it do? And I'll go, oh, it consumes its environment. And they said, yeah, don't worry. The leaf is fine. <laughs> oh my God. You're blowing my fucking mind. Yeah, right. So. But they were blowing my mind, <laughs> and they were showing me this. So it all worked back, and I'm going, yeah, this fucking makes sense. Like, everything's, everything's, and they say, yeah, it's all one thing, and it's one of us, but that's what we look like as a larva. That's the maggot to fly. And then they just were like, and if you can make sense of this, go back and tell as much of this as you can. Right, so they fire me back, and I'm like, oh, wake up in bed with this haunting my head. And so the next, all of the 90s then were me taking everything, every psychedelic I could try to get, and nothing ever came near this hyper real high def thing. So then that was a real <clears throat> oh, spiritual and, experience. And it, yeah, so it affected everything, and that fed into all the comics I was doing. That, you know, that's why the Warlogog and J JLA. And, oh, my gosh. You know, the idea that you could represent the universe in a, a finite form. The, the the philosopher's stone. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm sorry, I'm still catching up. Like, what do you do after that? How do you exist in this fucking barely technicolor world or this 50s TV world when you've seen that? Like, really? how do you keep you down on the farm <laughs> once you've seen Paris, so to speak? Is that why you went looking for it in other places and then definitely decided this was a singular spiritual, mystical experience? How do you fucking stay after something like that? I just kept exploring, and that's why comics are so great. Because I was able to do the Invisibles, which then passed out this experience into a six-year-long comic book thriller. <laughs> and that was how I did it. You, you disseminated know? the yeah, information. Yeah, examined it from every angle. What if you're wrong? What if it was some fucking weird temporal lobe hallucination? And then you come to even more interesting ideas, because I'm thinking, okay, what if I... I'm reading books and thinking, you just hallucinated. You totally had... Temporal lobe epilepsy. Yeah, or something, yeah, a glitch in the matrix. Of and then sort. I started to think, but so that means if you have temporal lobe epilepsy, you have an experience of the entire universe has been one singular thing and it's all expanding and it all has meaning and significance. Shouldn't we be pressing that button? Yeah. You know? So even if it's most physical and it's most material, shouldn't we be fucking pressing that button? Because it makes us feel better and it gives meaning to more things. Um, when are you starting your religion? Because I'm ready to tie. No, fuck. Uh, it's, it's so easy to do something terrible. And again, you know the big mistake people come back from these experiences, and lots of people have had things like them. And they have, who have you met other people? Yeah, but it's obvious. Like Philip K. Dick had these things. You know, it's like people like Robert Anton Wilson. It's not new. Two thousand years ago, you'd have been Jesus or you know Buddha. But now lots of people, but you don't have a framework. So a lot of people think of it as alien abduction or demon possession or some weird encounter with God. A lot of people would become born again. You know, I, I met Christ. I saw Christ. So it was kind of all these archetypes come up. And I don't think it's saying, I think it's something everyone can do. I actually just think it's a matter of perspective, but it helps you see things better and it helps you be more friendly to everyone else because you do suddenly see this connection. And it might be useful to get everyone in that state. 
did you ever ascend the stairs? Because it sounds like you achieved enlightenment yeah, without even it. fucking. Oh, I forgot to tell you that. <laughs> you got... Easy, right? It's when you're a young guy, thirty-five, no problem. One lungful of air and bang, you're up the stairs. So yeah, we did it. And is that it's a one lungful? Yeah. So no at the problem. bottom, you're like, <gasps> I mean, it's so weird. You tell me a story about going to like a different dimension. And I'm like, hey, man, the fat guy's like, did you go up those stairs? I know, that's the best <laughs> Because bit, that's it? like, yeah. I, might, I might try for enlightenment, <laughs> but boy, those stairs, 300 sounds no, a lot. No, you could do it. It was shockingly easy. So, and then enlightenment two days later. <laughs> so they did fall. So yeah, they, fuck it. I mean, that was the, that was the nutty thing. Cause I had to go home and just think, okay, you really got what you wanted. And it wasn't, I mean, enlightenment and Buddhist tradition is a much, it's a kind of non-dual state. I mean, I was seeing visions, but they were such brilliant visions and it did feel, it changed my soul. It was, everything was different. Ever my relations to time and death and all of that changed. How do you feel about death? It's scary as fuck. I'm more scared about the lead up because now I've watched parents getting more and more fucked up as they get towards it. So that's still terrifying. It doesn't help. But I kind of think, I'll wake up in this other place and just go, whoa, let me do that one again. This time I'll be you. Yeah. Is that, please comfort me, is that, so based on your experience, is that your take or is that uh, uh, something you put together going, I think, I hope it's this? No, it's just it's just how it, it felt absolutely there is no doubt that's what it was when I was there. But now as a, a rational adult in the 21st century with only that as a memory, you're going, well, what if I just imagined that? Well, but it's still interesting. But when I was there, just know this is reality. This shit here, this was like the bottle city of candor. This was a, a made up thing. You know, it was so obviously that was real and this was a simulation. Oh my God. <laughs> so based on that, then there's something cooler waiting. Or yeah. as cool. Or yeah, just that there is a place where these creatures who are, they seem to be, you know, super intelligences who engage in nonstop creativity and that's all they do. Oh my God. So we will right. fit in like fucking nuts. So if you're an artist. Yeah. So what about people that are destructive and shit like that? Well, they get absorbed in as well and they become part of the library because, you know, what kind of hyper intelligence would you be if you didn't understand pain or anger or hatred you got to know that shit or else you're not complete so they would just absorb that but it becomes less meaningful in a higher perspective it just flattens out i'm telling you man i you know i've I fucking i've been here for 42 years i've been a catholic for like ever since the beginning <laughs> studied a lot of fucking faiths you're the first thing that's given me true hope about fucking <laughs> my own demise outside Good. of that fucking black racer line. <laughs> Death the black racer. Yeah, and that's the same shit. And there's the black racers up there, I'm sure. But no, I mean, all, and all I can see, I mean, this is just. Did you write that before or after? <laughs> No, that was after all this was informed by that stuff, you know. So, so Black Race, all the, the yeah, yeah, was yeah, all informed yeah, by the yeah. experience. And the Warlock Gog was my deal. Imagine you could have a map of the entire universe contained within the universe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um. Oh my God, that dude. I, and you were like, no, I don't want to tell that. No, I, I've told the story before. <laughs> I mean, good God, that informs everything. Yeah, no, it totally is the pivot point of my fucking life, you know. And then I got super sick after that and was brought to the point of death. So that the whole thing was like a... a Why? How were you brought to death? <clears throat> I got really sick. I didn't know I was, I was sick with a staph infection, staph aureus. So I went through an entire year, but I was super fit because I was doing like martial arts and all, all kinds of stuff. But I got sicker and sicker and I started to erupt in boils like fucking demon possession. And what was it? I finally got one in my face. But the weird thing was I was writing about this in The Invisibles. So the King Mob character who was styled after me is on a torture chair and they convince him that he's got necrotizing fasciitis bacteria munching through his face. Three months later, I've got this hole. You still see the scar, right? I know. So it turned out to be this bacteria and it went on all a few more months and finally I collapsed. I was hallucinating. I saw Christ coming into the room. What did he, when he came in, did he say anything or do anything? Oh, yeah, but I can only remember the first bit. What Again, was the first bit? I put bit? it in the comic. Christ walks in the room, call him a light, and then suddenly it's Christ, and he said, I am not the God of your fathers. I am the hidden stone that breaks all hearts. Explain that, please. No, and then I can't remember the rest. It was just this, I was, I was tears running down me, and he just, and it basically came to, you can stay, you can die tomorrow, or you can stay, but if you stay, you got to spread the light. And I'm like, oh, okay, sure. <laughs> I'm I'm in tears, dude. What the fuck? Yeah. 
And it's like Gnostic Jesus, you know, it's I'm the hidden stone that breaks. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Explain that. What is that? The hidden stone? The hidden stone, the hidden, right? Hidden. What does that mean, hidden? Hide, the hiding, the one that's hidden. The hidden stone. Yeah, hidden Sorry, stone. That's just my accent. Where the, where the, my yeah, accent, yeah, your yeah, accent totally. of clash. The hidden stone. That breaks all hearts. Jesus Christ. You know, I mean, well, yes, but there was Jesus a whole, Christ. there was a whole <laughs> monologue, and I was just so far gone hallucinating. So this, again, all these things were feeding into the, the work that I was doing. So the the, but when you say the staff infection, you had one of those f- flesh-eating things going on? It wasn't the flesh-eating thing, but it did the same. It did damage. It ate, ate right through my cheek. At that point, you're like, oh, my God, I'm writing myself now in yeah. the past, and everything I write yeah. is going to come true. So then I'm in hospital writing myself out of it. and um, <laughs> no, Seriously? <laughs> And I was trying to communicate. He gets well, yeah. real I, fast. No, totally. Look at the Invisibles, and he yeah, he gets well, and he's getting laid hardcore. You know? <laughs> and within months, I was. So it was kind of it worked, but that was a really weird. It was occult times, you know. Things were happening in the wake of that encounter in Kathmandu that were just fucking. That was that was my Bowie in Berlin time. It was like just weird shit was going down. Does it? Did it ever <clears> stop, or does it continue? No, I eventually stopped, you know, because it was like surfing a wave. It was really quite weird. But there, there was a time after I got sick, I kind of, there was a night I just kind of peeled off this whole, you know, <laughs> sicking out the window. And that was the end of it to a certain extent. But I still do that magic and occult stuff, you know. What do you mean you still do it? I still do rituals and, and kind of. What kind of rituals? Explain. Just summoning God forces and and uh try to help people and <laughs> so how, how and how does and what is like in a like a, i mean is there a do you sit in like a fucking circle and shit like that yeah because if, if that's what gets you off yeah because the whole idea is right it's not there's no rules to this it's just what works it's because I, I grew up in this chaos magic tradition and i get this could take us off in mad fucking tangents i don't it's know fantastic. how far we want to go but no go but say for the invisibles, right? I mean, basically, I grew up. Chaos magic says, like, if you do certain things, certain changes occur in your consciousness. Let's just call them magic for now and try them out. Totally. Okay. <clears throat> so they say, like, you know, you don't have to summon up Egyptian gods. As long as you summon up an energy that stands for whatever the Egyptians believed in, you'll get the same effect. So I tried a bunch of this stuff. So, you know, one of the things I always say, like the Greeks had this god Hermes, right? He's the guy with the winged hat and the, you know, the, he runs around. He's the messenger of the gods. So in the, in the days of the Greeks, what Hermes represented was the idea of communication, specifically language, because language can pass ideas across vast distances and across time and all kinds of stuff. So suddenly that's, that's a pretty occult idea. That's a magical idea. You know, a king can make a statement and then 200 years later people still hear it. Right. That's what language can do. So they created the idea of imagine language looked like something. Well, it would look like a beautiful youth with a, a winged hat and winged heels and he can go anywhere and, you know, he carries messages. So that was all that was, right? There was never, they never believed there was a guy on Mount Olympus, like, you know, hanging out with <laughs> somebody. Right. But they just said if, if communication looked like anything, Here's a symbol. Right. You know, in the same way that vengeance looks like something, here's Batman. Right. <laughs> right, right. So in the same goes Aphrodite, goddess of love. Well, somewhere in the world, somebody's in love right now, right? They're feeling it. They're feeling the peak of fiery passion somewhere right now. And if you extend it every moment, somebody's feeling that. And sometimes it's us that gets to feel that. Yeah. But somewhere in the world is always love. So the Greeks said, well, that quality of eternal love is Aphrodite. She's always there. And we get to feel her, and when we're possessed by Aphrodite, we're filled with love. Right? So you get, say, rage, like Aries, war. When you're angry, you're possessed by the god of war. But somewhere there's always war. Somebody's always angry. So there's an eternal quality of right. anger that never fucking goes away through the entire history of human interaction. And that's what they called gods. So basically, when you're doing magic, all you're doing is kicking everything out of the room that isn't Hermes. So that you're totally infused by communication and speed and fucking let me talk, let me sh- fucking poetry. Are you by yourself? You don't have to be. You can be with people. What you know, do you we do? Can do it now. Because if I'm going to ever do this, I'm going to do what huh? you do. Well, you take, you do things that make you feel speed. So you d- drink Red Bull, you drink coffee and you play Madonna's Real Light or you look at Flash comics and you just get everything out of your head but the idea of speed and communication until you are a god. Right. Is that possible? Of course it's possible. That's what people have been doing for thousands of years and they call it magic. But it's, it's just this. It's just connecting with the eternal idea of communication. 
and being with it for a little bit, you know. So then, what happens when now, when you get to that state? There's, there's there a place where you're from, I've crossed over into. Uh, what do you call it? Uh, it's just enthusiasm. Let's call it because that means literally being possessed by a god. Right. So you're enthused by the spirit of communication. So pick up and do shit. You'll be super creative. Or otherwise, you're enthused by the spirit of love, and you're about to meet your girl or your boy, or you know, and you're filled with it. You know, if you want to be James Bond for the night, play James Bond records, <laughs> conjure him, wear a tuxedo. So I, th- I was testing this stuff. I thought if you can conjure these just states of mind to the point where you feel like a god is taking over, can you do it with things that aren't real? You know, so I, I was I tried it with John Lennon. And although he's real, he's dead. Right. So I thought, let's do ritual magic. And I surrounded myself with my Beatles albums and I wore the Paisley shirt and the tight trousers and the Beatles boots and I got my Rickon back out. How and old are you? This is like when I was 30. This is when I was doing hardcore magic, when I was doing the Invisibles. Okay. And I put Tomorrow Never Knows on a loop and just summoned John Lennon the way you would summon a demon, but I'm sitting in a circle of Beatles album. <laughs> <laughs> no, but right, and seriously, a head, this head made out of what looked like visual like notes, chiming music, appears of John Lennon rotating in the room. And it's not, I know it's not there, but it's there. It's a seat of what the fuck, this can't be. And he tells me a song, and I'd, I'd recorded this song. It's on the, the fuck out of yeah, here. It's on the internet, and it's like it's like a kind of crappy B side from the Revolver period, <laughs> but it does sound kind of Glennon esque, you know. That is magic. Yeah, and it's just all I was doing was kick everything out of your head except the idea of John Lennon, and that's what happened. Now, do you go? <laughs> do you, where's the darkest place you've ever gone? <clears throat> just trying out things like voodoo stuff because I, I got caught up with these voodoo scorpion things what are they they were like gods scorpion gods i didn't even know i didn't know such things existed right so i was fucking about with this stuff and there's a certain element like i quite like in the west because we can pick and choose it's like a supermarket of belief you can try shit out right but at the same time that's culturally it's kind of offensive the way we treat you know things that are actually sacred to certain specific cultures so i think that I was maybe wandering into areas that I wasn't equipped to put a properly deal with. So right. I'm dealing with this voodoo shit because I'd read this interesting book and I thought, oh, okay, I'll try some of these rituals and see if I can conjure these beings into, into uh, manifestation. The same ones from Kathmandu? No, this was different. This was like specific, like these people. The believe, one you read about these and you're like, I'll yeah, try I read about these things. Like, what, what, there are giant scorpion. But I, I, it, it was an, I came to it by, uh, I think I was trying to, Conjure the voodoo death god. You know that guy from Live and Let Die, Baron, Baron, Samadhi. <laughs> Baron Samadhi. Right, so and Papa, Papa Gay Day, and I kind of got into this figure. I thought he was really funny. He was cool, and I put him in, again. He's in the comic, you know. But I remember having this weird fucking vision, and there's gigantic scorpions with semi-human faces surrounding me. I said, "Oh, you're fucking in trouble now. You're in deep shit." And I went, "Oh God, what's happening here?" I said, "So you want to learn how to kill?" And they were showing me how to destroy human spirits, like auras, and it was this really weird, like, flayed figures that were appearing. So it was a very bizarre experience, and they're saying, you're going to become one of us, you'll become an assassin for us and be in our order, and you need to get a tattoo at the base of your spine of a scorpion. And I'm like, no fucking way, I'm out of this. And so I backed out of this contact, whatever I'd got into, and I run in, into the living room, which, and this is nuts, right? So I turn on the TV and Howard the Duck comes on. The <laughs> right? And I'm, yeah, I'm laughing. And then at the end, these scorpion yes! us come down out an interdimensional tunnel. And I'm like, oh, fuck. You know, like, <laughs> this appalling movie suddenly turned into like the most frightening thing I've ever <laughs> seen in my life. <laughs> So I was totally, I just, I felt stung. And then not sh- shortly after I had this infection and I was almost died. So I really felt as if I came close to something. <laughs> so you think it was yeah, the voodoo yeah. scorpions? Who yeah, fucking yeah. And so sick. I'm very, I'm very respectful of these guys. So, and that's not a place you head down toward anymore. No, I wouldn't have anything to do with that anymore. You did. did I didn't you want to the f- play with them. They were teaching me how to be some kind of psychic assassin. Yeah, like just, something negative. Yeah, I'm not. And it sounds it, like you know? go for all positive types. Well, stuff. that's rather, you know. I, mean, <laughs> I, I don't know what the price of being a psychic assassin might be. You know? <laughs> <laughs> what, um, now, where were you when you did that? Were you in your room? Were you, 
No, I was just in my house because I bought this beautiful big house off the Arkham Asylum royalties. So I, I was living large at this time and just crazy, you know, as I say, champagne, drugs, world travel, crazy beatnik friends. <laughs> but after, after yeah. you summon and see the gigantic mm. voodoo scorpions, like that to me is like, I'm not going in that room ever again. No, like, cause you know that people, exists. Yeah, a lot of people still won't go in that room. And the whole back end of that house became like toxic. There was one room we just couldn't go near and no matter how hard you couldn't light it and the lights would always bust from this room outwards. It would flood. There's still no carpets on the floor because it's so damp and dark. Oh, my Lord. So, yeah, there are resonances. To this <laughs> I was honest. I was just going nuts and doing all kinds of weird experiments. Like I say, it was Bowie in Berlin or like when William Burroughs was in Paris doing all the right. mad all culture. All right, uh, I'm going to call time out right there. Uh, we're going to put a pin in this conversation. There's no way that one podcast would be enough to hold our chit-chat with Grant Morrison. So guess what? It's a two-parter, man. You're going to hear a lot more of this next week. Now, for some people who are like, look, I appreciate that Grant Morrison has done some amazing weird things and been some mystical places, but where the fuck's the bat chat? Before we get out of here, man, let me give you a little, a sousson, if you will, a nice chunk of conversation that was re recorded right before we even started the show with Grant, um, at, talking about the Dark Knight Returns animated movie. There's a nice seven to eight minute chunk of Grant talking about Batman, get you nice and hard and wet for next week. Listen to this. I did a commentary track for the second part of Dark Knight Returns, which they did such a fucking great job. Was the movie good? I, I mean... Look, is it ever going to be Frank's? Yeah, of course not. Of course not. But this is this is the best Batman movie they'll ever make at this point in time. It's so close. The source material is so good, and they stay close to it. And there's definitely things that have been changed around in order, and some things yeah. that drop. But generally speaking, it's, so it's pretty rough. Yeah. But the yeah. the the really controversial aspect about it is they dropped all the internal monologues, so he doesn't say like. You know, this would be a good death. That was the part that, that aged least well, though. You know, that stuff. It's the kind of stuff that seems almost parodic when you see it now. So, so that feels like it's kind of stuck in, in time. Yeah. Wow. Maybe that's how they felt and stuff. Uh, I've also, cause I didn't want to you know what Batman thought. I liked him. It's just, what the hell is this weirdo up to? You know, <laughs> I, I thought I was getting too far into it when, you know, the way they, the, the way Miller did it. And I know why it worked, but it just seemed like I don't want to know this guy. I don't want to be that close to his thoughts. <laughs> Um, I just reread Dark Knight Strikes Again. I think that's a, a great book. And it's, it's not it's Dark fucking, Knight no. levels of great, but it's just a really good Miller try to do something different, you know, and not repeating shitty. himself and people getting it wrong. And he was just, he wanted to do comics the way they used to be done, just whatever comes into your head, bang it on the page. And it seemed like, and I, I, I know nothing about Frank, but it just seemed like cocaine comics to me. Yes. It's like, whoa, go for it. This is great. Come on, give me more colors. <laughs> <laughs> but it really worked in the fact that 9 11 <coughs> comes banging right in the middle of that book and clearly he didn't know anything like that was going to happen. And suddenly, boom, 9 11. <coughs> and you can see him dealing with it. Well, suddenly, this kind of this Silver Age romp turns into something else I, I think it's a really good book i think it's that people haven't caught up with it because a lot of the maybe it's too is, ahead of the curve yeah it's, just, it's not adolescent it's adult you know and i always thought the angsty stuff that's what that's what i didn't like when i was young because it seemed like teenage me all that you know the original kind of stuff where it's the uptight you know batman like Emo. clenching his ass yeah right <laughs> i'm so bad at everything <laughs> Oh, God help me. And help that's me. the part that you don't mm. like? You like to take that out? Well, I find that was kind of, didn't make sense. And oh, I like things to make sense. And for me, growing up reading Denny O'Neill, Batman and all that stuff, Batman for me was a guy who'd been all around the world and he'd had all these amazing fetish girls chasing him. He was super rich. He had the best toys in the world. And what he'd done was dealt with his trauma in a very unusual way, but it was a way that totally worked for this guy. You right. know? So his life was what he made it work. Suddenly, he didn't just get drunk, he didn't you know, destroy his life and blow the fortune. He made it useful. And I think, okay, we have to accept that, and we have to accept that if he's a super martial arts master, and master of meditation, and he can slow down his breath and survive for an hour in a coffin. Uh, uh, That's no. I love that thing. shit. <laughs> I love when you write that shit specifically. You know, and it's because it's. And people say, "Oh, you're doing back God," but to me, it's not. I'm being real about who this guy would be at this point in his life. I have to acknowledge this is the fucking Batman, you know. And he can do all this stuff. And honestly, you don't go through courses in Buddhist meditation and come out an asshole at the end. <laughs> If you do it right, you know. 
So I thought Batman was the most sorted together humanist icon on the planet, you know, and that's where I found myself kind of falling out with people who thought he was tortured or damned or depressed or unable to assuage that guilt. I thought he did it. Every night he went out, he dealt with that guilt and just, okay, I'm making things better. So I saw him fundamentally positive and mentally positive and able to inspire people. And it was just, a, I think that's, that was a different take on it. After the whole 80s. Yeah, that's badass Batman and stuff. Yeah, but I think even Miller wasn't going for that. I mean, if you look at Dark Knight, Miller was going for this steadily accumulating mythic version of Batman, which is what I love about it, because it starts off, first episode of Dark Knight, first issue, he's got the red oval, and it, basically it's Adam West, and he's playing that game. He's saying, look, you guys, you know this character. You all saw him on TV. You don't need to be comic book fans. Here's Adam West, but he's 60 years old, and look at the world he grew up in. And that's what's so great about it. But then the next one, it's like, here's Adam West, but okay, the yellow's gone. And he takes the Batman costume through these evolutions, and each issue is getting darker and darker. And then it's him up against the Joker, and it's all morality's gone, and then finally he's becoming mythic. And the last episode, which I love, you know, Batman's in armor, he's fighting Superman, he's riding a horse, it's nuclear apocalypse. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, it's gone from this quite believable Citizen Kane story of Bruce Wayne, age 60, being possessed by his demon once more, into this epic, apocalyptic, gutter dammering of a thing. <laughs> and that's what people forget about Miller. It was never realistic. It was epic, operatic Batman. I All I want to do now for the rest of my life is a podcast called Comics with Grant Morrison. And <laughs> I just want you to tell, like, <laughs> to tell me about comics that I know and love. You just put a comic book that I've been living with a lot lately with the release of that flick and then rereading the book and stuff and then re and then rereading dark knight strikes again you just put it through a prism where i was like i you know what i never realized that there is a bunch of stages of the costume yeah. and he is Watching evolving him more and more armored all the time but more magnificent more epic more now let me ask you and the stakes go higher until it's actually it's nuclear winter in the last <laughs> you know you to go how did they get here from this crime drama and it's, it's, that's, that's Norse mythology. And I think that, again, that's, if I had to say anything about Dark Knight, about how great it is, it's what people forget is that Miller took it from the streets to this, you know, it's Wagner. <laughs> <laughs> now, let me ask you this. When you arrive at that, is that because you read somebody else or that was your own conclusion? On the no, dark I night. just read it. I mean, it's just an observation. You, know? you even think like a brilliant writer. But it's not, I mean, to When me, you're thinking about <laughs> someone else's work. Because you're looking at it and, well, that's what I'm getting, you know, and I'm, and because I like to also look for the this, this shit that people haven't seen, you know, I'm really contrary that way. So if somebody says this is about that, I'm instantly thinking, no, it's the opposite. <laughs> and so I start, you know, and it just becomes, for me, it was all about just observation. You know, I, I was, I wasn't educated then, but if you fucking look at things without prejudice, and you said, what does it make me feel? You start noticing, you know, and, and works like Dark Knight, they're endlessly rewarding because they're really smart. You know, that guy was smart when he was a kid. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a really great piece of work. And I, as I say, it can be endlessly looked at. And it's, uh, 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 you miss approaches because people have said for 20 years or 30 years now almost, oh, it's this. It was a realistic approach to Batman. It was, you know, it, it inspired all this grim and gritty. It's not grim and gritty at all. It's, a, it's like I say, it's an opera. And I'd, I'd like people to notice that again and maybe reappraise it on that scale. Oh, I'm fucking so in love with you right now. It's nuts. <laughs> You're beautiful, man. 1990 or early 1991. Mm -hmm. I'm going to this acting class at Brookdale Community College in Jersey take this acting thing and 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 more just to have fun i liked acting in high school it was kind of fun so i haven't done it in a while it seems like it'd be kind of cool thing to do i said comics i'm my whole life at this point i want to perform some comic books hmm. so i'm paired up with this one dude and paired up with this one girl and with the girl we do um sandman the issue where uh morpheus goes to confront lucifer and lucifer is closing down hell the second performance we did was Animal Man, mm -hmm. the issue where Buddy meets Grant Morrison. <laughs> so there's video in this world, dude, of me dressed in a something you rarely ever see, a suit jacket and wow. pants, trying to speak with a, a, a British accent, not even <laughs> approximating Scottish, doing that whole issue of the book. 
Um, it's, it's pretty fucking mind bending stuff. That's how massive a fucking fan I was <laughs> that not only did I love the writing that when given a chance to kind of perform, I said, I, I gotta, I gotta act this out. You gotta <laughs> see this comic book come to life. But, but after the performance ended, man, you know, you sit around with the class and the class had maybe 20, 25 people in it and everyone's commenting on each other's scenes. <clears throat> we do this and we do the animal man scene and you know, people are going, it's original, man. It's funny. I mean, the dude was wearing like a yellow, mustard yellow sweatshirt and we took electrical tape and put the big a across <laughs> it and, and, you know, and he had fucking ski goggles so he was approximating so the physical the look the visual look people are like ah it's, it's funny he's dressed and this is 1990 again so it's like comics are still underground they're not part of the mainstream pop culture like they they are today and stuff so afterwards everyone's going it's fun this is cool this exists blah 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 one dude looked like, you know, if I had to guess or stereotype or profile him, looked like a roofer. Looked like a dude who worked <laughs> with his body for a living. This is a dude who totally could have atomized my face with a swing. And I guess he too was going to the acting class to blow off some steam. I don't think he fancied himself like I'm going to be an actor or something like that. He's obviously a man who worked with his hands. A, a very manly man. And there's soft old fucking Pillsbury Doughboy <laughs> Butterball me in my suit jacket and button down shirt and fucking slacks approximating a, a, a writer from another country. And, uh, this dude, his hand goes up and the teacher goes, yes. And, you know, everyone's talking and going, I like this. I like this. Blah, blah. This guy's hand goes up. She goes, yes. He goes, the hell is this man? Like comic books, like kitty stuff. Like this is an acting class mm -hmm. and you're, you're doing, you're performing comic books. I think this is childish. Mm -hmm. And for the whole ride home, me and Jason Mewes talked about the shit we should have said, like how I could have stood up to him and stood up for comics and be like, you're out of your mind and stuff like that. But instead, just pussily sat there and fucking didn't really defend yeah. her. Anything. This guy's right. <laughs> yeah, I mean, but like, how do we say anything at that point? We're like, yeah, I guess it's comic books, I guess. Seemed like a good idea at the time. Anytime I ever see the name of Grant Morrison in print, I always go like I played him once. <laughs> Very briefly in an acting class. <laughs> to rave reviews. <laughs> yeah, to all but one. Even then I was dealing with a fucking critic who was up my ass going, you can't do it right. Um, I played Andy Warhol. No, it wasn't Andy Warhol. It was the fucking, what's his name? Uh, Roman Polanski. Where, and what? And, and Don Murphy's wife, Susan Montford, used to make short films. And I played Roman Polanski in one of her movies. <laughs> <laughs> so that's my claim to fame. And I just like get all like it was done up with Sharon Tate with she was pregnant, the whole deal. And, right, right, and right. There was all these Manson girls pursuing us through an empty warehouse. It was amazing. This sounds right up your alley as well. <laughs> so, um do you and you also you you were in music video, right? Were you in one of the Yeah, I was the bad guy in the My Chemical In Romance the MCR videos, video. Because we're really good friends with, with Gerard and he's and, a, isn't and he a beautiful Chemical human being. Well, he's those really dudes fucking those guys. they yeah. scream yeah. like about you in such a big bad way. They love you. They went to Morrison Con. How yeah, was Morrison like, Con? Oh, it was amazing. It was like Explain to cats who don't know what was what it was and is it gonna happen again? Never again. I mean the weird thing was you know, like, <laughs> never again. I get all kinds of shit. It's like, oh, Grant Morrison, he's, he's, he's 700 pounds a ticket, you know, whatever it was, a million dollars a ticket for this thing. We got nothing for it. We'd nothing to do with that aspect of it. It was right. just, uh. It was just a place to gather. No, it was, it was, the guys up in, uh, in San Francisco, you know, the, uh, the, the isotope store, and they had this idea of doing a kind of boutique convention based around this one person. So they said to me, will you, will you get involved in this? And I said, yeah, yeah, fucking use me, you know, like, ride me. <laughs> 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 so suddenly it became like my egomaniac convention. So I found out it was quite weird. So it was really with trepidation that I approached this whole fucking thing, you know. And, but it turned out amazingly. And that's why I don't think we'd ever do it again because it was so spontaneous. And all these kids came from all around the world, like Tasmania and shit, like unbelievable. They all started getting like tattoos. They were like forming bands. They were like marrying one another in Vegas. And it was just this huge creative explosion of all these like, it was like every wallflower from every school disco all in one place and all getting off with each other and all being the centre of attention <laughs> and it was really I just thought this is this is great you know and you can just stand here and say like go out and do your shit you know impress me you know, that's all I want to see your stuff and uh -huh. we just got to ha hang out with everyone and, <clears throat> and spend time and everyone was there it was a really weird concentrated thing but like I say we'd never do it again because of the I think the spontaneity is what made it. The minute you did that twice, it would 
fuse into kind of, you know, it would fossilize instantly. <laughs> um, okay. Let's go to one of my favorite and most fucked up books of all time. The Doom Patrol. Doom Patrol came about how? It was already up and running at that point? And they said, hey, yeah, do you want to take Paul it over? Yeah, it was Paul Copperberg was doing it, and he was going off it, and they just said, do you want to do this thing? So I, I was kind of, I want to try new stuff and kept comics away from realism. And so, so I was kind of... Were you, and this is all informed, this is all post Catman do as well? No, this is before it. All that Doom Patrol shit, yeah. the Scissor Man, and fucking that. Yeah, no, that was I was pre drugs or anything. That shit was like a, <laughs> oh my god, that's dude. what I was trying to escape from. You know? <laughs> so Doom Patrol is uh, pre all that. Yeah. What what is uh, where where does it all come from? You're reading a bunch of crap at that point, or is yeah, this the stuff totally you read not. in your childhood? Doom, Doom Patrol was everything I was into at the time. I was getting back into my childhood. I was basically trying to define a new type of comics by that point because we all felt a little bit revolutionary. And Watchmen had been pronounced the end of superheroes, but right. we, we didn't agree. <laughs> so you see you know, people like me and, and Peter Milligan and, and other people at the time were just saying, here's a different way to do superheroes, you know, a Jamie Hewlett with Tank Girl and that kind of stuff. Mm. And it was a bit more, again, it was the influence, I think, of dance culture and MDMA at the time in the late 80s. Right. And just a slightly different take, a more relaxed sexuality, less of that uptight, dark night watchman, you know, tight assed <laughs> Teenage thing, right? So I thought it was quite, it was quite an, an expansive time, and Doom Patrol. I was just reading surrealism, and I was reading tons of books, and going to museums, and watching all these, like you know, Jan Schwankmeyer Prague animation movies, <laughs> right. and, and totally getting into all that stuff. So suddenly they said to me, "Do you want to do the world's strangest superheroes?" And I thought, "Well, let's do it." Like they genuinely are the world's strangest superheroes. Like, it's a comic like no other. And this is the shit Superman can't deal with, or the Justice League, or Batman, or any of them. It takes lunatics. <laughs> so it just, it was like a gift at the time because I was, I was expand getting in all this stuff from, you know, movies and poetry. Everything went into it. Had you read those comics as a kid? Yeah, a little bit, but they freaked me out. I, I just didn't like them. I hated Marvel and I hated Doom Patrol because they were, people were angry. <laughs> no, I was totally, I hated any comic. That's why I loved Justice League when I was a kid. These guys, they just got together, did the shit, solved the problem and it was over. Right. I hated people having, you know, narrative obstacles. <laughs> I found it really, when I was writing stories later, it was like a real thing to get over. Like, no, you have to keep making it difficult for them. Right. I just hated that when I was a kid. I just wanted the heroes to go in and solve the problem while I applauded. <laughs> um, the Okay, so you take over that book, and anybody who's never read that book, uh, go out and, and, and pick it up. It's in a, a bunch of trades, I think, at this point, but probably about three or four yeah. minimum or something like that. Um, it's some of the most brilliant, uh, shit ever written. And again, I'm not just talking about some of the most brilliant comic book work ever written. It's brilliant. It's mind expanding. If you're, want to be a writer, it'll make you a better writer, man. It's like, uh, the, the psychological, uh, or intuitive version of, uh, picking up a 200 pound weight and, and lifting it a few times over and over repetitively. It's just, you cannot engage with Doom Patrol and not become smarter and a better writer. Um, or at least, at the very least, more clever at gatherings. <laughs> um, it's a fan. And, and it's really dumb. Yeah. Because remember, same- it's got the beard hunter. You'd be in trouble. Yes. Kevin. Yes. It's, it's basically a Punisher style character who hunts down men with beards and then shaves them and collects the beards on his belt. <laughs> <laughs> Danny the Street, dude, yeah. from, uh, I remember that whole era that was when Peter, Peter Milligan was writing, um, Shade, Shade yeah, at that yeah. point as well. Um, there was, I became a huge fan of Mark's stuff when he wrote on mm-hmm. Swamp Thing. Yeah. Um, he referenced back to Alan's, uh, Batman Swamp Thing gotham mm-hmm. issues at one point and i was like oh my god this guy is totally in my fucking wheelhouse all the this era whenever i talk about doom patrol that takes me to that whole magical era before i was like uh making clerks before i was trying to make entertainment and yeah, i was just yeah. consuming other people's entertainment and what i love about that is like right you know you're a guy who constantly feeds in order to put out um uh, a lot of artists and I'm, i've been guilty of it from time to time myself not enough living so hmm. that the art becomes repetitive. You can't say anything new if you haven't had any new experiences. And Lord knows you have no problem having new experiences. So 
for me, right before I went into Clerks, uh, and Clerks was a period where, you know, I've then move away from everything that made me who I was and who I would become at that point and start doing something completely different. So it was the, before I would later on figure out I have to go recharge and refill kind of thing. The last great meal I had were these books was like stuff like mm-hmm. Doom Patrol, stuff like Arkham Asylum. This was stuff that I took with me into my creative world and sustain me until, you know, suddenly I was just becoming repetitive as well. So I hold a great piece of, a, of affection, place in my heart for you guys. Cause it was, cre- it was like the, it was the equivalent of, uh, I guess nitrous in a racing car. Like gas will get you very, very far and you can go very fast. But <laughs> all of a sudden I was introduced to like all this hyper creative, enlightened out there, outside the box, brilliant, whilst a brilliant about stupid things. Stupid about brilliant things, vice versa. Just somebody who is looking at this material and treating it seriously. Like, I have the utmost respect for anybody. I don't care who you are. You can be a fucking lawyer. You can knit blankets, make cupcakes, be a writer, be an athlete. If whatever it is you do, you do like that. You do it in the way that you're almost saving the universe by doing it. You do it so hard out. Some ridiculous thing that other people have done and people will do long after you're gone. They've been doing it for time and memorial. But when you're at bat or on the ice, when you have your opportunity to do it, you do it with such conviction, such passion, such enthusiasm that it's just like, oh my God, this motherfucker believes. And you make everyone else believe because of that. That's what a true magician does is and not just as an artist, but like in general in life, man, you can pass on that kind of enthusiasm, interest, Interested, interested is interesting, I guess. Mm-hmm. And you've been fucking way interested. <laughs> uh, and I think that's what makes your work beyond interesting. So Doom Patrol is a fantastic book. And then uh, we'll jump over to Act New X-Men <coughs> because they're similar. Then mm-hmm. DC, their, their X-Men was Doom Patrol and Marvel's much, Doom yeah. Patrol was the X-Men. Um, how, how was that? How was it getting to go over there? Were you a big X-Men reader back in the day? I guess you mentioned Claremont before. Yeah, it was a huge. Chris Claremont fun, you know, I, I wrote him a fan letter, and thank God I never sent this thing, but it was, <laughs> it, it, it was the death of Phoenix, and I was in London, I just read this book, and I was so moved, you know, I think it was probably 20 or something, and I wrote this ridiculous letter, you know, I, I just saw Derek Jacobi appearing in the Royal Shakespeare Company as Hamlet, I have just witnessed, and then it was finally, and uh, now I have read X-Men number 137. <laughs> <laughs> and it was going, oh man, th- this it, it, it get thrown in the toilet and then thank God. But it was very heartfelt at the time. So no, I was a big fan. That was the only comic I was prepared to read when I'd become a punk. I was totally into the X Men because I just thought it was super cool. Well, they were out, they were the ultimate outsiders. So that was my thing. I was I was just kind of going back to memories of that because I hadn't read much of what happened in between and apart from you know what I'd, I'd been given to catch up. So really, I, I really wasn't into that much after John Byrne left the comic. Right. So I'd, I had no idea what happened except it become more weird and baroque and kind of it was more extreme versions of its basic few ideas that had been left by Chris. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it just felt like the longest running Mexican soap opera that ever existed. It was mm. It was kind of impenetrable if you hadn't been reading the book for a long time. But when you took the book over, you know, it was a great starting point. But it also took characters where I was never a big X-Men guy. That was the first time I was like really into the X-Men. I was like, oh, I, re- I like these characters. When handled by somebody who's writing, I dig. These characters are interesting. You put them through a different prism altogether. Um, so hats off, of course, for the Marvel work. And, and is, is there some part of the small Glaswegian boy who had sent in or worked for mm-hmm. Marvel UK that was just like, ah, I've closed my loop. There's a sense of satisfaction. I've done it. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm delirious every time one of these new things comes in. You know, a fucking Batman comic with my name on it is, is <laughs> blows me away every Still single does day. It I'm for easily you. pleased. So no, it, it was great, but yeah, you know, X Men was hard to do. I just I, I hated the tension in their lives all the time. Like you say, it was a Mexican soap opera, and these people were constantly moaning about something. <laughs> so it kind of wasn't in my nature, but it was really good because I learned to write that kind of you know emotion-driven, high-frequency 
hand wringing kind of comic. <laughs> right. But it was no, it was a lot of a lot of fun learning that. But my, I just remember feeling it really quite tense because you were having to find in your own life elements that kind of paralleled what you were writing about. So it was constantly digging in the most extreme and unpleasant, painful memories. <laughs> <laughs> So well, I love Cyclone. I just think he was great. I just the, my thing was just bringing that guy out because he was like Norman Bates. Like if he didn't kill people, right. you know? <laughs> I just thought he was so cool. Um, you you work you worked there for a little bit, mm-hmm. and then he went back to DC for uh, JLA at that point. Well, basically, or was JLA before New X Men. Dan, Dan the deal came to me, and they wanted me to come over, but I was still wrapping up the X Men contract. So he said, "Would you like to do Superman with Jim Lee?" And that sounded interesting, you know, but I had this big idea for Superman, which then became All-Star Superman with Frank Quitely. But it started there, but because I was still playing out six months of X-Men, uh-huh. it was, uh, I had to shelve that. So I just, I stayed on, played out the X-Men thing, but I was become increasingly alienated from Bill Jameis and that whole regime at the time. And right. We were just getting into fights and arguing and screaming and shouting down the phone. So... Dan, the deal, had come into DC and he came in to Scotland to speak to us. He looked through my notebooks and he just said, do, do you want to revamp a bunch of DC superheroes, do anything you want? And it just seemed like, okay, they're, they're accepting me back into the right. pen. <laughs> and uh, I just stuff with what became Seven Soldiers and All-Star Superman. And, and that was like, but yeah. that was the Morrison return. Yeah. Before you left, you did JLA, before you went to X-Men? I did jelly before it, yeah, or before yeah, yeah, right up through the nineties. Obviously, that was uh, that was right that, up until two thousand, I think. Yeah. That was um, I, again, a, 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 your enthusiasm mm-hmm. for the characters shines through, but your JLA stuff is transcendent. I loved the JLA when you were writing the JLA because um, your Batman was the the stuff of legends. Here you were writing Batman on, on the weekly basis, on the reg. Mm-hmm. Well, of course, later on you would come to do that uh, to a much larger extreme, but your, the, the, it, sometimes it was just a Susan of Batman, the, the, the Martian hanging with a little note on him that says, I know your secret mm-hmm. or shit like that, man, was just absolutely fantastic. Uh, that whole book though, Again, I, I think I said before, if you've never read Rock of Ages, pause this, go read Rock of Ages and come back. Um, it's, it, what was it, Howard Porter on the artist, yeah, the yeah. artist? And then there's a, a fill in toward the end. I guess he was toward the end of the story. I remember there's the, suddenly the artwork doesn't look like Porter's artwork. I had pages from that. I bought original mm-hmm. artwork. I love that story so much. I love the entire run that, that, that you did on, on the JLA. What was it like as a kid who, clearly dug it and like the kind of simplicity of they go in, they do their job, ta-da, and they go home. What was it like to then take them over and then not make it so fucking simple for them? <laughs> no, that was just great fun at the time because, you know, my imagination was blooming. I was, I was doing psychedelic drugs on a daily basis. <laughs> so things like the Justice League were perfect for just getting out the maddest, craziest ideas. Oh, the Martian <laughs> Manhunter, well, he could, he could, <coughs> change the shape of his brain so that he understands how the Joker feels. Oh my god, I fucking love that. And everything was about how would you play with these guys like a formula that all the powers play off one another and how the bad guys' powers play off those powers. And I was thinking again, like doing the patrol. corporate takeover of the JLA, dude. Just yeah. simple notions well, like, it's like that. Lex Luthor was a businessman, and but Bruce Wayne's a businessman, so he starts to fight <laughs> back, and they don't know that Bruce Wayne's in the JLA. Right? Right? They don't know he's Batman. <laughs> And then, and just the, and little things like, um, the Bruce Wayne taking advantage of Mirror Master, like, you know, never underestimate a, the sentimentality, the sentimentality of a, of a Scotsman. Scotsman. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God, I fucking love that. But it was, book a bit, so it was also the mythology thing, because, you know, like Doom Patrol was about, here's the world's strangest superheroes, and you've got to do weird shit. So it was Dada and surrealism mm. and weird European cinema. But then it's suddenly, here's the world's greatest superheroes, here's the Justice League. So that was all about what, what would you do with those guys? They have to. I, I had to ask them to get those seven characters back together again because before that it was just a yeah, bunch it was, of also uh, runs, right. you know. And that's mo- most people probably don't yeah. remember, but there was oh, or some a lot of people were reading at that time. Definitely remember there was Justice League International, Justice Le- mm-hmm. JLA, JLI, JLE. 
uh, the Giffen Dematis run, mm-hmm. which was fantastic. Well, that was great, Lord. but that was at its way fag end by that point. Yeah, oh when god, it was, yeah. it was over. So. Spread out, and you had so you were able to bring the originals back. Together. And I had to really fight for it because they said, oh, "We can't put these characters together. <laughs> Who would buy that?" Why, really? No, seriously, they just hadn't. I mean, it was weird. They just they they were trying so many weird experimental things in the nineties, which is to their credit. You know, there's a right. lot of cool stuff was tried, but I think they just lost focus on. Well, the Justice League is just your big seven superheroes that everybody <laughs> knows and everybody loves, and they're all fighting together, and it's simple. So it actually took a bit of fighting, but once we got into it, and obviously the the fans really responded, they loved it. Mm. But it was all about doing mythology. I just looked at the, the Gardner Fox stuff and it was all plot. So I just thought, let's just do big plot, 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 bigger and bigger stories, but give each of the characters, like you say, this little moment. And, and you guys like Kyle Rayner, the, the young Green Lantern, who could de- be developed a little bit from the rookie to the, you know, the veteran. The, uh, I'll never forget too, the Connor Hawk moment of, Firing the boxing glove arrow and just like referring to Ollie, to yeah. everything about that. <laughs> the, your run on those books were fantastic. Um, the, the character that uh, gave you a house <clears throat> with Arkham Asylum, yeah. uh, it comes to be the character that like gives you a whole lot more mm-hmm. and fucking you come to be almost uh, Defined by, well, that's tough to say. There's so many fucking things you do that I wouldn't, but you, I, most people now at this point go, Grant Mel Morrison yeah, writes yeah, Batman. Fun, yeah. Very identifiable with the character now that uh, you've become and the shit you've taken the character, uh, through and done with them is, is fantastic and fucking brilliant. And of course it makes some people, it ruffles some mm-hmm. fucking feathers and it makes other people go like, Oh my God. Um, Take us through that, man. So Dan DeDio, as we said before, was like, hey, man, come back here and work on stuff. Does it right away become Batman? Do you have to sniff around? They go, or or do they dangle it in front of you? Or they're like, look, man, like you're, you're a no-brainer. You wrote Arkham Asylum. You wrote Gothic for us years ago in the Legends of the Dark Knight book. You've written Batman in JLA. Just fucking go for it. Take Batman. What would Grant Morrison do if he had Batman? Was it like that? That was the Hollywood version. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I think it was basically, I'd come in to do All-Star Superman and Seven Soldiers, and, and, and it was the editor on Batman, Peter Tomasi, who's a uh, really light, great writer, writer as well. But Pete called me up and just said, do you want to do this book? But he was really disappointed because I came in with this Son of Batman story, and I remember Pete admitting to me in a restaurant, he just said, I thought you were going to do some weird, crazy, surrealist stuff, and then you give me this... Denny O'Neill style son of Batman he was super disappointed <laughs> I felt terrible but yeah I, I just come in and I, I kind of uh, I thought I'd do like a year on it and I had it all planned out and I had all that Zur and R stuff and I had the first thing I thought of was Batman R.I.P. was this title because I thought it sounded really cool you know right. the grave thing and I thought really the, the basis of Batman for me is Batman always fights death Superman always fights the impossible you know and that's how I, I kind of that's the brute concept for right. me so batman fights death and i always put him through situations where he's up against death or manifestations of death mm-hmm. so this that came first and i thought i'd do 12 issues and then it ended up just six years on it and i had no idea that would happen but it just kept going i got i got so caught up in that character was it did it ever feel like work or every time you sat down you were like oh i'm, I'm playing with batman and more so than I'm playing with Batman, I get to do the impossible and unimaginable with Batman. And I get to go back into his universe and legitimize shit that, like, dude, like, you <clears throat> you changed my mind about not just Batman, but fucking the multicolored Batman. I don't even oh, know the yeah. name of Zora, Zora and Rover. I just remember <laughs> seeing the cover of that book on the shelves at comic book conventions and being like, ugh, <laughs> it's fucking old Batman. <laughs> But you found a way to make old Batman magical again and fucking scary. For those of you who've never read the story, the concept behind the Batman of, uh, of uh, again, help me, Zora R. Zora and R. Is Batman uh, trained himself just in case he was ever mind wiped or just in case he was ever compromised psychologically as Bruce Wayne or whatever to have a backup system as if he could reboot into just pure Batman so that Batman could always continue the fight. 
even if physically Bruce Wayne was fucking God. A brilliant fucking notion. And then married to this dopey old fucking story of Batman went to another planet and there was two Batman and blah, blah, blah. And they dressed like this. You take all the weird stuff and turn it into the virtues. Even something as simple as like this costume is confidence. <laughs> and then saying something as simple as like for years, Robin dressed in bright colors. And then suddenly you sit there going, yeah, you would have to be more so than wearing the, the old dark costume that buns in the shadows. If you're wearing the Batman, uh, Zoran Ur, our, uh, costume, you're fucking begging to be shot <laughs> a, a bazillion different ways. So you have to be the best at it. Um, notions like that, suddenly you're, you're bringing, you're legitimizing crap that like uh, for years, like you said, other people have kind of swept under the rug. Yeah. Um, at a time like that, when you're writing it, are you just like, Oh man, I'm going to take shit or, Oh man, I'm doing, I'm doing the Lord's work here or, Oh man, I'm just being Grant Morrison. A little bit of both, you know, or a little bit of all three, but, but what I, I honestly thought, and, it, and to me, I just figured every reader of Batman will buy into this, but they actually don't because they've all got their own favorite little, you know, it's like Doctor Who, they've all got their own favorite era, their own favorite guy. Dude, I'm guilty of that myself. Yeah. But. It's so funny. What I thought is, and I thought everybody will buy into this, and it's the best way to do Batman that's never been done, is to accept every single era as one guy's biography. So I thought, you know, the, the feral young Batman from 1938 who's out there with guns in his hand and is fighting vampires and, and crooks. <laughs> I thought, well, imagine that's Batman at 20, you know. And then he meets this kid when he's late 21, and the kid's this super, you know, this little working class circus kid who's totally cocky. And this introverted young Norman Bates Batman is suddenly, wait a minute, this, this is the kid that died in me. You know, and it's suddenly, this is everything I wanted to be. And the two become friends and it's no creepy, it's no way, it's just like, it's, it's like my best friend, he's my brother, he's, and he's everything I wish I could be. And the kid's looking at him going, he's everything I wish I could be. You're going to make and, me cry. And that, and suddenly, you know, I'm looking at, imagine that's his history. And then he's 23 and the kid's like 13 and they're up again, they're in the dense thick of it now. And it's the best era of Batman. They're solving the crimes and even the Joker stopped murdering people. He's just having fun. There's that beautiful part yeah. of that one issue where he's just like <laughs> the Joker and Robin had a laughing contest. Yeah, and, and, I the just Joker... and Robin out laughs him. <laughs> <laughs> And you can just see that drawn by Dick Sprang, but it never was. <coughs> right. And then, you know, he's 24 and you're getting into the 60s now and it's starting to get a bit synthetic because Batman's feeling the kid's a little bit older. Batman's getting a bit sick of this and he's remembering when he was a young urban commando and that's what it was all about. And now it's all these quiz master bullshit TV. Costumed villains. Pop, and, pop yeah, villains. And then, he's, then it's suddenly Adam West and Burt Ward for a few months where it's just really synthetic and fucked up and they've been on so many mind-altering chemicals from the Scarecrow and the Joker. They, <laughs> they don't know what the fuck's happened when they punch people the seen <laughs> graphics in the air <laughs> and i thought imagine it's just all real then he's 25 and robin's grown up and he's going to college and suddenly batman's a bachelor and that ties into the denny o'neill neil adams stuff in the 70s where they moved to the penthouse, the penthouse. and suddenly he's fucking talia and he's got hairs in his chest <laughs> and i'm thinking this is yeah and batman's grown up we get rid of the kid now i'm doing it you know and I just saw every, and it fitted beautifully into the personality of this insane billionaire, unique human. And that's what I mean. I got so into him as a man. Imagine you'd gone through this. You fucked the devil's daughter. And then suddenly you get a new Robin because you're thinking, I'm getting a bit weird, you know, and let's get a boy in and let's try and, and you get Jason Todd and it all goes wrong and your heart's broken and then everything goes wrong. And then it's no man's land and the earthquake and everybody's dying. And, and I took it to that. And I thought, I want to start with that guy, and it's how he comes out of it. He does the Thogal Buddhist ritual, and he comes out of it the pure Batman. That's where I started, is Batman at the peak, the optimum Batman, who just, all of this is me, you know, the camp, everything. I, once I was funny, once I was sexy, once I was weird, now I'm this, I'm all of them. And that was what we started with. And I think it was just, that was my new take on it that I wanted to, that no one I thought had done. You know? Bring it all in. And um, so that meant recuperating some of the weirdest shit, the alien stuff in the 50s stuff, which was all kind of psychedelic, fractured alien landscapes and science fiction stories. So we had to bring that back in, but fit it into a world that could conceivably include year one, Frank Miller. Right. 
you did it poetically. It's, well, it's, hopefully, yeah, I'm glad. That, I mean, a lot of people, I'm glad it seemed to work for a lot of people. It's, the- it's beautiful. That By the time you get to that one, the Alfred issues about like – was this a story that you all that you wrote at one point about what and you know many pe- times in comics people do the imagine if he wasn't mm. this cat story but it's so well done and and you're traveling simultaneously through those eras like seeing these wonderful snapshots I, I swear to you when I was reading that issue I was crying because you just have wonderful moments throughout the entire time span of Batman's history mm. everything he just explained right now with the the you know the Batman alone, Batman meeting Robin, Batman lighting up, Batman being like, fuck all this noise. I'm going to punch fucking killers in the face again and stuff like that. It's laid out so beautifully, graphically and, and, uh, with words, textually, uh, if you will. Uh, in, in this issue, in, in those issues, it, it's such a good fucking read, but I will never forget. I mean, I said it before, I'll say it again, I'll, I'll never forget that the fifth dimension is imagination mm. don't you and you know are, and you think you're the and they say you're the world's greatest detective yeah. <laughs> moments like that just make your heart fucking sore um and to me things like the bell you know which are I, and frank miller's story rings a bell to call alfred as he's dying yes and that suddenly became for me the pivotal moment because that's the moment batman asks for help but it's also the moment batman's created so it kind of made sense of robin and alfred and all that the add-ons but it seemed like that's what he did. First thing he did, the moment he became Batman, was ask for help. That's fucking <laughs> beautiful. Only only Grant Morrison sees that angle. I mean, we've known that the bell thing forever. Yes, Father, I shall become mm-hmm. a bat. And, if, but I, you, if I ring this, Alfred will come and he'll heal the wounds because he's lying there bleeding out in a chair and the bat's sitting there on the bust <laughs> and he's kind of, okay, I'll become a bat. And then the first thing he does is ask someone to help him on this crusade. And I thought that was the pivotal moment. That was the real truth, that he wasn't a loner at all. What was your favorite story, Batman story, that you've ever written at this point? The one where you're like, uh, oh, man, that's that's it. That's what represents me. I don't know. This this whole run, I think, ultimately, because the only way to catch all the dimensions of Batman is to do a massive multi-prism take on it. But there's there's a couple of them like the the one you mentioned where I do the whole history in two books I really like I like the prose issue with the Joker the high pitched yes. psych, you know the schizophrenic writing and uh, some of those and some of the the Batman and Robin stuff because actually my favourite part of it is when Dick Grayson took over I would have written that for ten years and I think they so when you did uh, yeah. Dick Grayson and and uh, Damian Robin yeah that was that was the twenty first century Batman and Robin they blown it. You know? <laughs> <laughs> no, those guys were it. I think they were. They should have just kept that running for years. Why did you enjoy that? Because why it, more than why? Do you feel? Did, did you feel like ah, Bruce has just played out at this point? No, or? I felt Bruce is fantastic. He's brilliant, but he'd become mythical at that point. And suddenly you had. I loved the idea of Batman being laid back and sorted, and this young man and the little kid punching his fist and being constantly angry and trying to work things out. So you re- reverse the dynamic of grim Batman and light-hearted Robin. Suddenly light-hearted Batman, grim Robin. It really played, you know. I just the, the, the dynamic between those two characters was just so real. Creating Damien takes you right back to Son of the Demon mm-hmm. and, you know, the very last panel or page of Batman's son, the demon, after Batman has sex with Talia and fucking in the desert and bare-chested while still wearing a cowl yeah. sometimes. Oh, I don't man. think during sex. <laughs> um, she, you know, there's this bittersweet panel of her giving up mm-hmm. this baby that I guess they produced that he would never know about. Yeah. Um, so it's, 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 it's one part of the mythology that no one's ever touched before. And you were like, fuck it, I'll touch it. Not only will I touch it, but I'll bring him in. Yeah. And it won't be part of the a mythical. It'll be part of continuity. Mm-hmm. Were you scared? I, it was. I still. I admit, I had problems in the beginning where I was like, "Oh my god, Batman can't have a kid." I know because it'll fuck him up. <laughs> 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 and I wanted to see what happened. <laughs> right? <laughs> no, I, it was. Uh, I thought. Well, that story was like it's non-canonical. They say it didn't actually happen. Danny, what do you mean? Yeah, Danny O'Neill wrote it out of the 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 Batman continuity. So he said that, that didn't. Have that no, son of the demon never happened. Yeah. So for me, again, it was that repressed thing. You know, I was looking at the fifties stuff. I was looking at like what else is Batman man erased from his history and there's this book here that says he had a kid well what what would 
that be? You know, I couldn't resist it. Right. So I just thought, and I'd, I'd forgotten the book. I couldn't even remember it. <coughs> I, I eventually found it and read it and realised I totally got the story wrong. But it didn't matter because it wasn't supposed to be real anyway. It was an Elseworlds. So I just thought, let's do this actually happened. And Talia put this like super Viagra in Batman's drink. And they had the most amazing sex this night. And they have this kid, but she doesn't want to ruin her figure. She she grows the kid in an artificial womb. And then she the kid's trained to be an assassin. Because basically Talia thinks, I'm going to get together with Batman. Our child is going to be the new Alexander. He will rule the world. We'll take over everything. And this is the way it's going to be. <laughs> <laughs> so... She's got this kid and then suddenly she's just thinks, I'm going to use this to fuck up Batman because he's never realised that, that night of passion all those years ago that he'd forgotten all about. It's coming back to kick his ass. <laughs> and that was Damien. And it, originally it was going to be a four issue story. And I was going to kill the kid at the end and Batman just kind of lamenting over well, the boy that could have been. Right. And In a very suddenly, Captain Kirk at the end of yeah, uh, the whole Star Trek way, 3 one, kind of way. That's it, one story. And then suddenly this character came to life and we just kept him on and and once he hit the batman and robin thing he just he became really popular and and people got into it i talked about on one of the podcasts at one point like i don't know damien i don't know about damien there's so many people on twitter blew me up they're like you're not giving him a fucking chance he's amazing (laughs) people fucking love him now in the history of, of the bat books something about to happen with robin yeah it's the end because you didn't think I was going to do the ultimate Batman story without the death of Robin. <laughs> so when is that? When is this? Next issue, issue eight of Batman Incorporated. Everyone's been looking in the wrong place for the day. Where are they looking? They're looking over there where the Joker is. Ah, <laughs> right, 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 right. That's true, man. And the Joker's playing a joke on everyone. So <laughs> what? What is? Where did this come from? It's been there since the beginning because I thought the character was created to. to to die Batman for issues. Lesson. But then he became real and he's gone and now it's now it's the stakes are massive. Now it's for real. Now you feel He's part it. of continuity. Yeah. So that's what I want to do. And uh, But wait, does that mean in New Fifty Two as well that he goes? Yeah, away? no, it's all we, we, everything ties in. This everything ties yeah, in. Yeah, yeah. There's there, they will be mourning across the line in, in May. Or whenever it's <laughs> So you're gonna March, do the twenty first century death of Robin. Mm-hmm. With no phone calls or anything like that. No phone calls. It's just too late. <laughs> You're too late. <laughs> Pick up the phone. You can't save him. What now? Does it tie into what you were originally going to do, or is it completely different? No, because it? it's now tied into the story we're telling, which has become. I mean, it's become quite interesting for me. And I always knew I was going to do this last twelve issue. Spread it out. Fuck all of you. You know, I'm not doing one issue. One issue. One. I'm, I'm doing this twelve issues of comics. I want to do something big and. Uh, it revolves around, it's, it's the end of the story, it's the snake eating its tail, this Robo thing, and it's basically Talia up against Batman, I thought, let's think about Talia for real, and everyone, a lot of people online have, have been mad at me because they say, oh, Talia loved Batman, and she, she broke the rules, and she defied her father because she loves him so much, and I thought, look guys, live a little more, and watch how love can turn to hate in certain circumstances, and the horror of that. Right. You know, so I wanted to play this, and then I thought, and Talia's like, Batman's out of his league. This woman runs a global criminal empire. What does that mean? That means like human trafficking. That means drugs. That's serious shit. This isn't a joke. <laughs> <laughs> so I suddenly thought about you, Batman. You protect Gotham City. You wear a bat suit, and you're up against this woman who basically is Fu Manchu's daughter. Right. And so that's what it becomes. It's actually the most terrifying confrontation Batman's ever had with female power. (laughs) (laughs) This isn't a lady in a cat suit with a cat of nine tails. No, this is none of your bullshit. This is like, you've come into my world, I will smear you. Because basically she had his kids. She wanted to be with him. He's the optimum human. He's the man who's good enough to join the Justice League among superheroes. And Talia, oh God, Talia wants to fuck him. Point. And Talia wants him to be, I've got a plan. We're going to take over the world. You're the man. I'm the woman. This is the child. And he says, no. <laughs> because he won't. He says, I'm not buying into your empire of crime. I'm not like, and she says, no, but I'll fight crime with you. And he's, no, 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 I'm not doing it. You, I don't trust you. And she just says, okay, you're fucked then. You, you've asked for a war. 
<laughs> and that's what isn't it? it's the sudden horror okay you've asked for war and he's no I didn't I didn't honestly I didn't and yeah he's all, like I just don't want the other thing no you're up against this now global cr- criminal empire versus you in a bat cave <laughs> <laughs> and so the story's quite apocalyptic I want to do the godfather 3 for Batman <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> this is the final act yeah yeah Wow, and man. it's the destruction of everything Batman means and stands for. And it's, then it's how does he get back? You know, what's the last issue going to be? <laughs> now, so that's happening right now, Robin. By the time people hear this, Robin has just died like a week ago or this week or something. Is In it, issue eight, which is two weeks time. Um, did you get any pushback, or they're like, "Well, you made him." No, they, they were up. They were way up for it. I mean, and Dan wanted to do it. He, he thought it was uh, and, and a good idea, <laughs> right? It's spellbinding, man. It's, it's, you go out, you've been going through Batman's history. And that is even, even the death of Robin is kind of a part of Batman's history that is also a little bit at this point swept under the rug because yeah. Jason came back mm-hmm. at a certain point. So you're like, did Robin die or dot, dot, dot? Um, and also to be aware of all that and you're going into it, you know, I mean, the, the, the story when you see it is called The Boy Wonder Returns. And he dies at the end. But, you know. <laughs> <laughs> You're a cruel son of a bitch. <laughs> at, when that's done, are you done with Batman? Yeah, I mean, that's me. I mean, I, I, you can never say no because I thought I was done with Arkham Asylum. And then, you know, Pete calls me and suddenly I've got some ideas. And those ideas turn into six years. <laughs> yeah, so, no, I mean, I, 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 I would than that. never say there's no more Batman. But certainly this is the end of this take. This is my big fucking lifelong statement on Batman. Anything else will be a, a one-off or... It's it's good to hear because when an artist is like, ladies and gentlemen, I'm, when the show's over, the show is over and every show comes to an end. But at the same time, it's just like, oh, my God, I can't conceive of a world where you're not fucking writing Bruce Wayne, writing Batman, writing Alfred, writing those characters. But, you know, there's always opportunity to come back. Yeah, and it's weird not to hear them. That's the freakiest thing. What do you mean, explain? I'm so used to hearing Bruce Wayne, and he's so rational and so Protestant and so together. (laughs) That's the, again, when I write Batman and Bruce Wayne, I'm writing yours. The guy who is prepared for Mm -hmm. every eventuality, like the guy who winds up underground and there's a moment that he's trained for for this Mm -hmm. exact fucking thing. He just goes into it, you know, it's the right stuff. It's like they're not like us, and that's what I love about superheroes. It's like putting yourself in that guy's shoes rather than dragging him into my shoes where I would scream and pound. (laughs) Right, right. (laughs) They're calm, rational, just like there's there's always a way out. Like in that, when he's coming up out of the ground in the one sequence, he's talking about like, Pushing mm-hmm. three, 600 pounds of loose dirt and 100, 300 pounds yeah. of coffin lid <laughs> up through the earth, you know, is, is hard work. And then the very next page is Batman risen from the grave and but not says, impossible. but not impossible. <laughs> Stuff like that. You just go, fuck yeah, he's back. I mean, it makes your heart sore. Um, so yeah, but I mean, and the thing about Batman is it always goes on. And that's, that's what I love about these characters as well. You get to ride along for a little bit, but Batman, was it 1938? You know, I was born in 1960. This fucker was alive and young and running and doing his shit long before I was born. When I'm dead and mouldering, there will still be Batman. And the idea of just being allowed to, you know, chip in on that, Play in the hang around there bit. and and spend time with that is amazing. Uh, what what is the multiverse book that you're working on? It's. Uh, Have you talked about the idea or no? I don't know. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's nine books. Eight of them are, are comics. Each one's set in a different parallel universe, and one of them's a guidebook to all fifty-two parallel universes. <laughs> so there's kind of we've got the, the the Nazi Superman, you know, that's Earth Ten, and he's up against Uncle Sam and the Freedom Fighters. We've got a really good take on that. We've got a kind of uh, a version of the Charlton comics characters done in the style of Watchmen. In the way that the Ruttles did the Beatles. <laughs> oh my God. We've got a, you know, a Captain Marvel comic. There's a, so there's a whole bunch of stuff in, in each of these, uh, each of these worlds publishes comic books. So they all read the, the adventures of the previous comic and that's how they learn to fight the bad guy because they're passing on information across parallel universes in the form <laughs> of comic books. <laughs> And it's, it's all based on music, so it's based on eights and octaves and this. So it's a real big, mad project with a bunch of artists. 
Um, the, uh, as you look back now and, you know, as you're wrapping up your tenure, as I look back, yeah, as an old, as an <laughs> back old, in the civil war, when as, I, was, I, I was, as an old man <laughs> and I was going to say like, fuck, you look younger than me, dude. Like that. No, sure. There's you something. Actually, no, you genuinely look younger than me. You can't get away with that one, but it's, it's very bullshit. nice of you to say. You do. You actually, <laughs> you look more, let's put it this way. You look far more vital than I do. You look, uh, you got that kind of eternal youth mm-hmm. thing going about you. Do you think that comes from, from the magic? No, I think it's just I've always felt fucking like, you know, I'm a kid, you know. I, I don't think we live long enough to get smart. And we're always Explain living, that, explain in that. In the sense that people only live to say, you know, eight, nine decades, pushing it towards a century. Maybe kids now will live a, a little bit longer. But people don't live long enough to get smart. It's why I don't believe in conspiracy theories, because there's nobody smart enough to run the planet. <laughs> <laughs> there's a bunch of just... You know, moving towards geriatric kind of leaders who try their best to organize things, but they don't know any better than we do. So I, I don't buy into all that. I just think we're quite fragile as people, and that's what I like to connect with, with everyone else. You know, it's just this weird, fuck, we're all here together. We live at the same time as Madonna and George <laughs> Clooney. You know, other people lived at the same time as Shakespeare. Right. You know what I mean? It's really weird to be here now with all these people uh, yeah so that's kind of my my thing it was always about i just i just felt fragile just felt young i don't think i'll ever learn enough and i don't think any of us ever do so maybe that helps and doing comics you know you're playing with toys all your life it really is it's, a, to it's a, a pretty luxury way to live your life you know um the uh when you look back uh at this point as, as i was saying before at, at batman at the character you spent so much time with um Give me your take on Batman, what it is about Batman that makes all of us um, fall in love so hard. You know what I'm saying? Like there are people – I've seen people as I talk about Dark Knight Returns, the animated feature, on Twitter it, it, and, and how well it, it, it's it's done and like how, how it's like the greatest Batman movie ever made. Um, you know, there's some cats that are like, come on, man. Dude's standing three feet away from people with machine guns, doesn't get shot. Mm-hmm. And you're just like – it is almost like religion where you're like, you know, and people go, come on, man, this dude who's nailed to a cross is the fucking son yeah. of God. And you're like, I, look, I, yes, number one, it's a fictional fucking story, but like, I don't know how else to explain it to you, but the fact that that man isn't there when that mm-hmm. bullet hits gives me hope in some weird, stupid fucking <laughs> way. It makes me happy. The fact that he can fucking dodge machine gun bullets. He, every, everything about him is non-lethal. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it's dopey, yes, but at the same time, that's who he needs to be. Like when you talk about the characters before, talk about these heroes that, you know, like could you imagine being the, these people, like these idealized, like the, the they're different than us. Yeah. Um, you can, if you're gonna write these characters, you have to write a Batman that can dodge fucking mm-hmm. ninety six bullets, but take one in a place that you know it's gonna hurt, but he's gonna keep fucking going on. Um, what is, what is it about Batman that draws in not just the fucking, the geek and all of us, but all people, you know, people who are like fucking buff fucking power dudes. Everyone loves Batman, yeah, but the, a- what is it about it? The character. It's because of that. You know, he, there's always a part of us that just thinks you can dodge the bullet and it's a brilliant part. Even if we're wrong, you need it because you can't survive without it. And Batman personifies that. But you take it even deeper, you know, and I think what you're saying about, like, Christ, right, you you got, basically the the thing that Christ is, Christ is God made flesh, and you think about that seriously, right, the idea of Christ, whether he's historical or that, it doesn't matter, it's the same as Batman, it's not historical, it's a story, it makes us feel something, it presses a fucking human button that's really important, and the, the button Christ presses is basically this, they took God and they nailed him to wood, you know, so basically what they did, took the most spiritual thing you can imagine, the highest, most abstract, most beautiful, light-filled conception beyond, and they nailed it to wood. Boom, boom, boom. The savagery of man. Because it felt it. Because, like I said earlier, you can't be God without knowing what it feels like to be nailed to wood. <laughs> Spartacus was nailed to wood. So you're not God until you know what Spartacus felt. So, you know, that's what I mean. It's like you're not God until you know what it feels like to be a mouse caught in a trap and have your neck broken. You're not God until you know what it feels like to die in a concentration camp because until then your knowledge isn't complete. Right. right. 
But Christ, the great symbol that Christ is, Christ says that no matter how much you're hurting, no matter how bad the flesh is crushing you and destroying you, no matter what the disease is, no matter how old you are, no matter how much you're losing it, I am here with you suffering. And that's the beauty of Christ. Right? That's what Christ is. I'm here with you. No matter how dark it gets, I'm at the darkest. I'm hung here, coughing my fucking lungs up with you. Right? And that's what it means for flesh. That's what spirit is crucified to matter and it has to suffer like we do and that's how it understands how we feel. Batman is another thing like that. It's a human conception. It's the idea of like, I can watch my parents shot dead in the street and everything to go to chaos and I will make meaning of it and I will use all my resources to make meaning and to change that and to make it into something positive and good. And that's always going to buzz us, you know? Right. <laughs> because <laughs> like no matter, my eyes are welling up yeah, right now. I'm like, know, yes, yes. And no matter how cynical we get, no matter how shitty it gets, there's some part of us that says, well, I want to make meaning out of this. And I'm going to be a hero in this and I'm going to be... And Batman will always speak to that. And because I think it, and it's, Superman's different because he's of the light, but Batman's in the dark. And that's what I mean. It's like, like Christ in the sense he's down in the dark with us, he's in the gutters. But he's kind of, he's making sense of it all and he's forming his symbols and its meaning and its significance, you know. And that's why I think that really appeals to us. And because he has the resources, you know, fiction gives him the resources of a billionaire, but he's not a bad billionaire. He's not the evil 1%. He's on our side and he's using resources to save everyone, you know. Like the way you talk about him, that's that's as real as Jesus to some people. And, you know, some people get mad if you say that because, like, Jesus was real and Batman's not. But then you talk to another person who's like, Jesus wasn't real. Jesus is real as Batman. Yeah, I mean, it's the, if it's the, pushing the human they're button. They're just and, ideas and they make us feel a certain way. So if it makes us feel a good way, then cool. You know, if it makes us feel bad and we want to hurt people, then not cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, Grant Morrison, you, you improved my life. Uh, without even meeting you i mean if your art affected me that way it's affected countless other people who knows how many ships that you launched uh if you if you've read any of my comic books um i write them because i read grant morrison so if you don't like my books you fucking blame grant morrison yeah, as well fault. <laughs> <laughs> go fucking look them up i'm on the astral plane man give him some shit um the, we don't care what you think <laughs> <laughs> um it, it it's so again i said it before it's rare to sit down with a, a legend it's rare to sit down with somebody whose art personally informed and shaped who you are things you write about for a dopey fictional character are things that i've processed and and have become part of my moral barometer and or backbone or it's dopey lines that most people forget written in, in, uh, you know, a disposable fucking $2 comic book become my scripture passages and stuff like that. This is so to sit down with you is like sitting down with Matthew, Mark, Luke, or fucking John. Like you're the closest to the fucking hem of the cape that I've ever fucking gotten because I'm Judas. I'm not okay. <laughs> You ain't fucking Judas at all, man. If anything, I would say the band gospel. You no, you're. Uh, I mean, maybe there's maybe. I, I don't even know if we can force an apostle mm -hmm. on you. I would definitely say fucking Peter. But at the same time, you're as inquisitive as Thomas. Like you know, because most people would be like, "Leave Batmite alone," but you're like, "I want to stick my hand, my fingers into the wounds of Batmite." Something, something good about this. <laughs> dig a dig around. <laughs> Um, I'll always read fucking anything uh, that you write. I'm so glad you're in this world. I'm so glad you keep creating. I'm so glad you keep investigating. I was I'm elated to sit down with you and discover, uh, that you're a sweet, sweet fucking dude as well. Uh, it, it's, it's humbling to be in the presence of an intellect as massive as yours. Makes me feel fucking dumb by comparison. Um, or it rather makes me realize I'm done by comparison. I got so much more growing to do. <laughs> you being here has been fantastic, man. I can't thank you enough for, for coming over and, and talking Batman, not, and not just talking Batman, but saying some of the most beautiful things that anyone's ever said about anything. And it happens to be fucking <laughs> Batman. <laughs> Good old Batman. <laughs> um, you're a legend, sir. Thank you so much for everything you've done. Oh, come on, Kevin. It was great talking to you. And you know, it was really weird the whole time. I was always going to be scared going into this. I was just like, I'm going to have to stare at his mouth the whole time because mm -hmm. his accent's thick. 
But after like 30 seconds to 45 seconds, you, it, you're speaking Klingon. Yeah, it really. And, and what you then do, or at least me, I wonder if this is the same for other people is you become conscious of not wanting to fall into it yourself. Like everything I say afterwards, I want to end as kind of a question. And so you have to dial it back because you're like, you don't talk like that. But it's so poetic and it's so lyrical and it comes into the ear on such a, it's like lapping waves, man. That Scottish accent is like lapping waves. And once you adjust yourself to the waves, it's so pretty to listen to. So I, I was worried that I was like, fuck, I'm not going to understand half a fucking thing he says. Cause I was always thinking like, you know, the, the, the train spot and like fucking my pleasure and other people's I pleasure. Never, what you talking about? That's, that's, that's the East Coast though. We're slightly different. Can you go deeper? Do you have, have you dialed oh, it back? Say, people, if you are talking to you in Glasgow, I'd be talking like, you wouldn't know what I'm saying. You wouldn't need fucking idea, man. <laughs> the fuck is that your real voice <laughs> that's that's how people talk that's not my real voice but if I, oh, I am, and usually it's really high pitched in Glasgow like the little hard kids you know what are you doing what are you fucking looking at you why are you fucking you chubby up you know what you fucking throat man you fucking hang on I'm a fucking ninja man you know, that's what it would be like <laughs> Thank God you didn't use that accent. I, I wouldn't have gotten through the interview. I would have been like, that's amazing. That's adorable. The that's the hardcore killer Glasgow accent. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for dumbing it down for me, man. I appreciate it. Uh, it, it's an honor to sit here and talk to you. Thank you so much, man, uh, for hanging out with, uh, with us in the fat cave, if you will. And that's going to do it. Uh, for Fat Man on Batman, uh, hopefully we'll get you back and we'll come. No, it'd be great. I'll, I'll talk to you on eight. Totally, we'll just sit down and do. You know, it'd be awesome. Next time we come back, we'll just do. We'll pick like your fucking five favorite issues yeah. of of not of stuff you didn't do, mm-hmm. um, and oh, just wow, yeah. and go into them and stuff. Because well, God, when you were describing fucking Dark Knight Returns, dude, I think I'm in love with the material and poetic about the material. But Jesus Christ, you. You you put it in such a way where I I I I, w- I couldn't speak. I was fucking dumbfounded. I'm gonna go back and listen to just that part of the podcast over and over again. So I would love to fucking sit down with you and be like, all right, man, fucking uh, Watchmen. Yeah. All right, yeah, man, well, fucking I just and check out Dark Knight again, and you know, and you'll see it. <laughs> <laughs> um, excellent. Next and hopefully next time we'll do this and where you live. Definitely, yeah. Because I, I know we're going to go out well, Make sure you do it in the summer, though. That's your only chance That's of survival. That's the time. I've been, yeah, yeah, I was, believe me, I was there in, uh, when were we in, in Glasgow? Um, I want to say, let me see, January. Oh, that's yeah, okay. it was, it's not too bad. It was, but it was a little moist. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it was cool, man. And boy, they're proud of that fried Mars bar. That's right oh, on my yeah. alley, too, man. I'm like. They're proud of the deaths that it's caused. <laughs> <laughs> the generations have fallen beneath that side. But I love it. It's like, <laughs> under that side. <laughs> it's a nation that's just like, we're dedicated to carnival food. That's like right up my alley, no, man. Normally you gotta go to the actually, fucking fair. They're dedicated to, get that. to their own destruction. <laughs> <laughs> if they could find food that would spring load and explode and blow your head off, they would create that, honestly, because they're just, they want to find a new way to kill themselves young. It's <laughs> Grant Morrison, Scotland. <laughs> God bless us all. <laughs> um, welcome to Fat Man on Batman. I'm Kevin Smith. Okay, kids, yesterday I turned 43. It was my 43rd birthday, man. So I start the journey to 44 today. That's how I depressingly think of it. But I could think of no better way to head into 43 than by sitting down and having a conversation with with this man I'm about to speak with. I have uh, done so much podcasting over the last uh, six, seven years at this point. Talked to a lot of wonderful, interesting people. Put a highlight, uh, spotlight, if you will, on some friends of mine that I thought uh, were really interesting, very cool. Um, and got to meet and sit down with people who inspired me, captured my imagination as a child. And then delightfully, I found out even as an adult, they could still do it. And even more so, you know, they say, don't meet your heroes, man. Well, they never met fucking Grant Morrison. One of the most popular episodes of Fat Man on Batman we ever did, the two-parter, Fat Man on Batman 26 to 27, uh, was B- uh, Grant Morrison, Bat Bard and Bat Christ. There were people that listened to those episodes don't even like Batman who were converted. Uh, there were people that listened to those episodes who don't like Batman, still don't like Batman, but came away with an appreciation for the passion for the subject matter, for the intelligence of the guy who was writing these adventures of the dude in the spandex. Uh, Grant Morrison will make you love ever, and he has made us love every era of Batman, even the stupid stuff where you want to dismiss it. Uh, he told a very eloquent uh, tale to us last time on the show about including all of that, making an inclusive Batman that paid homage uh, to all those errors, but made them all part of who Batman was. Fascinating bat chat we had. Uh, he, he talked about the Batman-Robin relationship. Most people go for the easy joke of just like, they're probably fucking... 
Grant went for the amazing heartfelt analysis of two broken individuals who just need the fuck out of each other. The boy who looks up to the man, the man who looks up to the boy. Beautiful stuff. He's a poet. He's one of the greatest writer who's ever, writers who's ever lived. And he's back here in the fat cave, man. And we're going to chit chat about the end of his, uh, bat era, the future of his, uh, DC work, including the stuff he's doing with Wonder Woman. And then some of his favorite Batman stories. Welcome back to the fat cave. Grant Morrison. How are you, sir? Hey, Kevin. Good. <coughs> you take over. I'm Hello. out of breath. <laughs> <laughs> 43 man that's nothing honestly that's cool I believe you've got good skin you're doing fine you're so far it's all the Twinkies dude it's yeah, all the, the high fat diet that I got 43 I'm, I'm looking back on that stuff you know I'm I'm, I'm 50 how far are you away I'm from 43 I'm 53 so you got 10 years yeah, on me i got 10 years on what's it like in the future it's terrifying it's, <laughs> it's, 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 it's unusual it's unknown territory you've never been here before, <laughs> I know so I can say it send back a message yeah, are, do the no, bugs win yeah, are they no, sentient no, no, no 43 is good you can handle anything so that's all I'm saying <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, no lie man and you know this too you saw the reaction on Twitter and probably maybe even in the real world mm -hmm. that's how you know a podcast really penetrates is motherfuckers come up to you in the real world and be like that Grant Morrison podcast you did was amazing um, people loved those episodes, loved, uh, the eloquence, the passion with which you talked about Batman. Uh, you're a man who's been writing about Batman, dreaming about Batman longer than you've been writing about Batman, as you told us in the last episodes. Then for the last seven years, Batman's been your preoccupation, man. It's, it's been a Batman world. Now we've come to the end of it. This last week that just passed or two weeks ago, by the time people hear this, uh, the last issue of Batman Incorporated came yeah, out. Was that it? That's it. And so now was that, and we talked about it a little bit last time. That was part of that one of the books that survived uh, the old DC universe and the new 52 as well. Did you just get to a point where you're like, okay, I'm done. I've said everything I want to say. Well, I, I always knew that point was coming. You know, I had this whole Batman incorporated thing worked out and it was always going to be like two years, kind of, you mm -hmm. know, which it was. So no, nothing that came in made a difference to me. Because to me, the whole history of Batman still exists. You know, as I said, I, I'm taking it all from the 1930s Batman to, to now. And to me, 1930s Batman was that kid when he was 19, starting out on his mission. So it's the same guy in year one. It's, it's, you know, he always repeats. He always comes back. So I just, I, I took it more like, uh, having absorbed that whole history, I could st I absorb the new stuff as well. So the very last episode... You know, it references Scott Snyder's zero year. Does it really? Yeah, so so you went in touch. So you went as far back as fucking Batman with guns fighting vampires yep. in terms of dealing with all the Batman incarnations. And then even gave a tip, a nod of the hat or a tip of the hat, if you will. Nod of the hat. Tip of the hat. A, a nod, nod of the hug. A nod yeah. of the hat. A nod and a hug. A tip sounds, of the nod of the hat. Sounds like yeah. something you ask a Scottish I prostitute sure for. Let me get a <laughs> nod of the hat, would you? Tip of the nod of the hat. <laughs> <laughs> Just the tip though. Um, you gave him, you tipped a hat to yeah. his run as well, to his Batman. Yeah, cause I wanted to see he, you know, Batman incorporates all of this and it has to incorporate this stuff now as well. So there was a little wave there, you know, as I was going out the door. Now, will it continue? Will they continue with the idea of Batman incorporating? or in the story itself it concludes uh, what Bruce Wayne did for those that don't remember or don't follow that far that deeply um, the idea of Batman Incorporated was when Batman came back from being lost in, in time when the right before the new 52 began yeah, yeah. Um, Bruce Wayne uh, said to the world uh, look I know Batman. Who do you think funds his fucking war on crime and so from now on it's global it's not just Gotham it's everywhere and instituted Batman Incorporated, where you got to see many incarnations of Batman around the world. We'd seen, um, what was the storyline? Was it the Black Hand storyline where you introduced yeah, like, Black Club, where you got the, 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 the Club of Heroes, they used to be called. Yeah. Of the and that, and that existed or no? Yeah, that was from the, the 50s. So all I was doing was to, again, going back to an era of Batman that everyone ignored. But, <laughs> yeah, forever, where yeah, people are like, don't talk about where he's wearing colorful outfits. Yeah, and I don't even mention the fact that there was an Italian Batman called the Legionary, you know, or a, a French Batman called the Musketeer. And that was invented but, in the 50s? This is 50s stuff. So I, I, honestly, I, I, I love that because I thought, yeah, sure, if there was a Batman 
wouldn't people all around the world that's just mad guys with some money and you know or just tough guys who want to get out there and punch and, people yeah we're like inspired yeah. they're like this is what people yeah, are doing now okay, i want well, in i'm going to be the legionary and then you take that on a few years with batman's still doing the whole thing and all he's doing is getting better and better mm -hmm. but the legionary is a bit too much of the dolce vita you know and he's been <laughs> he's been hanging about with the girls and there's been films made about him and he's getting bigger and bigger and he loves eating and suddenly he's back <laughs> and so it was, yeah, it was like bringing all those guys back and seeing where they are now. You know, the French, the musketeer. Well, he's figured it out. He doesn't like fighting. He maybe did a couple of years of that hardcore stuff, you know, fencing on the rooftops. <laughs> but then he's thinking, well, he ends up getting arrested for killing one of his villains, spends time in a lunatic asylum, then turns that into a movie script, which makes him rich. <laughs> so, <laughs> so they had this idea of like taking all those guys seriously. And going back to them and seeing where they were now, people who'd copied Batman, who'd been inspired by it. It's such a great yeah. idea. And so it's then so they real became, world. Then the idea, like Bruce going round all of them and recruiting them and saying, okay, you're now part of this corporate global initiative. We're going to fight crime on a giant scale. And instead of just being Batman imitators, you're now part of the corporation, the Batman Incorporated. You know? And, and so, somehow it's still held together that people weren't like, wait, if Bruce Wayne's paying for this, is Bruce Wayne Batman? People are like, oh, it makes sense. It was good, a great dodge, a great dodge, as a matter of fact. Yeah, and even we we show we showed Batman you know, <coughs> with his hood down as Bruce on the internet, like creating his own conspiracies where he's writing in, hey, Bruce Wayne is Batman, dude. And then he's writing in saying, no, no way, that's not possible. You know, Batman died or Bruce died or somebody. And he's, <laughs> he's just filling the web with disinformation. Batman is a Reddit troll. Yeah, so <laughs> he's sitting suddenly, on the internet going Bruce, like... Bruce Wayne is Batman becomes just one more boring conspiracy theory among a million better ones. Takes it yeah, right out. Yeah. So smart. Man. And I figured that's how he would work in a modern context. You know, he'd be in there like creating all these conspiracy. Yeah, of course, Bruce Wayne's Batman. And then providing all the reasons why he couldn't be Batman. And then contradicting all this until <laughs> nobody knows who the fuck is Batman? Is there a Batman? <laughs> so I thought it was a good idea to, to do that and to show him actually engaging with that because the idea that nobody's ever thought that Bruce Wayne's Batman is ridiculous. ridiculous well, obviously yeah. in the real world they'd figure that out in five minutes flat. So you, you, you can play with that in the fictional world where Batman lives by showing here's all the, the checks and bar, here's all the shit he does to, to you know, to to place chaff in the trail, well, what was it? It, dust. It, in his history, what was it? Um, it, it wasn't it. It was a Denny O'Neill story where it wasn't that. That's how Raza Ghul, Rasha Ghul found him in the first place. He's like, I just backtracked receipts. Mm -hmm. Like the only person who could buy the things Batman needs, and I found you. Yeah. Rachel uh, Gill's the only one who cares about purchases and stuff. Like, he's, <laughs> he's got the receipts. How sad is that? He's like, thing? follow the money. Yeah. That's how they got Capone. That's yeah. how we'll get Batman. <laughs> he's saving up. The nickel and dime, Batman. <laughs> <laughs> Batman bought a Snickers. <laughs> what was this for? Yeah, he's like, why right. is this a write-off? He's like, I'm a businessman. Yeah, and he's Everything's going, right. But that's because you lost exactly 13.5 calories during a fight <laughs> with my henchman. <laughs> Therefore, you had to eat a Snickers, but <laughs> he's this got it all worked out. Honor, this is conjecture. <laughs> <laughs> People can fight without a Snickers bar. Um, so when when you wrapped it up, did it feel satisfying, or were you? I mean, obviously, you got to a place where you're like, I've said everything I could possibly say about Batman, at least for now. Yeah. Was there any sort of like uh, roll a tear? Or do you kick back like in misery and smoke a single cigarette, <laughs> uh, like James Conk's character? How did you end your Bat era? No, th and that's a bad era that technically began, what, back on Arkham Asylum? I mean, think about it. I guess. Yeah, yeah it's, really. It's like a hundred years ago now. <laughs> <laughs> I remember buying that Empires book. Empires of Resin and Fallen. But, you know. I still have my hardcover. I bought yeah. three hardcovers on that opening day because that's all they limited you to. And I still have one of them that I read and one sealed. I mean, you know, it's yeah. the other one I traded away. Saddam Hussein was running in Iraq. You know? <laughs> <laughs> That's how far back it yeah, is. Yeah, <laughs> we're living through empires. <laughs> so no, it, it was kind of weird because I'd had Bruce Wayne in my head for so long, but really I'm, I'm glad it's over because I, I, now it's done. I don't have to worry about doing it. Right. Know? Right up until that last one, I was really freaking out. Like, how do I finish this thing? And I knew I couldn't, you can't end Batman because Batman never ends. So that became, that was, that was the, the theme of the, the last story. And going back to the original Batman story in Detective Comics 27, it's a, it starts with a conversation between Bruce Wayne and Gordon 
So this whole issue is a conversation between Bruce Wayne and Stop Gordon. it. Yeah. You're going to make right? me cry. That's awesome, man. Yes, because that's his, you know, and it's how long have I known you, Jim? And then he cut to just a wordless panel and it's the young Commissioner Gordon as a cop, beat cop, and there's little Bruce Wayne. And it's like since the beginning. Right. You know? And it starts obviously talking about in continuity and in the actual publishing history of Batman. Gordon's the first person you see Bruce Wayne talking to. In the history of yeah, ba- in yeah. Detective 27. In that's Detective it. 27. And there's other things from that story we took, like, which is a really weird image of Batman coming out of the door, like coming out the closet. It's weird. It's the first time you see, and it's like Batman, the first story's played out as a, a mystery. And we'll, we'll be, I guess we'll talk about this one later because it's one of my favorites. Go ahead, yeah, fire it. It's, it ends with this open door, like if only Commissioner Gordon knew his young friend Bruce Wayne is secretly doom, doom, the Batman. That's in, de- in Detective in the Comics very first story, And that's the last three panels where this door creaks open and Batman comes out. And it's oh fuck, Bruce Wayne is Batman, and they so they reveal it right there yeah, at the as, end of the story. If, yeah, so it's the twist, you know. Like, yeah, but yeah, with the Superman story, it's like Clark Kent's introduced halfway through. This guy's got a secret identity, but in the first Batman story, it's the twist. It's the big, you know, twist ending. Bruce Wayne is secretly the effete young man from page one. Is secretly the athletic Batman. <laughs> so we did that as well, and and then like Chris Burnham drew this beautiful weird Hitchcock zoom towards the, the clock, mm. you know, the grandfather clock with the, the door just like slightly, it's slightly open. open. And then Batman comes out and it's kind of, I always thought it was the weirdest image of in all Batman. So we, we got that stuff in it and also the fact that my first Batman story for some inexplicable reason starts with a shot through Commissioner Gordon's glasses as they fall off a rooftop. So I thought, well, it's got to be Gordon's point of view, you know, because I kind of started with this image, like this is Commissioner Gordon's glasses, it's his POV. So the whole thing was based around that as well. And yeah, I'm I'm, I'm really satisfied with the end, but it is quite bleak, you know, and, and all my Batman stuff is about how cool Batman is, but this is also about how endless that story how it's like yeah it's like there is no you know credits like he's his job's never done and And isn't that great but isn't it imagine you just felt that for five more minutes how awful it would feel your job's never the baddies are never going to be beat i mean Uh, imagine that's how cops feel every minute of the day it's just like what is the point it's like we just keep going it's always going to be a goddamn fire we're never going to put an end to fire (laughs) we've beaten fire (laughs) we put up a trophy to a big statue the day we conquered the flame forever if that was jack kirby you could actually kick fire's ass you know (laughs) he would be the leader of some giant you know but it doesn't work like that so i felt there was a kind of as I kind of love crafty and horror and the endlessness of Batman, but it's also that's why he's divine. That's why he's angelic. So I, I was because he has to, to overcome that. Yeah, because he cause never he, stops. He will constantly defeat the bad guys, but they'll keep coming, and he'll constantly defeat them. <laughs> <laughs> There's never a moment where. Yeah. They crucify him, he ascends yeah, yeah. to heaven and rules at his father's yeah, side he forever. he just chills out with ice cream on the left hand of his father. <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember that part of the Bible, but that would have kept yeah, me well, in church. Yeah. There's ice cream up there? That's absolutely. It's the best ice cream you've ever had. <laughs> I'm like, take me now. <laughs> I've lived enough. Um, so that is, that's Batman Incorporated issue number what? What was it? It's the one that's out right it's now. It's 13, yeah. So it's kind of weird. It's good that it's 13 because Chris Burnham was taking so long to draw and Chris mm. is a brilliant artist and he's done such an amazing job in this. But that's why he wrote issue 12 so that he could do issue 13 as it now is. But I kind of like the idea that it ends on issue 13. That is and for, you, for you particularly. You know, and everything goes in a spiral and it's like Rashal Ghul comes in and suddenly the devil figure that's haunted the entire run becomes incarnate as Rashal Ghul, what's the detective? You've just killed my daughter, you've killed my grandson, and now we'll destroy you. And he's got all the clones of, of Damien that Talia's kept, so. That's how it ends? That's how it ends, and it's just this will uh, go on. Spoilers, no, that's how it ends? Yeah, yeah, I mean, it came out last week. If you, if you haven't read it yet, you're out of the loop, come on. <laughs> Um, oh my lord. But and wait, it is that, so I wanted the endlessness. Oh my god, this, this, you know, vengeance never dies. It's all oh God stop, but it never will stop, you know. So poetic. You, you re- referenced Damien and we talked about it a little bit while you were here. It was more after those two episodes. A lot of people have said, you clipped out that one part, played it at the head of the very next episode where you talk about, um, that what was coming was the death of, of yeah. Damien, of, uh, Robin Damien, Damien Wayne. You created the character. You like, I brought you into this world and I 
take you out. So one of the last things you do before you leave is just like, no, he's mine. And you take, break him and go. <laughs> well, uh, but do you, you knew that from the jump, from the moment you introduced him? Yeah, I knew he was going to die, but I, in the last issue, and we leave this, the option open, and Rash al Ghul's got the, he's got 30 clones of Damien, but at the same time, the, the, when we see the grave at the end, I don't know, no one's noticed a lot of this stuff yet, and I can't wait till they start picking through. They're going to now, if you say it. Yeah, but at the end, it's, you know, it's Bruce is like kind of looking at the grave, and Alfred says, do you, I thought you had to see this, and Bruce is basically giving up being Batman, it's, 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 Talia's exposed the, the intrinsic absurdity of it. You know, Kathy Kane comes back. She shoots Talia dead. She's like, <laughs> and she just says, well, you know, you stick to do what you do best. We represent international espionage and we've just taken down world criminal number one, you know, Talia Al Ghul. And so she, is she out of continuity then for good? Who? Talia? Well, Talia's dead in this. And that's that. But, but what you've seen is, is Bruce standing over these two graves, which is Talia and Damien. But at the end, Alfred takes him back and says, while you were detained by the authorities, Master Bruce, this happened. <laughs> and you see Bruce looking down, and it's the whole idea, like, what, his whole life is this hole, this nothingness. His mother was shot, his father was shot, just the bullet holes, and he's looked into a hole forever. And now he's looking in, you see the graves are empty again, someone's dug them up. And he's oh. looking in, and it's like he's vowed never to be Batman, then cut next page, Batman's back. Oh. Because in that hole is the potential of everything, of new adventures, of possibilities, of, you know. <laughs> <laughs> You're such a fucking boy, dude. How do you maintain that point of view, which, as we heard in the last episodes, came from a childhood reading comics uh, down the street from a nuclear sub? You're one of the smartest people, if not the smartest man I've ever met at this point. How can you still maintain such a childlike sense of wonder? Here, let me give you an example. Uh, I watched yesterday, um, the two days ago, the Flashpoint Paradox. They made a Justice League yeah, cartoon oh, they made movie. The, the animation. Yeah. yeah. Oh, it's wonderful. I enjoyed so so much. But at the end, there's this really touching moment, as as was in the comics uh, miniseries, uh, where you know Flash delivers to Bat to Bruce Wayne a note from his dead father in the other reality, who was Batman. So. My, I'm watching this. Uh, you know, I bought it a couple uh, weeks ago and I didn't get around to watch it. And I was sitting here. I had nothing to do and I was smoking. I was like, all right, I'll watch it. And then I, I immediately got engrossed. By the time it's coming to that moment where he's giving him the note, my wife had come in. She hadn't seen me in an hour and change. She's like, what are you doing? I was just like, shh. And she came over and she sat on my lap and all of a sudden that note moment happens. And I literally was like, ah! you know, I covered my mouth and shivered, almost dropped off my what little lap I have left. And she was just like, ugh, looked at me with that face of like, I can't believe I let you stick your fucking cock in me crying in this goddamn <laughs> cartoon. But the childlike sense of wonder over something like that, like just the way you described it, looking into those open holes for him is like the beginning of new adventure and blah, blah. Where does that come from, man? Because again, you're, you, you're, as we've heard before, you're a traveler. You've done some big thinking. A lot of people do big think and get to a place where they're like, you know, people in masks punching each other is ridiculous, and they grow up and move away from it. You still have it. How? What's the secret? You just got to buy into these characters and what they are, which is bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they're, they're, and I keep, I, I, I'm really shocked by people who can't keep trying to say this is what Superman would be like if he was real. He's never going to be real, man. That can't, that <laughs> shit can't happen. Right. But. He's real in our heads, and in our heads he represents this big time stuff. You know, Superman's always going to be the best we can imagine, the best we can be, the best humanity can think of. Batman's even better because he's like us. We think if we go to the gym enough, if we, you know, if we study some Sherlock Holmes books, we'll, <laughs> we'll be like this guy. Is that the secret? That's the path? That's Jim it, and yeah. Sherlock Holmes. Jim and books. Sherlock Holmes, and you can easily be Batman. It still sounds too tough yeah, to me. And, and avoidance of bullets, the big one. <laughs> <laughs> But you know, so I I, I kind of think it's uh, you got to buy into it. These th it's, it's bullshit, but it's magnificent bullshit, and it makes people feel better, and it speaks to our highest aspirations and our biggest hopes. Quite like religion in general. Yeah, isn't it's it? like a religion, but it's, it understands that it's not real, but it doesn't have to be real. It just has to feel real. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, dude! You may have just broken it down. Yeah, you're right. It's like we are a congregation. Mm -hmm that understands all these stories are fucking fake. Like, you don't yeah. sit there going, like, this really but, happened. But they're not fake because they make you feel real shit. 
And so that's go- as good as the real thing. They are the real thing, you know. And it's like I watched like I don't know if you remember the the Jesus show that they did with Robert Powell back in the seventies. Yeah, you know, Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus, the Jesus, miniseries. Right? Yeah. Now I get like tears screaming down my face on that, that stuff. You know, Jesus raises Lazarus. You know, mm-hmm. whatever it is. But at the same time. I can read Paul Levitz and it's 1940s Justice League and they're fighting Hitler and on this big turnover moment, Superman appears and it's the same tears of, hey, maybe the good sometimes wins out. So you and that's it. all you it, it takes. You know, and if fiction can do that, then it's real because it makes you for a moment feel, hey, maybe the good wins out. <laughs> <laughs> maybe it's not yeah. all fucked. And, oh. it, and if it's never all fucked, but it's also fucked as well. But at least to understand that sometimes to feel that, and that's what I think that these superheroes do, and that's the best thing about them is like you know maybe it works, maybe sometimes the goodies win, you know. And oh. these guys represent that feeling, and the more they purify that feeling, the cooler they get. You know? Where would you teach comics? What hot Oxford? Where? Where's like for you? If somebody was like, we want you to teach comics for a fucking year, and we'll give you, no, we're not, yeah, pay you like a like unlike most teachers, we'll no. pay you what you're worth. I just wanted to comics to just be taught to everybody. You know, these are these are right now comics are really on a, a, a super fast basis. There's hundreds of them being churned out every month, examining how it feels to be alive now right. you know and even the dumb ones are talking about it. it's why people are looking at back at image now back in the day people thought image comics were total crap now we've got all the you know the, the kind of 20 av- years has yeah, added respect 20 on. years on avant-garde kind of comic artists are looking back at rob liefeld and realizing no he was doing an abstraction of reality that's as weird or as individual as Van Gogh. (laughs) (laughs) And they're starting to understand that stuff because everything was personal expression. And no matter how shit you thought it was, these guys were responding to the times and trying to create characters that they thought kids of the moment would love. And so that tells us a lot about kids of the moment in 1992. (laughs) It's true. And if you think about it, when you put it like that, these guys were... Fans of the genre, mm-hmm. the first generation of fans of the genre who were drawing for the genre. So yeah. they were like fanboy artists, like the artists who created all these characters. They weren't necessarily in love with them. They were, it was a fucking job. They were like, what do we got to draw now? He, draw, yeah. he runs real fast. And I'm sure in terms of having a job on some level, it felt like, eh, you know, drawing superheroes is better than fucking starving. But you know, we're always just kind of going like, what do you do? I'm working comics, you know, <laughs> keeping it quiet. This was the first generation where they were like, we fucking love this shit. Yeah. Look at how we can draw <laughs> it. Like celebrated you know, art. And they were making a ton of money. These guys were <laughs> yeah. making, they were, these guys were buying Learjets with every panel. They saw a new super team every fucking two pages. <laughs> buying, here's this. And then you can sell the original art for, the, for even more money. Oh my God. And, and there was kind of, and I always, I always thought they were like the, the kind of techno generation of, of musicians. Mm. They were taking what we loved about comics and throwing it all the shit. So like, there's no fucking plot. There's no, here's a new bunch of superheroes. Oh, fuck. And then they fight for four pages. And then a third team arrives. Wow, we're going <laughs> to stop both of you because you're destroying the planet. <laughs> fuck <it>, every, <laughs> all it's every. It's the club the scene. The boring shit taken out. Just the bass. <laughs> and, you know, and that noise left. A boom, boom, boom. So it's, I guess it's like the hacienda is the beginning yeah. of, of the age of like the DJ essentially where they're like, look, man, we could just mm-hmm. give you what you love in a room just that'll keep you moving constantly. But yeah, it's taken right. 20 years for the hipsters to realize that's what was going on, you know, and always that's what's going on. And those guys kind of rescued American comics from the vertigo in a frilled cuff, you know, romantic poet bullshit. <laughs> frilled cuff. <laughs> <laughs> but they rescued, because that's the way it was going, that whole Sandman, the Alan Moore, Purple Prose, me, Pete, my mom, by, I mean, I was part of the whole <laughs> shit. You know? He's not pointing fingers. He was yeah, like, I was but, there. You know, it was that kind of art school shit. And those, those, the, the image guys pulled American comics back to the roots of just the base. Of Bang Pal. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Of like, you know, dynamic, Kirby-esque, yeah, like and, huge and images. And more fighting. characters and another bunch of guys. And so, but I was in your camp when I was, I mean, not like you had a camp, but I was in the camp of writers, you know, and especially like when I got back into comics, it was, it was right at the birth of the age of image and artists were king. Every book was sold on the artwork. DC and Vertigo were the ones still 
Like, you know, why we're telling it and they were vertigo selling you captions. Yes. You know, <laughs> the sexiest but like, paragraphs. I, mean, I do like that as well, but you know. It, it was it was uh it, I remember there was a two schools of thought. It was like, mm. I don't like movies, I'm into film kind of thing. And uh you're right, man, like twenty years on, those dudes without those dudes, American comics probably would have been dead at that point. But the stuff of yours, like Dogma, I think is very literary movie. It's, I, mean, I find it quite strange because you break a lot of the rules mm-hmm. in that. And were you deliberately thinking about... Because it was all oh, super dialogue based. And it was all based people on would, the comics People would tell you stuff about the war in heaven and you wouldn't show, show it. it. You just, just show them <laughs> sitting but like... that's from fucking... You know? That's yeah. how I read comics. And I said last time too, before I headed off to do my shit... The artists that fueled me right before I left were like you, Gaiman, Alan Moore, and stuff. Yours but it was, was the, the stuff of I the kept voice, reading. The voice I thought in that it was like a play almost. You know, yes, like, you know? I just I'm not a visionary. I I don't see uh, in pictures. I'm I'm a wordsmith, and even when I read the comics, I never react uh, to the dynamic image as much as I react to the dynamic image plus a caption box that's three words long with an ellipsis at the end. Yeah, that then, will but, make it... Pa- it throws the image into such relief. Yes. That suddenly it takes on ten meanings. Yes, <laughs> yes. And, and and Vertigo and DC, they were doing that very well, whereas, you know, Image was just doing like, look at this fucking splash page. Here's a hero. Here's another hero. Here's a- They're dressed so fucking but ridiculously. It was always like some name from the thesaurus. You know, it was like <laughs> fucking balloon and then, you know... Tom Pyre, when we were doing Doom Patrol, he did this amazing like text piece where we did Doom Force, which was a uh, you did the 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 we, Liefeld yeah, issue so of we Doom did Patrol, this super instant parody of all this guy's stuff. But Tom did this amazing. It was just a bunch of superhero names on the back with TM beside each of them, and all he did was go through the text. <laughs> so it was like Tree TM, you know, <laughs> Rivet TM, like Rimshot. TM. <laughs> it's creating a super team of names. one of those could have been an image superhero. <laughs> <laughs> um, you, uh, as we'll go back to the bat, as we will, because we're going to talk mm-hmm. to Grant about some of his favorite stories, but you're not done with DC. You're working on, now, just as you've spent years yeah, with yeah. Batman, you're working on this new thing, which I, I saw some pages of. It's fucking gorgeous, and it's ambitious, and and you told me, like, one of the ideas at the heart of it, that I was like, ah, it's a Wonder Woman project. I mean, this is like, and it couldn't be more timely, man. This is a character that DC needs to crack in film in a big, bad way because Marvel doesn't have an aggregate. There will be no Wonder Woman movie coming from Marvel unless they're like the Invisible Girl and they don't have Fantastic Four rights to make those movies. DC has something that Marvel doesn't in this character of Wonder Woman, one of their original five, you know, the superheroes uh, that make up the Justice League. Um, who, you know, for years it's their token, like, look, we got a fucking girl. But now is the time where you can, you know, make a movie where if you crack the Wonder Woman code, you're making more than you made on like Dark Knight, man, because it's 52% of the population out there, girls, women, ladies, and they like superhero shit too. They just never been sold one. Every time I try to sit my wife down to watch something, she's just like, ugh, fucking boy movie, you know, make, make something, make a Wonder Woman movie. You'll probably make two billion bucks. And in the comics, she's been handled a number of different ways. Uh, we, we can digest her a lot more easily for some reason in the comics than they found a way to do in, uh, other media. But, um, you're taking her in a brand new direction. You're bringing your Grant Morrison take to the Wonder Woman origin. And it is fucking fantastic, as you would imagine. Let's talk about that. What is it called? Well, this one's called Wonder Woman, the trial of Diana Prince. Number one, because I think like Wonder Woman's always on trial, you know, and beyond that, women are always on trial. It's always explained what the women want, what's the fucking, you know, it's constant pointing the finger. What do you want? And Wonder Woman, like they're the alien race that we yeah, still can't yeah, figure out. Yeah, explain this, you know, men are from <laughs> <laughs> Jupiter, women are from Alpha Six. It's ridiculous, but. Wonder Woman even more so is constantly, why doesn't this work? Why is this not a franchise? Why should, why do we never get this? So I felt it'd be a really good way to literalize that as a trial, you know, and have her on trial by the Amazons. And the whole thing is to tell the, the, the story again, you know, to, to see what we can do with it. Because it's been around since 1940. It's been through a lot of, of, of iterations and versions, as you say. Tell me about, we were talking right before we went, the yeah, origin I mean, of like, the actual character is, is right, so, so I mean, un-30s and 40s, it's crazy. Well, we'll kind of work our way slightly backwards, because right now there's a big Greek mythological take that Brian Azarello is doing. 
And before that, you know, he had a bunch of really cool takes. There's been feminist takes. There's been this. There's she, and in the 60s, she was a mod spy, Emma Peel style. Right. She lost her powers and she's dressed in white leather and, and did kung fu. And then going back in the 60s, she was like this crazy, like, 60s sitcom girl who was constantly chasing Steve Trevor, the male love interest, and she was desperate to marry him and settle down. So he did did that in the comics? Yeah, absolutely. So this was, so working its way back, and then you get back to what's the original stuff, because I went back to look at the the original and see, because my my method is always to see what the original creators wanted, and then see, can we do something with that? Because Wonder Woman stopped selling and stopped really working as a character when the original creator, William Moulton Marston, the writer, left. So I thought, there's something about this character that is about this guy and his, his, his stuff. So you research Marston, and what you find is this very respected psychiatrist of the 1930s, and he's the guy that invented the polygraph lie detector test. Right? The guy that invented Wonder Woman also invented the yeah. polygraph. And as you know, she's got the lasso of truth. So he, <laughs> oh he invented God. the actual physical representation in our world of Wonder Woman's lasso of truth. So, so I mean, he's serious, dude. Yeah, and he was obsessed yeah. with the idea of honesty, apparently. Oh, yeah, and he wrote a lot of books. And very interesting man. His wife, too, Elizabeth, was also a, a psychiatrist, you know, a super intelligent woman. It gets interesting when you suddenly realise that in the, the midst of these two comes a third personage, the 18-year-old Olive Byrne, who is their lover, both of their lover. What's the name? She, Olive Byrne. Olive Byrne, yeah. so it's a girl. Yeah, so and she's 18? She's 18 years old. She's a student of both of these characters, and she gets involved in this menage a trois with the creator of Wonder Woman. <laughs> in the late 30s, early 40s. Yeah, I mean, so these people were super cool. I mean, this, they, 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 <laughs> they were, they're, they're, they're yeah. bohemian before bohemian yeah, exists. They, 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 they were early swingers. They were the real deal. But they're psychiatrists, you know. They've got letters after their names, so it all makes sense. <laughs> and, uh, and they can justify it with education. Yeah, so... So basically, so how old are they when she's eighteen? I actually they got her know. by I mean, some yeah, years. You check this. Yeah, they're a bit older than her. Obviously, they're her professors. They're the kind of so it's a little bit. <laughs> Does it? How long is it a semester? How long does it go on? I don't know. I mean, I I, I, I haven't I haven't looked into the entire new <laughs> show. You're like I didn't get past that. That was <laughs> interesting. Yeah, enough. I mean, I'm already. I'm a, what I'm, role does the girl play in Wonder Woman? Well, she's the physical model. She looks like the way Harry Peter drew Wonder Woman. So they base it on all of. Get out of here. Yeah, so right. does he, he gets credit for creating the character. Does his wife help? His wife never gets real credit for it, but she's in the biographies. You read about it. She lived to be a hundred. She was a super cool dame, you know, <laughs> <laughs> at a hundred years old. Yeah, she was like, I he used to eat yeah. pussy like you read about. Yeah, I died. You know, <laughs> he died. She just kept it going. So she, she lived this, she lived this bohemian life. So they were very interesting kind of characters and they create Wonder Woman. So instantly for me, I'm looking at, you've got Batman and Batman fights crime and Superman's sci-fi and social realism in the early days. Wonder Woman is about sex and alternative sexuality, you know? I mean, yeah, based on yeah. the, based on the people who created it. You know, so what he said, he basically said, we want to create an alternative to the blood curdling masculinity of the male superheroes, which were at the time Batman and Superman and maybe Captain Marvel. I think, I think he might have got in there early. So that was it, and they were they were trying to create something different. So now it gets even further into the territory of like super hardcore underground mimeographed bondage mags. <laughs> Because Marston is into this whole philosophy where he believes that if only women were allowed to take over the world and subject every other, everyone else, including men, to what he called loving submission, then things would chill out really nicely. Because it's not a bad idea. No, I mean, I'm sure there's a kind of, you can work it through. And he had it all day. You know, he wrote entire screeds on this thing. And Wonder Woman was kind of about this. So it was a notion of loving submission. It was the idea that some people like to be controlled. But what they need to be is controlled by somebody really nice. <laughs> <laughs> and ideally, Which is a woman. Yeah, ideally a, a woman who really loves you, cares about you, has got motherly, sisterly, the whole deal. And that was his view of the Amazons, that they were, they, they'd evolved a society beyond men based around the notion of loving submission. So all the stories have got all this weird bondage imagery and the Amazons have bizarre rituals where they dress up as stags and girls chase each other through the woods and then have mock banquets where other girls are eaten and strange. (laughs) (laughs) So honestly, this guy was like, he was expressing all this amazing alternative view of sexuality and, and social structure. 
And as, like I say, as soon as he died, that all disappeared from the strip and it became quite sanitized. So you got this, like Wonder Woman is just a, you know, a 50s housewife chasing her man. Or would, the, which I think they, like, they yeah. did in Mad Magazine. I think yeah, Kurtzman I mean, made already, fun of it early on. Of course he did because it was easy to make fun of. He could never have made fun of this early mask. <laughs> yeah, yeah, stuff, people, he would have been like, this, this is super, the truth yeah. right here. And they've got stuff. What like, was the bondage stuff? They, they, he, he was involved or he, when you said the underground mm. stuff, like he liked it or he was uh, producing it or he was pulling character stuff from it? No, he was just, he was some kind of face of it, which was quite alternative, you know, to, you know, almost cerebral version of all the stuff that was happening. You know, that weird stuff that Joe Siegel was drawing Bondy yeah, stuff. Yeah, but, which I yeah. don't know if folks know that, but there's <laughs> one of the creators of Superman. Uh, they, they put out a book recently, yeah, right? Yeah. Within the last year or two years. He, aside from drawing Superman, he had this secret world of drawing bondage, right? It yeah, was. Yeah, and he worked with Eric Stanton's studio, and Stanton was this artist in the 40s and 50s who did all the weird bondage, you know, transvestite, mi mistress kind of stuff. Which again, and like, Siegel so with outside him. the box in 19 fucking 40. But it was all going on. People were always into the same stuff, you know, they were just, but in back in the end, they needed comics. They didn't have the internet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, draw this. I yeah. got this fucked up thing in my head, man. Draw exactly. Quick. And now they just it's a, a click away. <laughs> they Google it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> their, their worst fantasy come to life. But but so it was honestly this this was a big time. I think it's kind of fascinating, and nobody's really written about it in in the depth. I think it des deserves. You know, like Marston, his wife, the girl. Was she Greek back when he when when did that come into the picture? No, the the whole Greek thing was just the idea of the Amazons because he wanted to create a, a warrior woman and a woman who was a scholar and a philosopher and she could do all this stuff. So he went to the Amazons as a myth, and the myth of the Amazons is of men enslaving women. So that obviously appealed to his bondage loving <laughs> imagination. And all those images of, you know, like Hercules with Hippolyta and chains. So he was kind that of. That's a myth? That comes from myth? Yeah, that, comes, stories. From, that comes from Greek mythology. So, but the Greek stuff, he was, he was kind of bonding that with kind of Buck Rogers style sci-fi, early, you know, art deco sci-fi, which is what I loved about it. And it's what me and Yannick have brought back to the, to this new thing we're doing. And we were also thinking about, okay, you've got like 7,000 years, like these women, they've been enslaved by Hercules and, and the Greeks. They break out, they kill all the dudes. They head off and just say, we're going to create our own society free from the curse of men. And they create Paradise Island, which exists somewhere in the, you know, somewhere in the, the, we don't know where it is in the ocean, but it's hidden behind a gigantic vortex. And 7,000 years later, the same women are still alive because they've conquered death. And the only new one that's been born is Diana, the princess, Wonder Woman. <coughs> so the idea was, like, what happens, like, like, 100 years in, they've all fucked each other, you know, and they've built the buildings. And 300 years in, they built better buildings. 300 years in, they've solved all the problems of technology and communication. They've done everything. They've all got off with each other. 7,000 years later... And that was it. So we start off with this. It's like, where are they now? They're, 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 they, they have this incredible culture, but it's kind of frozen. It's like it's just forever. Every, every afternoon's the same afternoon. And because, just because there's yeah. no masculinity in there's the culture. There's no men. There's no. The, there's no, uh, there's no, what is it? The X factor, the yeah, incalculable, the, the, the chaos. That thing, Captain Kirk, basically. <laughs> <laughs> James T. Kirk that's is, what, is like, not present. But what you've got is, the, so the architecture is kind of, it's female based, a lot of domes and stuff, but at the same time it's haunted by the phallic memory of the, of Hercules and the men. The sexuality is turned into this super abstract, it's just to do with chains and locks and leashes and pledges. There's no real, there's nothing left. They've bled it all out of the culture. It's just ritual that's left. And so Diana then becomes this young girl. Even though she's not really young, but she's trapped in this eternal world where her mother's always the queen, but yet her mother looks as hot as she does. Yeah, always at the comics, yeah. that was the case. Couldn't so figure out which one was Diana. So it's a weird kind of role play thing. And then one day Steve Trevor basically lands in the island. This, this. So you do that too? Yeah. But instead of it being World War II and she's sent off to man's world to help fight World War II, it's more about she's, she finds this guy washed up in the surf, you know, kind of like Aphrodite rising from the foam in Botticelli's painting. Oh, and it's beautiful. But it's a, a man. It's a and dude. Then, <laughs> and then he collapses in front of her. So there's the kind of weakness. That, and then it's the whole story. It's like she runs away with him back to man's world and suddenly learns, wait a minute, it's not man's world. It's half man's world. 
half women's world. Oh, so they did, yeah. so it was always referred to as man's world. Like they, she knew it yeah, existed, yeah. but yeah. we don't go there as yeah, man's we world. Don't, it's bad. It's and then she gets there, she's like, that. well, it's There's half all man's this world. other stuff, you know. So it's hard, and the and the idea of having, which weirdly enough, nobody's ever done because one of was that costume thing, right? I thought, no, that's only one of the things she wears. You know, she, she's looking at Swimsuit Illustrated and goes, what, you people are into this? Well, yeah, I look, I'm fit. I look cool. So she makes that costume. But at the same time, we gave her like dozens of costumes because we thought Wonder Woman would have a whole wardrobe. <laughs> yeah. Like all different styles. So what we gave her was a wardrobe of clothes, which I think is really cool as well. Right. And nobody's ever done that. They're <clears> always <throat> like, put on the bathing suit. The so one we're piece. doing the whole fish out of water. She comes back here with Steve Trevor. But then there's, there's you know, there's twists and turns and betrayals. But the Amazons basically say, <clears throat> Diana's escaped from the island. We're going to go after her. We have to bring her back. And they send the Gorgon. They unleash the Gorgon and all these things. Now, is yeah. it is set in DC continuity? No, it's, it's a whole, it's, it's part of the, the Earth One series. So no, you know the nothing one that, else. Yeah, Michael where Stuzinski he did, uh, did the Superman. He did two books on Superman Earth One. Then and Jeff then Jeff Jones did, uh, did uh, the Batman, Batman one. Yeah. So this is set in a world, yeah. no other yeah. characters. So this is the first time superheroes have ever appeared. It's kind of the, you know, the ultimate, yeah. whatever, <laughs> whatever you want to call it. Right. This the is reboot, the, but within yeah. the universe. This, this is like stuff. So they're going to now continue to build that Earth One universe. Well, I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm, I, I, Sounds I, like you got Superman, yeah, Batman. Yeah, I mean, I don't Wonder have any Woman. reference for Wonder Woman, but yeah, of course they could build it. It could be another thing. I know. Like one more so much going on. I don't know. Do we need <laughs> but that's the that's the beauty of it is like I remember I got into comics right as the multiverse mm-hmm. was collapsed into the one universe of DC, and you know I was like ah it's one universe only multiverse all that all that crap. Oh man, I love that stuff. But it's, now that's yeah. where I am, where I'm just like oh make as many universes mm-hmm. as you want. There doesn't need to be one continuity because. One person's continuity could be another person's favorite continuity. One person's like, ah, I don't go for the Earth One stuff. It's like, oh, all I love is the Earth One stuff. And the versions are, are great. You know, yeah. I, I just loved all the different versions. Here's the, you know, Nazi no, I mean, you're Batman, telling one right here Soviet where I'm like, Batman, yeah, oh, you know, of course, like, the oh, Elseworld stuff. stuff. Great. It's like, what, um, we talked about now, do you want to spoil it? The, one of my first questions mm-hmm. when you said Wonder Woman, I was just like, well, the, my biggest problem with Wonder Woman is just like she birthed from clay. Yeah, well, we're going to deal with that because I don't like that. And I think it, it makes her too remote from us. But I I'm, agree. I mean, I'm not going to tell you how I'm going to do it. Yeah, don't. Him, he told me, but yeah, don't spoil it. Yeah, I mean, I'm told him. But. <laughs> <laughs> but that is, that's one of those things where like, it's, you know, my kid was asking about yeah. Wonder Woman just like a couple weeks ago. It makes her creepy. It makes her a bit. I, that's you know? what I said. I was just because like, I, you know, I was talking about the heroes born in tragedy. And I was like, well, in D.C., they tend to be more like Superman, you know, is only here because his whole planet blows up. Batman's parents get killed. Um, I, I, I said, Wonder Woman, she, what about Wonder Woman? I said, well, Wonder Woman doesn't really have any particular tragedy. In fact, she's sent to man's world to help out. I said, but she is also not really human. She's formed from clay. And she's yeah. like, what do you mean? And I was like, well, she's a goddess. So. She doesn't have a strict beginning like that. And then right there, you see the, like, the light go out of the kid's yeah, eyes. No, like, like well, Clay? <laughs> you know, Batman's cool. He watches his parents fucking die. Superman can fly. We're Clay? Oh, what is it, Wallace and Gromit? You know? <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. So we, we kind of try to deal with that one. But at the same time, I do like the idea that like this woman creates another woman, her own daughter. So we're trying to have our cake and eat it with us. We've got a really good take on it. Smooth. Um, when is that hit? When are they? I saw a bunch of pages, but when? I don't is that know. Um, Yannick's on page twenty. And how long is it? A, it's 120 pages. It's a full on hardcover graphic novel. Do you like doing that more so than? Yeah. I mean, I like the, the idea of people being able to read the whole story and this whole thing's based on a trial and it's kind of, she has to account for herself. But later on, we've got Steve Trevor being allowed on the island. First time a man's really, and he has to speak as a man for what we're into about women. And Get his Am- answer yeah. for everything. So I want, and I want the Amazons, Paul, they're all just listening. This dude gets up and he just stands there and says, well, here's why we're into porn and here's what we love about women. Here's what we hate about women and, here, and do the whole, work. really try and be quite honest about it. You know, the so relationship. It's like a number, number 89, they bitch at yeah. you when the toilet seat's left up. The they'll whole, kill Steve yeah. Trevor. <laughs> but, but all of it, just so that it's really like on the pitch. Try and be as honest as I possibly can and pull all my friends. <laughs> what would you say to just a court of women if you had to stand up for us? And 
what we deal with for manhood. Yeah, yeah. yeah we'd lose that trial. Oh, I know, I know. But the Amazons are different from us, thank God. <laughs> it's so. It sounds like the kind of story that the guy who created Wonder Woman would be like. Thank you. I want it to be. I mean, that's the thing. You, you know, looking at that guy, and you know, I, I do want it to be. To, to to be as good as as his first idea, you know, mm. and obviously he was a bohemian. I want it to be. I want it to be about alternative sexuality. I want it to be. I want it to you know be provocative the way he intended it to be provocative, and also to be pacifist and about love and about sex and about how we look at women, and how we get on with each other, and the way we deal with each other, and all the different levels of that, you know, from when you're a young man to when you're an older man, a married man, all the different takes. And to have lots of different women characters in it as well, which I know you like. You oh, know, it's the kind of it's, representative I mean, it's, older women, menopausal women, teenage girls, you know, warrior women, all of them getting to talk. Do you bounce your shit off your your wife, off Kristen? Oh, you're of like, course. Read this, I mean, man. It's, yeah, I mean, not so much read it. I mean, she'll just listen to me bouncing around the house, reading out dialogue and explaining stuff. Is that stuff. what you do? Yeah. I mean, it's just, oh, look, I'll just, I'll just come up with this one. And so yeah. sit there and be like, hold on, hold on. here's the scene. And yeah, then you yeah, go yeah, into yeah. a mini I mean, performance. Exactly so. Oh, that's adorable. <laughs> you got to fucking shoot that and put it on YouTube, dude. Who, oh, would, who wouldn't watch that, oh, man? No, like Graham be, Morrison be, doing his own character. Graham Morrison having a nervous breakdown. <laughs> <laughs> I am Legion. There's like 300 <laughs> voices talking. Oh, <laughs> no, no, but 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 yeah. I mean, I've got. I, I want this to be. I want this to be like, and, and really, it's not for young kids. You know, yeah. it's not an eight-year-old Wonder Woman. It's not <laughs> right. a cartoon Wonder Woman. But I really want it to be for teenage girls and their moms. The hot moms. <laughs> and it's These cats reading this Twilight and this Fifty yeah, Shades of know, Grey cats. And because I grew up with my own mother and my, 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 my sister, who was like five years younger than me, and watching them, like, I mean, I've, I've, I've seen my mother and my sister. My mother's got a knife in her hand. My sister's got a pot of boiling water and they're standing confronting each other in the kitchen saying, I'll kill you, I'll kill you. The fuck out yeah, of so here. So I want to get a bit of that. In there as well. Too know? much of that fried yeah. Mars bar in a fucking Scottish diet where they're pulling knives and fucking pots of water on no, each other. But at the, least they're not pulling guns. That's the American way. No, if they had guns, they would pull them. But fortunately, they don't. They resort to the old the old <laughs> ways. You know, <laughs> People have been doing this stuff since like, you know, like 08 AD. <laughs> a pot of boiling water always works. <laughs> um, so you capture that uh, dynamic and yeah. throw that into the story as well. Like, yeah, I want, I want it to be a mother and a daughter and a daughter who runs away from a repressive society. So it's almost, <coughs> it's the classic <coughs> Disney princess story. I was oh, just going to yeah, say, yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's kind of a whole one. new world. <laughs> Um, but when then with this weird bondage, <laughs> yeah, with, as well. Uh, the, it, when you look at the pages, like the opening pages are is Hercules and Hippo, Hippo, Hippolyta, Hippolyta, yeah. Hippolyta. Um, and, and, and there's a lot of chains involved. Well, there's he a lot represents of, just the ultimate bestial male controlling, you know, porno mm -hmm. image of women, right? And then her kind of working away. Of out course, of that. Yeah, yeah. But at the same time, you see the Amazons then fetishize chains and turn them into a weird code. And it's because so they're like this in the yeah. way that like people look at like that's forbidden. Mm -hmm. and, and it's the turns forbidden, it into and, something yeah, and, sexy. and thousands of years later, they've turned it into something that stands for all kinds of other things. Where older yeah. older people, or I mean, they're all the same age, I guess, to some degree. But older people would be like, "Ew, that's yeah, yeah. distasteful." But younger people would be like, "No, man, that's hot and naughty." Yeah, it makes sense. It's like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, fascinating, man. I can't wait to fucking read that. No, I, and Yannick's I'll artwork is beautiful. You I saw it. it. It's, oh, it's, really, it's stunning. I mean, he's spending so much time on it, so. It's one of those books, like a coffee table. Your friends will sit there stone, just staring into the vistas of... What is this? You know, paradise. I, oh, man, I can walk right up the stairs into the temple. You know? <laughs> um, speaking of the temple, let's return to the Bat Temple mm -hmm. and talk about... We'll say... We'll, uh, we, it, I threw out five, but we'll see how many we come up with. Yeah. Your favorite Bat stories, the stories that, like, you know, a lot of people point to your stuff as, like... Oh my God, my favorite Batman story is this and Batman Grant Morrison story is this. Like I, I could pull dialogue sections and point to one of the last episodes we did of Fat Man on Batman mm -hmm. was me just reading the JLA, um, issues of, uh, Rock, of Rock of Ages was the, the dark, the two dark side yeah, yeah, issues. Yeah. I, I went through them. <laughs> I had no guess. So I was like, I'm going to read yeah. you two of my favorite Batman appearances of all time. And I read them and, and, and kind of did the voices and shit. It was fun <laughs> shit. So there are people that, you know, go like, Oh, this story you did, this story you did. 
who who is that for you? Which are your stories that made you go like, oh, I want to do this, or mm-hmm. ooh, I love this is my favorite Batman moment? Well, the the Moon of the Wolf, and I don't remember numbers of this thing. But yeah. People can go and look this shit. Yeah, we got the internet, easy. folks. We got it. We're gonna get that. You know the, the the memory that remembers everything. <laughs> but this was the Moon of the Wolf by Lane Wein and and uh, Neil Adams. So this is like a early seventies, yeah, and it was a kind of it was one of those like hundred page. Like detective comedy, I think it, no, it was actually like it, it was a it was a Batman. It wasn't a detective. It was a Batman, and uh, it was yeah, it had a bunch of reprints and a couple of you know the, the, the new pages at the beginning of the book. But it was it was basically one of Bruce Wayne's friends, and you see this really incredibly homoerotic, amazing stuff where they're in the gym like pumping iron, <laughs> but. <laughs> So it's you know what you're missing is Grant's actually acting yeah, it out I'm now, as if he wrote it. Kind of working it, <laughs> but it's uh, so this guy's called Anthony Lupus, which is a bit of a giveaway. Well, you know, right the then and there, the like the either he's got there. the disease, yeah, he's got a problem. He's got, <laughs> <laughs> but you see him. There's this incredible just sequence with him and Bruce Wayne are working out together. But to, as contrast, they have this like totally overweight, kind of out of shape. I'm in the book. Yeah, yeah. I mean, no, he's, he's he's a lot older. He's a grey-haired man, kind of a corporate guy, huffing his way through. The, the, the like a Rupert routine. Thorne type. Yeah, so he's huffing his way through while the other two are like pumping iron and <laughs> flinging like medicine balls at one another as if they weighed nothing. And the other guy's, oh, oh, I just can't handle this. And you discover that Anthony Lupus is, of course, a werewolf and he's the guy behind all these mysterious disappearances. But it's the most beautifully drawn, amazing. And it's Neil Adams, true. It's Neil Adams at his, his ultimate peak on Batman. He did a lot of great Batman stories, but this one is brilliant. And, you know, Batman's like locked up and he escapes. He, he bites this cotter pin that he finds. I always remember that name, a twisted cotter pin. I don't know what the hell. <laughs> it obviously holds things together. But it but, captured your imagination. Yeah, Batman, Batman picks it up with his teeth out of the dirt and his face is all dirt and he uses it to unlock his, you know, the, the shackles that he's been put in. And then he fights this werewolf up, you know, scaffolding in a lightning storm. <laughs> <laughs> oh, beautiful background. No, it's, it's amazing. And it's just, it's told in whatever. Probably 16 pages or something, and at the end, there's a great little coda where the bad guys kind of survived, and there's werewolves coming back for Batman one day. And <laughs> that's how it ends. No, it's brilliant. Oh, nice. All right, so that's when mm-hmm. you and where were you in life when you read that? That was I was just becoming a comic fan. I was like 12 years old, and this was the best this is Batman at his best. You know, Neil Adams was my hero at the time. Um, all right, where's that? What what else you got? What's the next one? That's good. Now I gotta go look it up. Yeah. Next one's the uh, the mad love thing that Bruce Tim did. Yeah, really? Oh, it's brilliant. Oh, I yeah. believe me, yeah. I'm with you, but it's so weird because that's after you've started writing. Mm. But it's just so good and it, it rewards you you can go back to that again and again and again. And it's beautiful. It's like the old Warren comics. I don't know if you remember that show, yes. like Eerie and Vampirella, the yeah, black yeah. and white. The, the the ink, the wash, the graded kind of stuff, and it, they 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 did it in that style. So I really love it. I think it's just a great story. It's it's sexy. It's it's noir. It's you know it's it's kind of the way. And it introduced the yeah. character. They got to introduce the character of Harley Quinn uh, into the universe. Mm. To, uh, that was the, her first comic book appearance. She'd yeah. been in the animated series. <laughs> and later on, she'd get her own book, and now she's deeply entrenched in the DC universe. No, but I've realized I've totally explained the wrong one, because everyone's going to listen to it and go, no, Mad Love's the Harley Quinn thing. Yeah, I'm yeah, thinking of the, the black about? and white one that he did for Batman Black and White, Bruce Tim did. What it's was a, it? I think it's a Two-Face story. But it's the girl in the, she's, you know, it's this, this got this sort of noirish girl in suspenders leaning over a table. All I can remember is images. Right. And that's why I like it so much. And it's so, it was. But Mad Love is also great. So, I mean, these two confused together. <laughs> <laughs> is my get out club. This, so it's a Bruce Tim story. It's a Bruce Tim, it was in Batman Black and White. It's totally, it's, it's, it's a two faced story. Mm. And it's, it's jogging really memory. Amazing. I have a vague memory yeah, yeah. of it in one of the first few issues or something. But Mad Love's a great Harley Quinn story as well. So I'll, I'll put those two together. But <laughs> anything Bruce Tim has to say. Um, before we go further, mm-hmm. there was, on um, the last time you were here, um, we, we touched very briefly on Dark Knight Strikes Again. We went yeah, yeah, into, yeah. into Dark yeah. Knight Returns. Um, and, and fuck, it was eloquent. Like you explained 
Dark Knight Returns or went into it in such a way where you turned it into an opera that I never noticed. Mm-hmm. You know, it begins about a man who's yeah. got self doubt. Did you go back and look? Yes, yeah, yeah. of you course. I went it. back and read it. The and I was like, it, the esca- <laughs> how do you, how you don't see it yeah. and and be how I never saw it before. It is. It's a quiet story mm-hmm. of man doubting himself that ends with man fighting and conquering <laughs> God. You know, it's it is. It's got a Damarang or it's big a big ass opera or something like that. But a lot of people have asked on Twitter, like, talk about Dark Knight. Dark Knight mm-hmm. Strikes Again, which was Frank Miller's sequel. Now, yeah. and a lot of people have asked me, what do you think about it? You never talk about that. Um, I, I'm not one of those people that kind of flipped out about like, oh, this mm-hmm. is such a fucking, this is terrible. It was not Dark Knight Returns, but how could it be? Cause that was, it was Frank Miller plus, yeah, I don't yeah. know, maybe 15, 10, yeah. 15 years, whatever. Um, but I liked a lot of the ideas in it. It's, it. Frank Miller's art was a little more out there in terms of the backgrounds from, from, uh, the traditional pages of Dark Knight Returns. But I dig the story and, and it's a, Batman is a little bit different, uh, than he was in Dark Knight Returns. Mm-hmm. But what you seem to dial into it a lot, like when, when we talked about it, you went into like, oh no, it's, it holds up and yeah. uh, hit on that storyline. What is, for those who've never read it, essentially, what is it? And then what's good about it to you? Well, it wasn't Dark Knight, but he'd done that, you know, he, the guy had done that. You can't ever take that away from him. So why yeah. would you want him to do it again? But. I don't know. I, I think he started out with a mission and the mission was possibly misguided because he thought at the time that he was bringing back, as he described it, the luster to superheroes that, like Alan Moore believed for some reason, that in their wake everything had been grim and miserable and depressing all through the 90s. Right. And then you're thinking, no, wait a minute, there was Image Comics and yeah. there was Mark Wade's Flash and there was Kingdom Come and which was kind of dealing with other things or Kurt Busiek and me and Pete Milligan. So they weren't right about it, but I think Miller started out with this, well, I'm going back to the comics I loved as a kid, and I'm going to do this amazing cocaine-fueled... And again, I don't want to say like Frank was on cocaine, I have no idea. No, it's just in terms of a metaphor. In the sense of how it was done and drawn and like super fast, there were some really bad drawings in it, but... (laughs) Is Okay, well, let's stop right there. Really badly... There are, right? Like, Like, I think that's what turns some people off, where they're like, is this the same fucking guy? Mm -hmm. And there are some pages where you're like, this is unmistakably Frank Miller. But also, what people have to... remember is that an artist is an artist. An artist is not someone whose duty it is to recreate reality as you see it. An artist is whose duty it is to put down what's in his head. And if what's in his head is a really badly drawn up girl with her ass in there, <laughs> then it's because he wants to get past that fast. He doesn't care about the girl with his ass, her ass in there. So read it. You know, read what the artist is saying. She's just a thing on TV that he doesn't care about. Right. But it's horribly drawn. <laughs> But then you get to huge, suddenly 9-11 happens and Frank's in the middle of his story. Is that what the yeah. history of this book was? Yeah, because you see it, it suddenly appears and I think it's book two, I don't, I'm not sure, I think it's book two. And it's Supergirl and Superman looking at Manhattan and there's a gigantic cloud and buildings are falling. And suddenly he abandons his story and starts to react to what just happened. And I think it's brilliant. It's just, it's a guy... On the board, drawing stuff, making it up as he goes along, and suddenly some big thing happens outside his window, and he puts that in the story as well, and everything changes, and and the story's elastic enough to make that work, and he still says all he wants to say, and he's got these images of, you know, like Supergirl shooting the beams out of her eyes, and it's it's like the day the, 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 the what was it, the, the day the Earth stood still, mm, uh, the robot, got, yeah, the yeah. robot, and it's that kind of Kirby power. But all of it suddenly, in the middle of it comes 9-11 and it's him reacting to that immediately and I think it's brilliant for that because it's incoherent, it's mad, but... That's your reaction to something like that. And 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 it's scrawled and it's like, you know, it's like woodcuts, it's like primitive art, it's like something that should be drawn in a cave in the (laughs) (laughs) post-apocalypse. You're right, but when you think about Dark Knight Returns, Pretty, you could take out all the word balloons and mm-hmm. very easily follow that story, I would think. I've never tested it, but it's told in a pretty linear fashion. He takes very, you know, yeah. uh, creative leaps and, and, and liberties with uh, framing and stuff like that, but still told in a pretty linear fashion. I think that's what put a lot of people off uh, Dark Knight Strikes again. Number one, everyone thought like, it's the fucking mm-hmm. sequel, The Dark Knight Returns. Not knowing what you just mm-hmm. said, like this is a guy who was writing one story in the middle yeah. of it, the worst thing that ever happened happened, and he just started writing about that instead. He's an artist; that's what he's supposed to do. 
but there were so many that that's you pull out all the dialogue that's a really tough mm-hmm. story to follow and like you said there's a few pages you hit where you're like did they, did they wait, how did this happen how did this get past <laughs> approval how did that something that probably he wouldn't have been allowed to do if it was dark knight returns yeah, but yeah. since he's sequelizing yeah, dark yeah. returns and he's a fucking legend uh it, he let him they let him do what he wants. But it's the difficulty of having had a, a big hit like that. Mm-hmm. And then you still want to be an artist because an artist doesn't want to recreate anything they've ever done before. But in a lot of cases, the audience wants you to go on recreating the same thing forever. And it's, it's sad. You know, I'd rather see Frank Miller just look, he's reacting to this thing. He's, his drawings all over the place. He's, you know, his wife's calling and he's mad. You know, it's like she just found a computer. But it's brilliant. It really, it's, it's, it's of the moment. People look back on it and they see that it really captures its time in the same way that Dark Knight did. Excellent. There it is, everybody. Go give it a read, man. Based on that, yeah. after the last episode we did, I was like, I'm going to buy this motherfucker read it again digitally. And it's a guy's head. That's it. Think about it. Stop thinking about, I want this from a Batman story. Just think, here's an artist that I like and here's where his head is at this time. And isn't it? And it may not be where your head was at, but it'll teach you something. It'll show you a perspective, you know. And like any good comic book story, if you don't like it, just wait yeah. a minute. Another one's coming. Oh yeah, there's always a million. <laughs> it's like soap opera. It never ends. <laughs> um, okay, jumping back into faves or stories that you mm-hmm. dig, man. When you think of Batman, the stories that you haven't written, what what leaps to mind? Which give me another one. There was the, the last episode of Walt Simonson's, uh, and, and Andy Goodwin's, or Andy, is that his name? Archie Goodwin. Archie Goodwin, sorry, Andy. Archie Goodwin did, the uh, Manhunter. In uh, the early seventies with, with, and it was the whole Manhunter. What was his name? Thing. Mark, um, fucking, Manhunter the character? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mark something Manhunter. I no, he was the other guy. There the was before like, that? There was, yeah, there was like 10 Paul Kirk. Is that who the yeah. Manhunter was? Okay. Yeah, so I love this stuff and it was, it was, uh, What's his name? Simonson doing some of his best work. But they, they did this crossover with Batman at the end and it was just the most beautiful, you know, Manhunter meets Batman. The whole story gets wrapped up, but it was done in this like multiple panels, the most beautiful comic book storytelling you've ever seen. They, they dismissed the idea of, of Hollywood storytelling that the whole, you know, the spirit was kind of based on, on, on that kind of Citizen Kane style Austin Wells directing and for a long time that had, that had been what was in control of the way people thought about comics as film. You know, you had people like Steranko coming in and going back to Austin Wells as well. Is that so? Yeah. And that influenced what, 20, 30 years or more? Well, a lot of that just kept going. You know, people were looking at those movies, but, <clears throat> but with Simons and what he was looking, he seemed to be creating the, the idea of the video experience. Long before it happened, you know, ten years before it happened. So what he panels was, within like, panels? Just really digital panels, really small, focusing in on a shuriken flying through space, and then hitting a guy in the shoulder, and then the sound effect. And so he was kind of creating this digital style, which I think was way ahead of its time. MTV before MTV. Yeah, and this this crossover, this f- finale of the story, was with Batman and and Manhunter t- together. And uh, that that was the kind of culmination of the style he'd used, this beautiful, super digital so style. Nobody's done too. it for a long time. We three's got a little bit of that with Frank Quitely and, and some of the stuff that Chris Burnham did on the last run of Batman's got a little bit of it, but it's really it's something that should, people should bring back because it was ahead of its time. It wasn't film, it was video. <laughs> <you know? laughs> it's so weird to hear a writer, like, so far, the moments you dial in on are visually oriented. Like, it's not like you're like, then this happened in the story, this, then he said this. It all comes down to the image for you. And I guess that's what makes you so damn good at, at, at every, at, at not just writing, but writing in the graphic medium because you think visually. Like, why didn't you know you, uh, directing's gotta be next for you, man. No, I mean, I, I draw it all out first, but I couldn't, honestly, I mean, I like drawing out the comics and describing them to the artist, but I, I couldn't direct anybody. <laughs> I just couldn't tell them what to do. I'd just say, you know, go and do it and I'd be, I'd be pleased with anything. <laughs> I'll take the anyone. first take. Yeah, go for it. You're happy. They go call on. him One Take Morrison. He's <laughs> yeah. the easiest director to work for in the world, man. No, I'd be useless. I just don't like telling people what to do. I'm, I'm, I'm too, uh, I'm too liberal. <laughs> 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 um, all right, give me another one. So God, many, how poem. many have we done? We've so, done th- uh, three. We've done three. I bet I miss out something amazing, but uh, 
How about let me see? What about year one? Where do you stand on year one? Oh, I love year one. I mean, it's a great story. I don't know if I should choose it because I've already got him in this kind of. But I mean, you know, I think Dark Knight's so great. But year one's brilliant. Yeah, I love it. It's just a, a really well done story. But it's like his Daredevil one, The Born Again. Yes. Where it's the same kind of story. It's just this really perfect primal story that's all you need for those characters what about uh, uh, another biggie that everyone always points when it when you batman mainstream to people come me say batman mainstream uh, or batman comics to the mainstream people they'll pull like oh dark knight returns or yeah. arkham asylum or killing joe killing joe oh killing joe's good and i kind of like killing joe because we talk about this no one gets the end because batman kills the joker no, yes. all right, we didn't talk yes. about right. this. Well, we got it. Okay, let's have killing joke as our second in command here. No, that's what I love about it. It's like no one's noticed, like, how many 30 years on almost. Batman kills the Joker. That's why it's called the killing joke. The Joker tells the killing joke at the end. Batman reaches out and breaks his neck, and that's why the laughter stops and then the light goes out because that was their last chance at crossing that bridge. And Alan Moore wrote the ultimate Batman Joker story, finished it. Fuck but, out of here. Yeah, but he did it in such a way that it's ambiguous, so people will never have to be sure, which means it doesn't have to be the last Batman Joker story. It's brilliant. It's like... So for those... I mean... It's a super Walt construction. Walt Flanagan, my yeah. friend Walt Flanagan, he's like, I can't stand the end of that. They're just laughing. No, they're about- not. They're laughing, and Batman reaches out, grabs his neck and breaks it, and the laughter stops. It actually abruptly stops, which tells you he's just reached out and killed him. It's really obvious if you look back at it. So the only thing that's missing is yeah. a quirk or something like that, a sound, a little onomatopoeia. Yeah, but indicated. that would have made it too obvious. And I, right. know, I know, I'm sure that Alan Moore wanted to make it, this is the last Batman Joker story. This is the inevitable end. This is the killing joke. It says it in the title, but... I if I say I've never that, I've seen it. I've been reading that book for know, years. Look, I never saw that. If you look at it again, it's, it's the most obvious thing in the world. And then the light switches because he's just killed him. It's like there's no chance of them crossing that bridge anymore. Oh, that redefines that yeah. book in such a major way. <laughs> and that's man. why it's so great. <laughs> and it's so strange because then they, well, that would make it an Elseworlds book because he kills the Joker. Yeah, because he didn't want to. I mean, he's not, uh, Moore likes to be able to do, he's, he's done it all. He's given you the end of a, of the end of this conflict, but at the same time, it's ambiguous enough that any future story will just be another echo of this. I wonder how many fucking people see that. Nobody, I've never seen it, people talking about it, and yet it's so fucking obvious. The only person who's ever mentioned it is Brian Boland, who hints at it and then leaves it trailing, you know? And he would know. <laughs> and he, of course he knows, he says the Joker reaches out, he, he goes for his neck, and he breaks his neck, and the laughter stops. I wonder if he's ever said that on a panel. No, he's, no one's ever said, because it has to be a big, that's what makes it great. And it's what makes oh. it the ultimate Batman Joker story. Dude, you have fucking sh- you've yeah. third eyed me and fucking shattered my world <laughs> like that. That's that 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 changes the framework oh. from which I viewed that story and forever. And I whole, loved Killing Joker. It makes Joker. the whole book so much better. Yeah, honestly. it just it really it does. took it, it elevated. It's it. the finale. It's the end. It's, of course, it has to be. Then he's just crippled. Alan but, Moore secretly yeah. wrote the last yeah, Batman yeah. story. Of course he did. And no, of co- <laughs> that was of course he was he hired to write. You know he did it, and he but he did it in such a way that no, it doesn't. If, if only if you notice, which is beautiful. They even know? worked it into the continuity <laughs> yeah. where it's like Barbara's in the wheelchair, <laughs> like you know, saying this happened. But oh yeah. man, beautiful. Like that was worth the price of admission alone. You just <laughs> fucking cracked the world wide open on that one. Do you remember this Batman annual? I think it was The Wrath. It was a cover. It had Batman and it had a dude who was kind of his mirror and he was like brown mm-hmm. Batman. And it was the story of two. Oh, yeah, I remember that. What, um, he's back. He's, he's, they brought that character yeah, back? he's back. When? He's, he's got a whole new story out coming up like this month, kind of. Like Re- and what, issues. the new 52? Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. I always wondered why mm. he didn't, well, I mean, it sounds weird to say, why he didn't work more, like he was an actor or something. But I loved that story and the way it was told. I can't remember who drew it but it, or who wrote it, but it was in the set. Yeah, I think it was, it was late 70s. Was it Mike 70s. Barr or someone? Yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah, I, th- I want to say maybe it was Mike Barr. But the cover is very striking. It's uh There's the parents dead and mm. a child between them in the middle, but then you have two looming yeah, yeah. figures. One is Batman. And the other is a character that looks like Batman, but he's brown and doesn't have a bat on his chest. And that's the Wrath or whatever. I don't even know if they call him that in no, the book. No, he's called the Wrath. He's called the, the Wrath again. I've even got a, this is a beautiful cover that Alex Ross did. Of the Wrath? And back when I was doing Batman R.I.P. and Alex did a whole bunch of covers because he was in for like six months worth of covers. 
and he sent in this thing, and it's like a playing card, like you know, with the king, and it's Batman and upright, and then underneath, you know, this image the of the wrath holding the gun, and it's just really beautiful. But yeah, he's back. I mean, the whole they've, they've, they've rediscovered the wrath. Oh my god! It, it was the idea. The character yeah. was somewhere on the same night. Batman was his parents mm. were killed. This guy's parents were killed, but Batman. It, it was like Goofus and Gallant. Batman went the way of the good, whereas the Wrath became a shithole yeah. and he was an assassin, essentially. Um, man, oh man. Is that one of your favorites? I, I remember it from my childhood yeah. quite, and liking it quite a bit. Now, I always wondered why they didn't work that character into more. And now, of course, yeah, he's, he's no, coming they, back. They found him again. Yeah, oh, yeah. yeah nothing. Like, no license is left. He was unto. cowering under a rock somewhere. <laughs> they found him. <laughs> um, we were talking about just before we started rolling, man, I got the action figure. Of Batman, of uh, what is it? Zora. Zora, no, Zora yeah. no. They actually did uh, a figure of uh, the of the character in, in old continuity, or what in the fifties. He was just introduced as an interplanetary Batman. Yeah, he was a black Batman from the planet. What was it? No, Clano was his name. Clano. Where did they get these things? From? <laughs> and Grant turned him into <clears throat> brilliantly a essentially Batman going like, "Look, if I'm ever captured." Uh, or compromised, I have to still be able to function as the Batman. So if, if Bruce Wayne or my personality is compromised, I, the brain's big enough to store a backup yeah. and the, this was a Batman backup. So knocked unconscious or stripped of, of his uh, memory or whatever, Batman, the Batman backup system kicks in and it's Batman pulling together this outfit from rags and stuff. And, and he looks exactly like <laughs> the colors of, the Batman of Zora and all this old story. So it, we talked about it on the last episode. And then, you know, after that, I, I would last time he was here, really. After that, when I was online periodically, just jump on Amazon and enter Batman and see what comes out. They made a fucking action figure. Like it's gorgeous, man. And it comes packaged with a little bat mite You're who bat figures it? very prominently in the story. Before they do that, do they call you up and be like, You're getting a figure? No, I wish I knew. I mean, that's the first time I knew. You didn't see it? No, not at all. You know, and the idea for that came from like, you know, like kids developing multiple personalities, that whole MPD thing. You yeah, know, yeah. Like, you know, people who've undergone trauma develop these other personalities who can deal with it. And I thought of Batman actually working all that out and thinking, well, what if I made a backup personality in case I get really fucked up? And it will just emerge. So yeah, I mean, they made a toy. They wound up making a toy of this bizarre notion that you had of like <laughs> Batman's monstrous MPD. <laughs> it's Batman without Bruce Wayne, just the figure of vengeance. Yeah, it's, that's what it is. Yeah. It's essentially Batman stripped of any humanity, or just the Bat uh, Anima or whatever. Um, yeah, the final of the five. Honestly, this this my favorite Batman story, and no one will know this one. I, I kind of want to draw people's attention to it. To see if they think it's a cool at all, or if it's just me. But there's this thing called it's, it's. I looked it up, but I've completely forgotten. I think it was Batman six seven two of the original series, but it's easy to find. It's called Die Small, Die Big. Right? Die Small, Die, die Big. Die Small, Die Big. So it's like in the late sixties, I think, maybe early seven, late sixties. Who's the art? Do you remember who? It's like kind of Carmen Infantino period from that late on period, mm -hmm. just after the Batman TV show where they started trying to make Batman comics a bit more serious because they camped them up for a while. They'd gone on. in the but way. But right the after them, it, there was a really interesting period where they had these weird existential kind of mysteries written by Gardner Fox and other people. So there's a kind of odd couple of years before the Neil Adams stuff and Denny O'Neill stuff. So is this like the giant typewriter era or no? No, it's after. Before, this is, is the end. After. This is a weird part of Batman's history. It's the kind of the swamplands that nobody knows about. <laughs> no, honestly, it's right after camp and right after they, they adapted to the TV show and the Riddler and the Joker were all like the TV show. There was this weird detective era and the stories were bizarre. They were kind of like the spirit where it would be like from someone else's point of view and it was Batman seen from... The, the POV of a citizen of Gotham. Really cool. So the stories would be done from that Yeah, yeah, I mean, really view, cool Batman's stories. And it only thing. lasted for maybe a year and a half, later, two years. People are like, this isn't selling. <laughs> yeah, and then it got into the whole Denny O'Neill, Neil Adams recreation. But so there's this thing and it's called Die Small, Die Big. And the whole idea is it's about a, a mailman, <laughs> just this ordinary mailman in Gotham who then stumbles upon there's this crime's about to happen, something only he knows about because he's been delivering the mail every day and he hears these bad guys talking. But the mailman has a canary that never sings and it sits in this cage and every day he feeds it and he goes, oh, please, please just sing, come on, come on, boy. 
And one day he just decides, I've had enough of being a mailman, I'm going to go out, and like, Batman's never going to hear about these guys that are about to commit this terrible crime, so if I dress up as Batman and walk in there, I'll be able to stop it. And the whole thing's just this guy going through the prep, and he dresses up as Batman, he walks in, they shoot him dead. <laughs> 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 but... Batman finds him and he's wearing a Batman suit and the mailman's dying and as he's dying the canary's up and for the first time ever the canary starts to sing. <coughs> no. No, honestly, it's super like sentimental Hollywood. Your heart breaks at the end. This is my favourite Batman story of all time. And it's just this guy pretending to be Batman and then he dies a hero, dies small. His name's Leonard Small. That kind oh of thing. It's die small, die big. <laughs> and he dies in the canary for the first time. That's the end of the story. And no, it's just Batman saying he didn't die small, he died big. That's and the it's, oh, oh it's God. amazing. <laughs> oh my lord, man. That is, and it's so it's not like it's a Joker story. No, it's a it's fucking just a guy and it's barely story. a Batman story, yeah. but at the same time it is a Batman story because it's about a guy who's just like, I got to do the right thing mm-hmm. and puts on a mask. And, and it's unfortunately, everything Batman represents, but without Batman's training, he's, he's, he's <laughs> he takes a bullet. <laughs> <laughs> um, there well, it's it is. Worth it to hear that Canary sing. <laughs> <laughs> do you think in the DC editorial mm-hmm. they were like, look, these are really beautiful stories, but like, can't you throw a Wonder Woman in bondage or maybe a I colorful know, Batman did. from outer space into the story? I just think they were lost after the Batman TV show. They were, what the hell do we do with this? And then <laughs> you have Neil Adams who at least got an idea and Denny O'Neill takes that idea and does something with it. What is that? What do you think that is? That What, what, what was that idea? It was the idea to go back to the roots of Batman, to make it gothic again, to, go, to get away from the the, the kind of... Gotham City detective, you know, where everyone knew who he was and everyone. Mm-hmm. So they, they just dialed it back. And it worked. To like, the, the, yeah, were, you, were you reading at that time? Yeah. I mean, cause to me, that was the greatest thing in the world. Neil Adams Batman. He was lithe. He looked like for real. He could really do kung fu and the sequences were all based on Enter the Dragon and stuff like that or earlier Bruce, Bruce Lee films. But Batman looked like he could really do martial arts for the first time instead of swinging those big, hay, <laughs> yeah. the haymaker punches, you know. Like, if he connects, you're dead. But so suddenly he could fight and he looked lithe, he looked trim, he looked like the sort of guy Batman would be in the, the tall ears. That's where and, yeah, the era of yeah. the long ears begins. And Adam set everything at night, even if his script said it was to be set in the daytime. So he was constantly emphasizing the gothic aspects of Batman and then, and, and Denny and he picked up on that. But as I say, there's this weird little era. I mean, really interesting stories. Like Gardner Fox, as he was approaching 60 and he was about to be kicked out of DC, the guy who'd created so much of their stuff was reaching the end of his viable years. But he did some of the best Batman stories ever in this weird, strange, like all from different people's point of views. Oh, and you found poetry in something that I'm sure most people are just like, Ah, uh, you know, that's yeah. not, it's not my Batman. No, I had to read it all. And honestly, my Batman is every Batman. It's just, it's cool in every version and it adds something new to the character. When thing. you say it's your favorite of all time, yeah. do you, you read it when it hit the stands, when it came out? I don't even remember when I read it. I think I read it probably in a, in some kind of compilation, one of those hundred pages or something, the reprint things, but it really, it, it, I, I was in tears at the end of it. <laughs> I, I, and I have moving. honestly, I haven't read it since I was like fourteen, so it's probably really melodramatic. But but, but you still yeah, like it's, just, it's, it's in my head. That's Batman. That's and someone trying to live up to that legacy, and then Batman coming at the end. He didn't die small. He died big. How weird though <laughs> that you were there for the transition. Yeah. Like you were there for a couple transitions of the character, <clears throat> and then you were there. You were involved. <clears throat> like you were there as a reader for many of the transitions yeah, yeah. from Batman to. From one thing to another, from campy mm-hmm. back to gothic. But then you were, you got years later without even knowing that would come to be, you get to be involved with transition for yeah, the character, yeah. not just once, but, but twice, like many times. You kept doing it over and over again. Um, to be a part of, not to, just to be a part of that wheel, but to, cause it's tough to say that like, man, he had a spoke to the wheel. It's almost like you took the wheel and you turned it into like a hovercraft. Like you found another thing to do with the wheel that other people didn't do. So when you think of all the Batman stories that you've written, what's the one for you where you're like, that's me firing on what I feel is me firing on all cylinders. My favorite Batman story. Just there was uh the Dick Grayson as Batman thing. You love that. I you talked about love last it. time. Yeah, I mean, I really do, and I, I do love. I love Batman R.I.P. This super gothic goth Batman, you know, and it's it's kind of cool. 
But just that chance of having the, the, the light-hearted, acrobatic Batman, the grim little Boy, Robin, you know? The flipped relationship. There was just something about that, and the exact tone that we got with things were super creepy and dark, but at the same time they were absurd all the time. It was almost Monty Python. There was It was constantly teetering on the edge of horror, but never going over. And I think that's what makes that's what's great about Batman. It never goes over, you know? When it does go over, it becomes a bit like Saw or something, you know? Right. So I think those, right, that entire Batman and Robin run, I think some of my favourite comics I've ever written, and the dynamic of those two characters. I wish they'd done them for 10 years, <laughs> yeah. and then brought Bruce Wayne back as some insane, you know... For a generation that would be yeah. like, this is my father, my grandpa. Exactly, you know, and I felt that there was that in it, you know, but you had to bring him back, and at the same time, I love the, the whole return of the Bruce Wayne stuff, where I went through all the different time eras, and different kinds of stories that led up to the creation of the Batman archetype. Right. You no, know, so I had all that meta thing because I mean, as you know, I don't, I don't believe Batman could ever be real. So I don't think I'm telling stories about a real person, but I'm telling stories about a story that's really powerful and has affected a lot of people. So like kinda, like the yeah, Jesus yeah. story, essentially. So it's I, just I, like keep kinda, adding to yeah, it. Yeah, and you've got to be aware that it's a story and it'll never end, and you're just one of the people that passes the baton of that story through. That's the, the problem with the Jesus yeah. story: is it ends. And, you know, it's, it's, it ends and he loses, but then mm-hmm. he kind of wins, but eternally for all of us and stuff. But there's no, unlike comic books, Jesus has a beginning, a middle, and an end. Yeah. And he's eternal, yeah. but there's an end to his life on earth. Batman can't end. Batman can't, never. You know, he just always comes back. He can be buried, he can be shot, he can be poisoned, he'll come back and he starts again. That's why he's better than Jesus in so many ways. Batman is so much better. <laughs> way better, better costume, than Jesus. number one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> way better footwear, number two. Yeah. And he just can't end. It's a world without end, truly. Jesus would have been sweating, though, if he'd been wearing that costume <laughs> in Galilee. Yeah. hardcore. But he would have fucking, he would have got a lot more people listening to him. They're like, look at yeah, this guy, yeah. how he dressed. Yeah, exactly. He yeah. looks cooler than the romans <laughs> um it's been awesome sitting and, and talking to you again man because yeah. I, 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 so many people said after the episode runs they're like i could just listen to that dude read a fucking phone book he could you could read my obituary to me <laughs> and i'd be like yeah well fucking i think i'll be the other way around <laughs> <laughs> it was okay i, I had a good life because he made it sound even fucking cooler you found like quentin tarantino who can take like 70s, 60s, mm. 80s, even television cheese. Uh, what most people dismiss as garbage and find absolute gold at the center of it. You do the same thing. Uh, you find uh, amazing p- uh, poetry within stories that most people uh, within the Batman universe have, have dismissed and would rather forget. Uh, breathe new life into them and shows uh, how how uh, viable they are, how important they are and how, how much they are. And um, it's so awesome to hear that your favorite story is like the, the story that is a Batman story at the same time, not a Batman mm-hmm. story, but the Batman story that almost allows the reader more than normal to go, oh, I could be Batman right up until he gets fucking shot. Yeah. <laughs> and then he's like, maybe I should just but yeah, stay here. I could be Batman, but I'm going to have to pay that price. You know, Can which, you pay which, that price? He never has to pay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, you're a legend, sir. You're fantastic, man. Um, thank you for coming in the Fat Cave again. Anytime you're remotely near the side of the country, anytime I'm anywhere near your side of the country, I'm going to seek you out and we'll sit down and do this. Anything, yeah. Uh, that's Fat Man on Batman for this week, man. I'm Kevin Smith and, uh, come back next week. Same fat time, same fat channel, smodcast.com.